welcome. Thank you. Oh, okay. I will, uh... I'm sorry, were you expecting those chairs to be there? No, it's okay. Good? Um, yeah. I'm just making as much seating as I can. No, that's good.
Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna speak to you for a second. Maybe I'll get, okay, there it is. Let me get Mari Saul's. Testing one, two, Harvard University, Thompson Room in the Barker Center.
Uh, can you take your seats? Y'all are six minutes late and sitting down. We can never get this six minutes back. And it, is yeah. the, what's that freeway? Is that the 60? 60, yeah. yeah. I live off the, my mom lives off the 60 freeway. Yeah. I think uh, Johnny Guitar Watson had a song about this. All right, good morning. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, welcome. Um, we're gathered on the ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people. Many indigenous people have lived and moved through this place over time. And so we recognize also the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc people, among others. Indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. I ask you to join us in acknowledging their communities, paying respect to their elders past and present, and recognizing their active presence and their futurity reposed in the generations present and those to come. We affirm indigenous sovereignty and will continue to work to lift up indigenous voices in all that we do at Harvard University. Along with the legacies of the ongoing settler colonial project and the continued erasure of indigenous peoples and histories, we acknowledge the historic benefit that this university has drawn from slavery and the specific entanglement of the Charles Warren Center in its founding donors' white nationalism and nativism. By acknowledging this past, we aim to recenter our understanding of the lands and peoples that have underpinned the history of this institution and to take the first step toward accepting responsibility and beginning the process of institutional atonement. Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our partners in this event, the, um, well, the, the Charles Warren Center at Harvard University. Um, we're taking applications for a new name. <laughs> the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. The African American Studies Program at Boston University. Musicology and Ethnomusicology at Boston University, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program at Boston University, Committee on Degrees and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard, Committee on Ethnicity Migration Rights at Harvard, Committee on Degrees in, in History and Literature at Harvard, Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women, and Sexuality housed at MIT, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, the Department of Romance, Languages, and Literature at Harvard, and the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard. This is a big event that came together very, very quickly. And I really want to thank the people who, who did the heavy lifting in that. Nicole Guadati Hernandez. Where are you, Nicole? <laughs> Arthur Patton Hawk and Monique McCall at the Warren Center, without whom nothing moves. <laughs> uh, 
and also all of our panelists, many of whom have come very long distances on very short notice. We're really, really grateful to you all for, for being here today. We don't, um, we don't take that, that for granted. Um, I do want to avoid the false hope of misleading congruence, right? This is terrific. I'm, it, it makes me happy to see every one of you all here, but the occasion is one that is overhung by, occasioned by an institutional abomination, by a history various levels of institutional bunging, bungling that emerge out of and continue that history of indifference by the systematic disregard for the expertise and opinions of people who know better and who have devoted no small part of their energy to try to help institutions like this one do better. None of that has gone away and it has fallen with particular cruelty on one of our brightest lights and most generous and pointed voices. Lorja Garcia Pena, who just sent me a text message saying she was still dropping her son off at school. So this would have been the first of many moments when we would express our collective admiration and support and solidarity with Lorja, but there will be many others today, I hope. We're here today to keep on keeping on, in the words of Bob Dylan, Cornell West, and others, to occupy this corner, Fannie Lou Hamer, to occupy this corner of the largely indifferent academic landscape with a little bit of light, some insubordination, some scheming, and even some love. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Nicole Guadati Hernandez, who is the empresario of the day and who will introduce the first panel. Thank you again. Buenos dias, good morning. Thank you all for being here for this really important occasion. On December 13, 2014, I wrote the following. Having read all of Garcia Pena's first book manuscript, I can assure that her second book, Translating Blackness, will also make a number of interventions in Dominican and larger Latinx, Hispanic Caribbean, and Black Atlantic scholarship. Contributing to a growing but very important literature on the Dominican diaspora, Garcia Pena's project covers much historical ground by plotting the shifting practices of making race in Hispaniola's diaspora. Joining the ranks of scholars such as Silvio Torres Sayan, Gineta Candelario, Robin Derby in Dominican Studies, David Scott, Susan Buck Morris, Sabelle Fisher in Hispanic Caribbean Studies, and in Black Atlantic Studies with the likes of Paul Gilroy, Garcia Pena argues that racial identification for the Dominican subject has historically been shaped by the actual and imaginary borders between the Dominican Republic and the nodal points of the Atlantic world during the 20th and 21st centuries. In this triangulation of co-constitutive nation formations, Latinx racial, racializations must be considered outside of exclusively US borders. Instead of recapitulating to the argument that the US is the oppositional site for signifying blackness of the Hispanic Caribbean, her case studies in migration to Spain and Italy, along with those of the United States, move us away from the gravity point of the Trujillo regime as the single most and only important defining moment in the history of Dominicanidad. I read you these words from a letter of recommendation that I wrote uh, six years ago because I think it's important to restate what I believed back in 2014. Lorja Garcia Pena has produced work making her worthy of tenure at Harvard. But I also know from many years of experience as an administrator the following. One, institutions often care more about, as the former dean of liberal arts at UT Austin said, what it looks like versus what things actually are. In other words, optics are often more important than evidence. 
Two, institutions do not like to be told what to do by outsiders regarding promotion and tenure. Three, institutions wait on the attrition of students and faculty so that they can move on with their plans, with and without some of us. And fourth, tenure decisions are always political. As someone who has witnessed a series of tenure denials in the last three years, including a structured discharge that was masqueraded as a tenure denial, which happened in my own family, the pain of these decisions lingers, despite knowing that they are often about optics and internal politics and not the actual work itself. Time and time again, women of color and marginalized faculty are often punished for working too hard, while others are rewarded for doing little and falling in line with institutional politics. But I would, must warn that this can also be true of peers of color, as I saw in a number of my own colleagues, many whom were hired and rewarded with tenure by doing the minimum, while faculty who killed themselves with service had 20 plus graduate students and no support were denied tenure time and time again. That is the context that we find ourselves in today. But fortunately, the people in today's symposium program are the product of hard work and ethical politics. They are people like Laura Briggs, Ginetta Candelario, Genevieve Cultadio, uh, Ramona Hernandez, Walter Johnson, Robin D.G. Kelly, Keish Kim, George Lipsitz, Elizabeth Manley, Chris Rodello, Lourdes Torres, Silvia Torres Sayant, and Dr. Cornell West. These are the people that set the tone, not just for our conversation today, but for national agendas on race, faculty inequality, and how to make the academy a safer and better place for all of us. And so I thank them for being here and providing their insights in the honoring of our colleague, Lorja Garcia Pena. They are here to speak to the merit of Dr. Garcia Pena's scholarly output and contextualize its multiple interventions. Their presence is facilitated by the staff of the Warren Center, especially Arthur Monique uh, and Lauren from Histon Lit, um, primarily through the ideas of the Warren Center Fellows and the theme for 2019-2020, the past, present, and future of ethnic studies. I'd just like to point out the Warren Center Fellows. Can you just raise your hands? Um, these are the people that came up with this idea, and this was actually Marisol Lebron's idea. So thank you, Marisol, and to all of you. When we met to discuss what we could do in solidarity with our colleague who, ironically enough, was the seminar co-leader and responsible for our very presence at Harvard and unfortunately and unknowingly responsible for hiring her own replacement, this was our response. While I am not here to tell Harvard what to do, but maybe other people will, what we can do as a community is celebrate the tremendous labor our colleague has exerted at this institution's and in our lives so that she, even if the institution refuses to do so, will know how valued she is as an intellectual, a colleague, a mentor, and a human being. I welcome you to partake in today's celebration with a slight bit of mourning, but with uh, joy for our colleague, Lorde Garcia Pena. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us at this extremely um, important gathering. Um, I'm here to introduce our uh, incredible panelists for the first session, uh, which is entitled Ethnic Studies in Lord Arcadia Peña's Scholarship. Um, so I'm not going to read their full bios, which are in the program for you to read yourselves, um, but just a sentence each. And then I'm going to ask the panelists to try to keep their comments down to about 20 minutes, and I'll be moderating from the front couch here. Uh, and then we'll have a robust Q&A after, afterwards as well. So beginning immediately to my right is Lourdes Torres, is, who is Vincent DePaul Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at DePaul University and editor of Latino Studies Journal. George Lipsitz, who is Professor of Black Studies and Sociology at UC Santa Barbara. Chris Rodello, who is a PhD candidate in American Studies here at Harvard. And Laura Briggs, who is Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at UMass Amherst and editor of American Crossroads Journal. Please uh, join me in welcoming them to the panel. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. 
Um, first, I'd like to thank Nicole, the uh, Warren Center Fellows and staff for um, organizing this symposium and bringing us together to celebrate Lorgia Garcia Peña's significant contributions to ethnic studies scholarship and to protest the grossly unfair decision denying her tenure. It is important to continue to pressure Harvard to reverse this injustice and to educate the public at large about the value of ethnic studies for all Americans through educational forums such as this one, letter writing campaigns to the administration, and through social media efforts like the fabulous blog Ethnic Studies Rises. It is also quite fantastic that the students at Harvard were so quick to mobilize following the tenure decision. It's inspiring to see students know that they can make a difference and that they, in fact, have a responsibility to act on their knowledge. Today, I want to briefly touch upon some of the contradictory factors at play in our fields of study in terms of the issue of legitimacy that has affected and still plagues the advancement of ethnic studies. When I talk about ethnic studies, I'm referencing the fields we consider under that rubric, including but not only Latinx studies, black studies, Caribbean studies, Asian American studies, Native American studies, and many others. Fields which have produced some of the most in insightful, provocative, and game-changing scholarship of our time. Clearly, given the history of institutionalized racism and xenophobia that reigns in academia and that impacts the evolution of our fields, ethnic studies has had to continually respond to the devaluation of our endeavor and will have to continue to push for its legitimacy in the future. I'll talk briefly about how these contradictory forces play out in terms of the institutionalization of the field of ethnic studies within the university and relatedly in terms of the uh, dissemination of the research produced by ethnic studies scholars. In both cases, the point is that we can't lose sight of the need to continue to articulate the importance of our work and to fight against narrow conceptions of ethnic studies, scholarship, and projects. And I need to get, oops, I need to get my water. Wait a minute. So we find ourselves, ourselves in a paradoxical situation in ethnic studies. Despite recently celebrating over 50 years of existence in the US, ethnic studies is still viewed by some as a mediocre subfield and or as ethnic cheerleading. This means that ethnic studies scholars must not only produce cutting edge research, but in many cases must also justify our work since review and tenure committees may still not recognize ethnic studies as a legitimate field of study. Nevertheless, the fact that candidates such as Lorgia Garcia Peña, who are denied tenure, can mount such a robust response to such denials demonstrate that there is now a strong cadre of junior and senior scholars in colleges and universities across the United States who together with affected students respond loudly and vigorously in cases like this protest the injustice and appeal for reversal of unjust decisions. Much has changed in ethnic studies since those early days of the 60s and 70s when students demanded courses and programs in ethnic studies, Chicano studies, Puerto Rican studies, and black studies. On the one hand, the proliferation of ethnic studies courses, programs, and departments across the country in the last decades is a sign of the growing institutionalization of the field. Numerous colleges and universities have developed ethnic studies curriculum, programs, and departments. Some offer masters and doctorates, and there's a steady stream of cutting edge dissertations emerging from these sites. Many more universities offer ethnic studies majors, minors, and concentrations. While not all of these programs or depart are, while not all of these are programs or departments, the number of units with some ethnic studies presence 
attest to the power of student protest, which has led to the recognition that given the historical and current importance of marginalized communities, universities are remiss if they do not address this reality at some level in their curriculum. Increasingly, even community colleges and high schools are developing programs. On the other hand, just as programs grow in some locations, ethnic studies departments and programs are also being downsized, consolidated, or eliminated as universities respond to both economic retrenchment and the raging ultra-right wing climate. When administrators look to cut costs, ethnic studies programs, which are sometimes perceived as irreverent, uh, irrelevant, often bear the brunt. <laughs> they are irreverent. <laughs> For example, programs in Arizona and 23 campuses that are part of the Cal State system have been under attack in recent years. Clearly, in many sites, even those with a long history of ethnic studies in times of retrenchment, when perceived educational instrumentality and market management are the principal driving forces for the university, questions about the legitimacy of ethnic studies and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs surface. The marginalization of these uh, programs and the scholarship we produce is a national phenomena. Fear of resources being diverted from traditional disciplines to those relatively newer areas of study provoke anxiety and resentment. The objections to these programs are familiar and issues raised are usually some variation of the following. One, the programs and scholarships we offer lack academic rigor. Two, our fields are not legitimate fields of study but rather focus on grievances and foster resentment and anger. Three, ethnic studies scholarship and our programs focus on particularized knowledge promote navel-gazing, and have no relevance for anyone other than minority groups. And four, ethnic studies does not prepare students for the future. Ethnic studies scholars, in fact, argue that rather than offering particularized knowledge, our programs and curricula offer an important corrective to what the National Education Association calls, quote, Euro-American ethnic studies. In other words, the majority of the curriculum students are exposed to throughout most of their education, which normalizes the perspective of the dominant group and implicitly or explicitly promotes white supremacy. Arguably, the value of ethnic studies is its commitment toward ensuring the, the dissemination of subjugated knowledges. Subjugated knowledges, a phrase coined by Michel Foucault, refers to the ways of knowing that have been ignored or, mar or marginalized in the dominant culture. Centering scholarship based on the knowledges that have been disregarded or trivialized is the project of ethnic studies. These units center the lives, the histories, struggles, theories, and knowledges of subjugated populations whose realities, contributions, and impact have been erased or whitewashed in much of mainstream curriculum. Ethnic studies programs also reject the notion that there can be such a thing as colorblind scholarship. They expose and critique the racialization of knowledge and cultural production, which is necessary since it is much easier to recognize ex exclusion or inclusion when it happens to bodies and harder to see when we're talking about the production of knowledge. Through our ethnic studies research and teaching, we explore the politics of knowledge production, specifically which knowledges are unquestionably endorsed and what ways of knowing are considered as an afterthought, if at all. This is the project that expands and enriches all the humanities and social sciences. Our various ethnic studies programs and departments offer uh, different content, but we have common goals and objectives. One, we undertake scholarship projects that center subjugated knowledges, thereby addressing a serious gap, enriching all knowledges. Two, we engage students to analyze the, wor the world critically, 
interrupt status quo thinking and dismantle the systems of power, privilege, and oppression that operate in the world. Three, we explore the consequences of these structures through an understanding of the experiences of peoples and communities impacted by these systems. Four, we seek to inspire students to work for political and economic social justice and transform the ways that we see and respond to the world. And five, we work to build understanding, coalition, and solidarity across communities in the U.S. and globally to work toward a different future. Centering subjugated knowledges has, been, uh, has become increasingly important, especially as this, at this juncture, as we are living through a time of heightened racial tensions that is directly connected to anxiety about shifting demographics and the perceived diminished currency of white privilege. We need to address this across the curriculum. In preparing our students for today's world, we fail to educate them well if we send them off without encountering a direct and sustained challenge to their racial understandings and the, problems, the problem of white supremacy and white dominance. Students need to gain a critical perspective about the historical roots of inequality, along with an understanding of the lasting effect of oppression on marginalized groups in society today. This is a worthy goal. Without it, students are woefully unprepared if in their education they are solely taught to understand and interpret the world through the gaze of the dominant culture, the prevailing academic paradigm that is legitimized and normalized throughout most, throughout, throughout most of their education from kindergarten to college. We need to provide students with the skills and tools they will need to navigate the 21st century. As we all know, the demographic makeup of this country and college-bound population is shifting. Already in many cities across the country, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and multiracial people make up a majority of the American school children. While 45% of all undergraduates are people of color, the percentage of faculty of color who greet them in college is less than 24%. Nationally, even fewer people of color are tenured full professor in full professor positions since 81% of these are held by uh, white people. Um, as we know, in Ivy League universities like Harvard, the number of faculty of color are even more inadequate. According to a 2019 report on faculty diversity, 92% of tenured faculty at Harvard are white. As theologian Miguel del Torre reminds us, academic institutions that disregard our country's changing demographics and ignore the questions and concerns students of color bring to our institutions may, up, may end up losing their relevance for the emerging minor, majority of university students. How can students and universities better serve this population, many of whom will be first-generation students? Centering subjugated knowledge has to be part of the response. This shift in perspective is important, not only for students of color, but for all students, so that they are all better equipped to challenge the distorted, inaccurate, partial versions of history and culture they have been taught. They will be better served by having been exposed to an understanding of the world through multiple lens. Basically, this involves not only ensuring that our students have access to one or two ethnic studies courses or women and gender studies courses, but profoundly rethinking the way many traditional courses are taught. The task of dismantling the white supremacist foundations of our education system will require much work because as sociologist Camila Z. Charles states, quote, prejudice and discrimination is in our cultural DNA. It's in our understanding of American history and culture, and this reinforces the superiority of Anglo-Americans or white American history and experience. And she adds, we all suffer the consequences of that. It's also true, however, that across its over 50-year evolution, 
some of our ethnic studies work has lost its radical edge, lost its connection and synergy with community activism, and evolved into uncritical celebrations of cultural diversity and multiculturalism. Concurrently, over the last few decades, universities, universities have increasingly co-opted our concerns about structural inequality and power balance, imbalances. Diversity has become another commodity or brand. Universities seem to talk about diversity all the time. Quite often, however, the term seems cliched and empty of meaning. Feminist writer uh, Anna Holmes suggests that the word diversity has become, quote, a convenient shorthand that yet gestures at inclusivity and representation without actually taking them seriously. It's as if we think that invoking the word makes it a reality, except that universities focus primarily on cosmetic and symbolic changes. A lecture series, the addition of one or two black people, a diversity officer, a couple of town hall meetings. It's not that these responses aren't beneficial, it's that they're insufficient. They don't focus on equity and meaningful systemic inclusion in a sustained way. It seems that every year we're protesting yet another unfair tenure decision, writing angry letters, expressing outrage. Again and again, universities hire, exploit, and then spit out people of color, and then begin the cycle all over again. As Trevor C. Ellison noted a few years ago, commenting on the tenure denial of faculty of color at Dartmouth, quote, Universities don't have a diversity problem. Rather, the temporary, precarious, and disavowed labor of people of color at universities is their purposeful and intentional diversity solution. What I hope to have suggested today is that one way of making our engagement with diversity more meaningful would be by working to center subjugated knowledges in our universities first by hiring and tenuring scholars skillfully doing this work, and then by providing resources to expand and strengthen the, the programs and departments that are already engaged in this work. And finally, by integrating the approach across our curriculum. Our programs also have the expertise and the knowledge to address the racial and intersectional um, inequities and injustices within our universities and, and across the, universe, the U.S. So universities should recognize this, draw on this expertise, and build upon it. The best of our ethnic studies projects, beautifully exemplified by Loria, Lor, Loria Garcia Peña's scholarship and teaching, embodies a critical ethnic studies approach that analyzes systems of power and inequity and promotes transformative practices in scholarship and community engagement. This approach is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and intersectional. Its focus is local, transnational, and global. It is at the core of the conversations we need to be having about how to address the problems of inequality, systemic racism, sustainability, and the other challenges we're faced with today. It is a critical ethnic studies grounded in the decolonial, de anti-racist, feminist movements that gave impetus to ethnic studies and continues to inform its development. The best of this work is, is anchored in comparative, relational, and global frameworks that can most effectively deconstruct racism, colonialism, and imperialism. The best scholars, like Loria Peña Garcia, are committed to developing new analytical paradigms and languages which are not bound by national or regional borders. It is specifically this work that resists the institutionalization and the co-optations of our fields of study. As my colleagues will explore in greater detail, Loria Garcia Peña's work helps us rethink concepts like Latinidad, blackness, race, and ethnicity, and situate them in a transnational and global perspective. She is very much interested in relational formations of race. Her work asks us to consider racialization 
and the formation of Dominican and Haitian identities relative to one another, as well as in relation to colonial projects, since racial constructions are formed not only in connection to whiteness, but also relative to other uh, marginalized groups. She demonstrates how the construction of reality is a, a mutually constitutive process. From this type of analysis, we learn how subordinated groups are differently positioned and how inclusion and exclusion are dynamic and shifting processes, varying in accordance to the underlying logic of the colonial power structure. In the conclusion to her brilliant book, The Borders of Dominicanidad, Loria humbly notes, quote, I am hopeful that the work I want my book to do, to shatter silences and uncover other archives of knowledge, will get us closer to a dialogue about the ways in which scholarship can dismantle the intellectual legacy sustaining systems of oppression, end quote. In fact, her research, teaching, and activism compellingly contest the anti-black and the anti-immigrant forces we are struggling with today and helps us imagine new, bold, and creative ways to disrupt these dynamics. This is exactly the promise of critical ethnic studies and the best of what our scholarship can offer. Thank you. Well, it's an honor and pleasure for me to follow Laura Torres to this podium. I'm going to build on uh, some of what she said. I'd like to begin with the word of blessing and praise for our forebearers uh, to whom we are connected by lines of bloodshed and to ancestors to whom we're connected by complex but real uh, legacies of bloodlines. Their suffering, struggle, and sacrifice made it possible for us to be here. And we can't demand less uh, from ourselves uh, knowing that that's how uh, this event come, came into being. I want to echo what uh, Lorgia Garcia Pena offers as her goal in this wonderful book, The Borders of Dominicana Dad. She says she's seeking to shatter the long historical silences that have persistently sustained state violence, exclusion, and oppression of a large part of our humanity for far too long. This is what's at stake in her research. She's not simply adding on uh, an extraneous object of study to what is already known. She's identified a critical marginality, a place where the seams show, and that forces us to call into question the types of learning we've been accustomed to accepting uh, in these institutions. Of course, we respect all forms of knowledge. We can't dispense with any way of knowing. But all too often, in these universities where we work, what we are taught is to learn to live with evil and then to lie about it. And when you, and when you counter that, you have to expect that the uh, perpetrators of this mendacity uh, will try to defend themselves. But they don't do it because they're so strong. They don't do it because their arguments work so well. They do it, in fact, because if the seem show if the ways of working are exposed, then all of the privilege that they have becomes called into question. And so we have meaningful work to do here today. In this book, she points out the silence and repetitions erase Dominican racialized subjects from the nation and its archive, but that this is not an incidental absence. It's a constitutive element in scholarship that teaches legitimation of domination, subordination, and suffering. And so our goal today is to move from indignation to action. Of course we're offended, of course we're hurt, of course we're outraged by the decision that's been made. But what we think and what we feel is less important than what we do. And I think that the work we have to do today is first of all to recognize that negative ascription and injury are not our failing, but rather the oppressor's self-defense strategy. 
we need to see acts of repression not as directed at individuals, not only directed at all of us, but directed at the populations whose identities we come to vicariously represent within the academy. Things, the calculated cruelty and organized abandonment of people uh, uh, of, from aggrieved racialized communities around the world um, is, cannot uh, fail to touch us when we come into the university and become identified with those cultures. And it is to our credit that we understand that uh, these acts of repression uh, don't begin and end in a tenure committee. They have the long fetch of history before them. And it's up to us to expose the meanness, the mendacity, the calculated cruelty of those in power. And what Professor Garcia Pena says is we need to contest the dictions of the powerful with the contradictions of the people. She says, dictions are projected and performed on racialized bodies to sustain the exclusionary borders of the nation. This is the negative ascription that we perceive and often respond to with a positive affirmation. But even more important than that positive affirmation are contradictions, stories, narratives, and speech acts that go against the mode of analysis we tend to value as historically accurate and what most people have been persuaded to call truth. So I think we have a homework assignment today from our teacher, Professor Garcia Pena. She says, the body of the border subject, the Prieto, the Rieno, the Haitian uh, immigrant for the Dominican York, can also be an archive of contradiction. And so we need to turn diction into contradiction and understand that we're not simply fighting for inclusion in an institution that is set up not to work for us. We're not seeking inclusion uh, in a, a, a discourse in which we're uh, offered as an act of charity a seat at the end of the table. We understand that this system has for us either sadistic exclusion or subordinate inclusion. And we reject both of those in order to understand that those are not aberrant and in incidental occurrences, but rather they're what is constitutive of coloniality. We're not trying to add on people of color stuff to white stuff. We want to know how stuff gets to be stuff in the first place. And we want to understand the harm that that kind of uh, uh, typology and uh, definition produces. In translating blackness, her uh, forthcoming masterpiece, uh, Professor uh, Garcia Pena demonstrates the ways in which Afro-Latinidad is not merely an embodied or socially constructed personal identity, but a category that confounds the reigning categories. Those of you who know Michelle Rolf uh, Trio's a great book, Silencing the Past, says that the reason why Haiti is absent from the discourses of the West is not because Haiti is unimportant, but because full knowledge of the Haitian Revolution and its aftermath exposes the, the normative logic of, of the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment world. And so therefore, it has to be suppressed because it calls into question the reigning categories. And uh, Afro-Latinidad is also presented here as a social formation that demands new theoretical and empirical approaches to the pairing of promises of universal inclusion, which we hear all the time, and the practices of differentiated exclusion, which we uh, experience directly. So these Afro-Latinx immigrant identities that she discusses, they're not atypical marginal or minor experiences, but there are a register of dramatic transportation, transformations taking place in the core categories of our existence. Citizenship and social membership, nationalism and knowledge production, patriotism and patriarchy, identity and intersectionality. They're a vantage point from which the way we're governed can at last be accurately understood. Our goal, I think, is to turn hegemony on its head. Walter referenced Fannie Lou Hamer earlier, and I think we're in a situation where we have much to learn from her experience. 1963, Mrs. Hamer is in Winona, Mississippi. Uh, she's going to register to vote. They take her to jail. The uh, white sheriff uh, orders black inmates to beat her. They uh, damage her physically. Uh, they damage her emotionally in ways that she never fully recovers from. The purpose of the meeting was done to silence her, to make her an object lesson, to make sure that she and people like her would not speak up to white supremacy. Mrs. Hamer used that beating to speak, not to be silent. She mentioned it at every talk she gave for the next 15 years. 
And that thing that was meant to silence her turned out to be the opportunity for her to expose what her jailers were up to. They could no longer claim that she was unfit for citizenship, unfit for freedom. They could no longer claim that she couldn't pass the literacy test. They could no longer claim she didn't pay the poll tax. They had to use naked power. And because they had to use that naked power, she was able to take that um, uh, a vile act on their part and turn it against them. Winona became famous worldwide as the site of the beating. The very thing that was meant to silence her made that city known all over the world. It's like uh, 60 years ago, um, this Saturday, uh, four young men ordered at a Woolworth's lunch counter and uh, they didn't get their cup of coffee, they got beaten uh, because the, the effort was to shut them up and to preserve the system of Jim Crow. That led to a sit-in movement that overturned a century of segregation. I'm sure somebody at Woolworths thought, you know, we should have served them that cup of coffee. We, we, we would have gotten off better. And I want us to produce a situation where somebody says, you know, we should have given Professor Garcia Pena tenure because <laughs> this, this has come back to bite us. But it only come back to bite us, not for what we say, not for what we think, not for what we feel, but from what we do. The contradictions, and uh, Professor uh, Torres mentioned this, um, have been at these points, uh, these roadblocks, these log jams, uh, where new theories develop. So critical race theory in law uh, that was developed on this campus when Kimberly Crenshaw and other students um, saw that the racial liberalism that they were being taught in the law school ignored 90% of the racism that happens in U.S. society. Uh, and they asked for uh, a different education because um, people like Kim studied under Professor Turner in Africana Studies at Cornell. Kim's brother brought home the Black Panther Party newspaper. There was a reality that she brought into these discourses that was not there, not being taught to her by the racial liberals. And she saw in that there was something wrong with the law and that the law needed to be changed. Similarly, Evelyn Nicano Glenn goes to graduate school as a sociologist and you can study labor, you can study gender, you can study citizenship as if they're separate categories. But as somebody who as a child was in the internment camps, somebody whose mother worked uh, doing the cleaning for white women in their houses, she saw that what we have is a system of capitalism that is already raced and gendered and can't be studied separately. Now anybody in theory could have, uh, could have studied that. Anybody in theory could have seen the limits of the law. But Kim Crenshaw being the victim of urban renewal in Canton, Ohio, and uh, uh, being part of a uh, student ethnic studies program, uh, saw it differently. Evelyn Cano Glenn, uh, having been put in concentration camps, saw things differently. And that knowledge wasn't just a diversity that enabled them as teachers to be a moment of comic relief in the lives of the children of their enemies. It enabled them to critique the fundamental ways in which knowledge develops. And similarly, we're all here in great debt to feminist and queer theory and action, action that often had to fight even against left movements, even against movements by people of color, to point out that identities are uh, not fixed, that they're fluid, that they're dynamic, they're contingent. Uh, and these studies of identities as social and cultural constructs have helped everybody. They aren't just the partial parochial perspective of, uh, of, of people who have been left out. So we need to think about diction in the academy. Every established discipline has an origin story that reveals its formulation as a response to Europe's colonization, conquest, and enslavement of peoples designated as other. Crenshaw, Danny Hosang, Luke Harris, and I tried to make an argument for this in a book we have called Seeing Race Again. Racial domination and indigenous dispossession are central, not peripheral, to knowledge making in this society. They're treated as bounded peripheral topics relevant only to some people, but marginal to the most important research questions. So we have to pose this with contradiction. We're not about adding on forgotten knowledge, but we're about identifying absences that are constitutive of knowledge that is structured in dominance. We're not involved in an effort to uh, desegregate the ranks of the pain inflictors of this world. We want to challenge the normalization of pain uh, in inflicting. Um, the, um, I, I'm old enough to remember people in the streets with signs that said freedom now. 
I never remember anybody with a sign that said diversity now, you know? That, that, that's somebody else's word. We are also the antidote to the parochialism and provincialism of an academy that draws its interlocutors and its archives, its imaginaries, its epistemologies and ontologies from too narrow a social group. We are in fact the quality control arm of the academy because we save it from its monolingualism, from its nationalism, from its heteronormativity. None of us want to be in this room because of the event. We, we, if we could have wished away the event that happened, that brought us together, we would all do that. But we have to understand, as Homer Bible points out, every emergency enables an emergence. Subordination and exclusion do not define who we are. They are merely conditions of our existence, as Cedric Robinson used to say. The Oneida poet Roberta Hill says, their fear of the dark is not my identity. We're not just counterpunchers against racist acts against us. We have something different to say. Contradiction enables us to turn our enemies into unwitting accomplices in our own liberation. The darkest moments of our despair can be the first moments of our deliverance. And of course, we're doing this in a context where much is going on in the world. We're part of a bigger picture. The people in the Dominican Republic, in, uh, in uh, Washington Heights, who are protesting against racist laws in the Dominican Republic, the mass protests in Puerto Rico, are part of a global refusal of unlivable destinies. And we have to understand that we have a partial place of entry into those conversation. I think what this denial of tenure indicates, as in so many other cases, the claims of merit, market, and choice that are used to disempower us are simply covers for naked power. That they're basically ways in which people uh, who believe real, who purport to believe in all kinds of uh, noble things, they, 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 they've outlined to us what it takes to um, demonstrate influence and impact in the academy. But when somebody does that, it turns out what they're really committed to is uh, presum the presumption of their own right to exclude or determine the nature, pace, uh, and terms of inclusion. And for us, uh, this is, in some ways, can be a liberating gesture. Uh, my, my friend Ivory Perry used to say, being for social justice in this society is like being in love with someone who's not in love with you. You know, you, you can see how it would work out. You're constantly arguing. You say, I think this will work. And no, no, no. But that broken heart can uh, guide you, can stimulate you to uh, do important things, to challenge uh, dominant ways of knowing, dominant ways of being. I think that... Um, we have an opportunity to follow up on Mrs. Hamer. Uh, this is a story she used to tell, and I want to conclude with it. I want to announce that uh, we have a special issue of the journal CALFU, which will be dedicated to this decision and our evaluation of it. I'm inviting everyone in this room and everybody beyond this room to submit something, and we will try to turn that into a weapon of the struggle. Uh, but I also want to say that we shouldn't be uh, daunted by how difficult our task is at this moment. Mrs. Hamer used to tell a story, and what she was trying to get at was that ultimately it's up to us. Ultimately, uh, in this world, the work you do speaks for you. The story she tells is of a uh, wise man in uh, her hometown. Uh, he had the answer to everything. He knew the name of the unknown soldier. You know, he, he knew everything. <laughs> and so some boys tried to trick him. And they got a bird, and they put it behind the boy puts the bird behind his back and says, uh, hey man, is the bird alive or dead? And if the guy answers the bird is alive, the kid will crush it and kill it. If he says the bird is dead, the boy will let the bird fly away. There's no way for this guy to win. But Mrs. Hamer said this was a wise man. They said, is the bird alive or dead? And uh, the man said, well, the answer is in your hands. <laughs> the answer is in our hands to this. We may not like. Uh, the hand we've been dealt by history here. But how we will play it uh, will count for a lot, not only for ourselves, but for freedom-loving people all around the world. Good morning. 
I want to give my thanks to the organizers of this event, Warren Center staff, Arthur Patton Hawk, Monique McCall, Faculty Director Walter Johnson, the staffs of other academic units at Harvard in, uh, involved, and the custodial and catering staff that prepared this room for us. I especially want to thank Nicole Guadalli Hernandez for the invitation to participate and whose mentorship I've been privileged to have during my graduate years through our shared interest in archival research and C19 Latinx studies. It should also be noted that I came into contact with Nicole's work and presence through the person who brings us all here, my advisor, the indomitable Lorja Garcia Pena. <laughs> In receiving the invitation to speak for this event, I had a lot of feelings. The first feeling, perhaps endemic to grad students writ large, was the odd mix of awe and anxiety in speaking among senior scholars who I've long admired and whose intellectual and political work so deeply impacts my own practice. I think that initial feeling is certainly still with me today, but what I most feel deeply now is a sense of gratitude for the collection of scholars and artists gathered here today at the symposium, those present physically and virtually, and the thousand individuals across the world who have shared their deep respect for Lorja's work through hashtag LorjaFest, the signing and sharing petitions, and teaching and citing her work in their own intellectual life worlds. As someone just beginning their academic career, struggling to make sense of this often wayward and frustrating profession, especially in light of the unjust tenure denial of my mentor, it is heartening to see how we, those of us working in ethnic studies, gender and queer studies, black studies and related fields, can take the time to celebrate and organize around a highly respected scholar and teacher. In my remarks today, I wanna to share a few thoughts related to the prompt of this panel, which is to situate our understanding of ethnic studies as a field in relation to Lorja's work and contributions. This is no easy task and could easily take longer than the time allotted to me, but I'd like to foreground my thoughts with attention to the body, the role of the body, the lessons of the body we gain from Lorja's work that have been the crux of my own scholarly training and teaching in ethnic studies. This is perhaps one of her most indelible interventions, a constant reminder to all of us to think about the power of body to function both as a side of subjugation and radical change. It is ironic, for me at least, to talk about the body in relation to Lorja's worth and ethnic studies when we are holding and residing in this symposium in a room as august as this one. For those of us familiar with Harvard, the Thompson Room and many like it have been places where, despite providing necessary locations for critical engagement, have also been sites of frustration and discomfort where in various moments my work and identity as a Latinx scholar from a working class background have been made insignificant. I would be lying if I didn't receive some gleeful amount of comfort from wondering what Theodore Roosevelt, who you don't see, he's behind this, this uh, screen here, or the various random white men in this room, or represented in this room, would have thought to see this awe-inspiring group here with the collective knowledges we represent. I am emboldened by the conversations we will have today and the never-ending project of trying to make Harvard a place more accountable to those who reside in it, something students, teachers, and staff have been doing for decades. These kinds of moments where we get to inhabit these spaces are sustaining. However, I also want to acknowledge how ephemeral these collective moments are, and as we sadly know, how precarious and dispensable black and brown bodies are to this university. The impetus of this event and the many occasions of when institutions like Harvard reject scholars of color from permanent positions despite placing impossible demands on their time and energy cannot be understated. Like others who have spoken already, I hope that part of our collective discussion today, along with rightly celebrating Lorja's work, can also think concretely about steps to ensure such egregious denials do not happen again. In short, I want to keep the body at the core of our conversation to show how Lorja reminds us through her research, teaching, and mentorship, and broader community engagement to call upon its form to recognize the complexities of oppression and the power of change. These are the messages I have been privileged to learn from her over my time as a graduate student, the reminders of it, that have made being at Harvard worth it, the truths I plan to carry with me as I continue on to whatever paths I take next. Since my earliest engagement with ethnic studies, I have always been struck by the importance of the body as a site of resistance, learning about the student protests at FS State and UC Berkeley in the late 1960s and subsequent movements in the later decades, I saw how the body manifests itself in sit-ins, hunger strikes, and other forms of embodied protest. Reading Women of Color Feminism by Gloria Zaldua, Shri Moraga, and others, I saw concepts like theory in the flesh advocated for radical epistemologies rooted in one physical's realities. These histories and theories were a breath of fresh air 
As I navigate an Ivy League institution, not unlike this one, as a queer Latinx first-gen student from working class background, they are put into practice in every space I inhabited, from the classroom to the dance floor, where Latinx and other students of color use what we learn from our ethnic and feminist and black studies classes to learn more about our communities and prepare ourselves for the world outside of the academy. Most importantly, I got to understand ethnic studies through the vantage point of professors of color who devoted so much time, of their, so much of their time and energy to supporting their students, people like Alicia Schmidt Camacho, Stephen Pretty, Daphne Books, Crystal Feimster, and my undergraduate thesis advisor, Albert Laguna, introduced me to whole areas of study that I never encountered before. The mere, their mere physical presence uh, created new life roles for students like myself, and as I began to think more seriously about a career in academia, provided models for how to survive and thrive in two often hostile and intellectual environments. And just as a side, for those who don't know, it should also be noted that Albert, a leading thinker in Latinx studies, was denied tenure at Yale last year. The continual rejection of Latinx ethnic mm -hmm. studies scholars at Ivy League schools and peer institutions is haunting, to say the least. When it came time to figure out what I wanted to focus on in my graduate work, I turned to the field of performance studies, and in particular, works of performance by and about people of color. Within my primary concern towards ethnic studies and Latinx, Latinx studies, the chance to deep thinkly about the minoritarian body through the lens of performance was a natural fit. Scholarly monographs like Jose Munoz's disidentifications, Roman, uh, Ramon Rivera Cervera's performing queer Latinidad, Juana Maria Rodriguez's queer futures, uh, sexual futures, queer gestures, and other Latina longings, provided scholarly examples of how it could combine ethnic studies scholarship with theories about the body. Noticing what was still mentioned in the scholarship, about the relationship to Latinx embodiment in the archive, of the experiences of black indigenous people within Latinidad, of Latinx cultural producers who existed in time periods before the later half of the 20th century, spurred my current research project on Latinx performance history and genealogies of relational racialization in the 19th century US. It is not accidental that the questions I hold at the center of my scholarly identity draw directly from my experiences as a student of Lorja Garcia Pena. I don't remember the exact contents of our very first meeting as my time as a prospective student, but I do recall the power I felt when realizing she was here on this campus doing the work that she did. Sorry. Amidst serious doubts uh, about whether, sorry, <clears throat> whether or not I could succeed in a PhD program doing the work I cared about at a place like Harvard Lorja helped me with clear honesty to understand what me being here meant and how I could work in this environment. As I came to understand the years that follow, uh, Lorja's physical presence on this campus created entire new worlds for so many different types of communities, uh, a practice which I see directly tied to her vision and commitment to ethnic studies. Writing in response to Albert's tenure denial and the activism of Yale faculty members, she affirms that, quote, Ethnic studies departments and programs make our universities a little less biased, a little less racist, a little less white. They provide students with spaces for thinking and writing about important questions. They also provide support for students of color who are made to feel in every other course like second class citizens who are reminded they don't belong, end quote. Undergirding these words is a recognition of the power of the body, something that becomes radically apparent in the many interventions our scholarship, teaching, and mentorship make. Lorja makes the body's importance clear for all of us to understand from the earliest pages of her award-winning book, The Borders of Dominicanidad, Race, Nation, and the Archives of Contradiction, when she opens with the rich vignette of racism and sexism she experienced while, uh, while uh, as a graduate student at the University of Michigan. In recounting this experience, which resonates with me and I'm sure many of us in this room, she notes how, quote, my body, by its mere positioning within the academic space, also interrupted the professor's knowledge of Dominicanidad, end quote. In a letter, later reflection on the moment, she offers the crawling, following crystal clear summation of how the body must be at the focal point of her intellectual project, intellectual project and all of ours. If the body, this, this is her, as Gross argues, become a th can become a thing through which the dominant rhetoric of sex and gender can be contested, I argue can also be a site where the violence and silencing of borders contained in the nation's archive can be contradicted. If the body of the racialized subject can carry the burden of coloniality, becoming a screen onto which colonial desires and fears can be projected, this book argues it can also become a site from where the histories and stories that perpetuate and sustain the oppressive borders of the nation can also be interpolated." End quote. 
These opening pages set the stage for a truly marvelous monograph that puts the body center stage an examination of how official narratives about the Dominican Republic have been scripted onto bodies as means of upholding them, and how, how, and how racialized Dominicans and Haitians in various locations have contested these discourses through corporeal acts. At the core of this project is Onye, the conceptualization of Dominican diasporic identity articulated by artist and philosopher Josebina Valles. In this work, Onye functions as a corporeal transhistorical space that foregrounds, quote, the body that carries the violent borders that deter them from entering the nation, from access to full citizenship, and from public, cultural, historical, and political representation. This focus on the body of the racialized Dominican diasporic subject through Onye reinforces the importance of border thinking that puts emphasis on, emphasis on the body as a site where exclusion is maintained across space and history. It is these bodies in Onye, the Rayano, the Dominicana, the Dominican New York, the Dominican Haitian migrant, and their various performative contradictions that form the core of the book. In discussions of figures like Baez, Olivorio Mateo, and Sonia Marmolejos, we garner a critical understanding of how bodies and their contradictions work in relation to nation, race, gender, and colonialism. By focusing our critical attention to the embodied processes of bordering in the Dominican Republic and its diaspora, Lorge's work makes clear the importance of thinking about Latinx subjects that are often occluded from dominant ethnic studies canons. She calls for a rethinking of the overemphasization of the US-Mexico border and Latinx, bodies, border, Latinx and border studies, writing that, quote, my book invites the reader to think about how other geographic and symbolic borders have been significant in imagining the national identity of the United States particularly as it relates to race, blackness, and ethnicity, Latinidad, end quote. The body is crucial to this intervention, for in rethinking the kinds of border formation and migration we privilege in Latinx and ethnic studies, Lorja emphasizes how racialized bodies as they exist in El Nye are multiply imposed by discourses of nation building and colonial imperial projects that merit sustained historical and literary analysis. The centering lived experience while draw, drawing on the Dominican Republic is a far-reaching intervention for studies of race and ethnicity more broadly. It should also be noted that, that the borders of Dominican, Dominicanidad is an ingenious integration of performance studies frameworks alongside those of black studies, transgenerational women, color feminisms, and many other fields to essentially unpack the relationship between history, literature, and nation. For instance, the deployment of speech act theory to underscore the performative power of contradictory moments, such as Josefina Bias's declaration of black is a color, black is my color, or undocumented high school student Elizabeth Gotti Bay's double articulation of her name, are but a few of the moments in which the book takes established performance studies concepts and creatively resituates them to understand histories largely absent in the field. Mundane acts are rigorously contextualized and retemporalized through historical and aesthetic works to understand the ramifications of Latinx embodiment across various time periods. As such, I would suggest that the borders of Dominicanidad not only makes the case for a corporally focused ethnic studies scholarship, but also a mode of performance studies work that goes beyond the overemphasis on the proscenium stage and US-centric theatrical and cultural productions. The importance of the body resonates not just in Lourdes scholarship, but also in her work as a teacher and mentor. I think often of the quote, off-cited quote from Bell Hooks teaching to transgress, that the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. Um, I have sought to translate these teachings into the classroom here at Harvard, in this place where minoritarian bodies are repeatedly underappreciated and pushed out. It is through Lorda's own practice that I've understood what it means to be an ethnic studies teacher by witnessing your incredible skill in the classroom. As I interface with the broader field, I am reminded over and over again how much Lorja is, is singular as an advisor of graduate students. In working with scholars pursuing a variety of projects in Latinx American Caribbean women's gender studies, too many, you know, so many students, so many of us rely on her here, she challenges us to expand the established categories of our fields to include the lived experiences of those who are routinely at the margins. One of the fav my favorite classes here, her graduate sem seminar, Globo Latinidad, we took on the collective intellectual work of resituating Latinx studies criticism to consider the historical legacies of colonialism and slavery in Latinidad through black and indigenous experiences. What I retain most from that class is the honest and thoughtful conversations about how we as scholars of color must prepare holistically for futures in the academy, from the mechanics of putting together op-eds to engagements with questions of academic civility and precarity through the works of thinkers like Stephen Salida. These impulses carry out into the many spaces she has established here that support graduate students, from inviting 
groundbreaking scholars, artists, and activists, many of whom are in this room, to establishing an uh, entire curricula for us. In all of her interactions with her students, Lorja always makes clear, sure that in her own, our own work, our classrooms, our intellectual and activist spaces, remember, remember the need to care for the body, to remember its historical residences and future worlds. With time and resources always too short, she affirms that I too am a person, not just a producer of research and writing. She opens her home to us, the ones far away from the places we call home, to find refuge in a rarely welcoming environment. She champions us during difficult times and celebrates us during the good ones. I can confidently say that without her mentorship, um, I would likely have left Harvard and protects academia writ large. Similarly, her undergraduate classes in ethnic studies and Latinx studies consistently center black and brown li lived histories at their core, whether those that can be learned about in various texts or in centering the narratives of the students in the classrooms themselves. Serving as a TA for her classes has been a master class in how to integrate critical race and ethnic studies theories and histories in spaces where these topics are woefully missing but vitally needed. From Latinx literature to the pol politics and processes of uh, activist-centered archival research, her classes rigorously prepare students to approach the world through critical lenses, lessons that, as evidenced by student activism we have wit uh, witnessed recently and in the near past, have lasting impacts on making sure Harvard is a better place. One class stands out in particular, the class performing Latinidad. As a class that serves as an introduction to Latinx studies, it makes an important claim for thinking about the body as a crucial site for understanding how Latin Latinidad operates. Students in this class engage with canonical and new critical aesthetic texts that center the body and build creative performative actions that take course concepts into practice on Harvard's campus. They learn the importance of caring for their bodies in hostile spaces and to work towards better futures. It is a model of ethnic studies pedagogy that I take with me in every class I teach. This class has special, special significance for many of us fortunate to participate in its project. For myself, it's one of the few spaces on campus where I see ethnic studies concepts being put into action, where intellectual, aesthetic, social acts are intertwined at its core. Every semester that's offered, I'm always amazed by the way it galvanizes student action and becomes a space space for those who participate. For many students of color, first-gen students, migrants, and queers, it is one of the few places where our history are taken seriously by a professor who shares those lived experiences. It was the first Harvard class I visited as a prospective student. It was a space I went to on campus after the most recent presidential election to cope with the ramifications of what had transpired. It was the last class of Lorges at Harvard in whose final session I had the privilege of attending. It saddens me to know that such a class will not be offered again, but I am heartened by the traces it leaves on this campus in our bodies and actions moving forward. In closing, I want to reiterate my thanks for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. In processing what has happened over the past two months, the feelings of anger and sadness and frustration over this terrible denial, I have appreciated the chance to celebrate the importance of Lorja's work for myself and I'm sure all of us here. I will hold on to the many lessons Lorja has imparted through her scholarship teaching to carry them into my body for years to come to continue to fight. Thank you. Four hours after um, the election of Donald Trump in November of 2016, um, I and all the members of the executive committee of the American Studies Association got an email from a senior faculty member at Harvard saying that since this election represented a rebellion by, somebody knows what I'm talking about, um, Re represents a rebellion by white working class men, which is not true, but we'll go there. Um, <laughs> then subsequently, American Quarterly should stop talking so much about gender, race, and class. <laughs> and that was such a weird sentence. I was like, white and working class and male would not be genders, races, and class. <laughs> anyway. I couldn't figure out what to say, except 
obviously this is empowering some bad stuff at Harvard. And I thought this election is going to open up all holy hell at Harvard if somebody feels brave enough to send that email to us. And <clears throat> unfortunately, the events that bring us here confirm that suspicion. Um, the Borders of Dominicanidad is a book about the vanishing of the Dominican Republic in relation to our conversations about United States imperialism, Latinidad, gender meanings, and blackness, which in a painful irony is exactly what brings us here today. The illegibility of Lurgia Garcia Pena's work to Harvard's administration and some senior faculty resulting in her tenure denial. If we needed any confirmation about the invisibility of the Dominican Republic, we got it in this administrative action. But as Lucia Garcia Pena says in the book, fiercely pushing back against the normative silencing of the DR and the way it's used to produce a US racism, this book is my way to respond to the growing anti-immigrant and anti-black violence devastating our present world. And this conference is our, way of also, is our way also of saying no to that violence and refusing that erasure. I want to thank Nicole Guidati Hernandez and the Warren Center fellows and staff for having the presence of mind to bring us all together today to celebrate this gem of a book and our marvelous and intellectually generous colleague, Lurcia Garcia Pena. For me, as a scholar of US empire, the Caribbean, gender studies, and Latinx studies, this book was mind-blowing and eye-opening. While the DR has always been very much on my radar, I actually lived there for a year and for more than a decade had a partner who was a Dominican studies scholar, I somehow managed to not think the thought that this book so centrally brings to our attention, which is that the Haiti-Dominican Republic border is inside the United States as Lurcia Garcia Pena provocatively puts it, or rather that the way this border is imagined in the DR and the US is a product of US empire. Any number of scholars, Sybil Fisher, Susan Buck Morris, Lauren Dubois, Mary Renda, and Michelle Rolf Trio have asked us to consider that Haiti was important to ideologies about slavery and blackness in the United States and that case seems relatively settled, at least among us, and easy to make. The Haitian Revolution roiled slave owners in the United States, underscoring the threat in the southern US of a mass uprising of enslaved people where they were a numerical majority. The Haitian Republic also resulted in tens of thousands of Haiti slave owners coming to the United States some bringing enslaved African and African descended people with them. The US occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934 shaped ideas of race, gender, and empire, and as scholar Aaron Durbin would add, sexuality in the United States. So we know that. What Borders of Dominicanidad asks us to think about is the other side of Hispaniola today's DR and the US occupation there from 1916 to 1924, or arguably until 1941, and then again in 1965, and how much the stories about what the Marines were doing there relied on and reproduced a dichotomous view of the island, the fundamentally absurd insistence that there were black Haitians on the one, on the one side and mestizo Dominicans on the other. Lurcia Garcia Pena reminds us that this binary view that excluded Dominican blackness was not just produced through the racist stories of the Criollo elites in the DR. The US Marines and the colonial occupation government did not just produce violence and victimization, it also, to paraphrase Pena, produced stories. The US occupation criminalized Dominican blackness. The Marines killed Afro-Dominican religious figure Alivorio Mateo, also known as Papa Liborio, along with the people in his community in an atrocity that included murdering children and displaying Mateo's dead body because Dominican rural black communities, their heroes and their religious ceremonies were increasingly associated with the threat of peasant rebellion against the US occupation. 
The Marines also disrupted the ceremonies of the confradias and seized religious items like drums and rum. We can understand the ongoing criminalization of Afro-Dominican religious ceremonies in the US and the island with their queer and female leadership as dating to the US occupation of the DR. The book shows us how again and again, the production of this border and these oppositions had long roots in the United States, which results in the criminalization of and refusal of Dominican blackness. So to take only one among many examples Lercia Garcia Pena offers us, when the earthquake of 2010 devastated Haiti, we found US writers producing the border all over again, commenting on Haiti's deforestation, blackness, poverty, and vodun or voodoo, the latter, the imaginary religion produced by Hollywood, as if they somehow caused the earthquake as against a Dominican landscape that they characterized as prosperous, Catholic, verdant, and mestizo. From the 19th century to last week, we see again and again how this border is produced in the US racial and national imaginary as much as on the island. This book also offers important interventions into gender studies. That wasn't my assignment, but I thought it was important to say. <laughs> Helping us to see how the association of womanhood with the nation runs through Hispaniola and produces a familiar narrative about sexuality and dangerous black men. In particular, Lorcia Garcia Pena retells the, familiar, ner, the story of the Galindo family, including their three young daughters who were murdered in an act of banditry in 1822. Although the men who were convicted of the murder were all light-skinned Spanish speakers, three decades later, the story was rewritten to make the children virgins raped by Haitian soldiers. It was a move designed to consolidate a Dominican consensus around the idea that it's real Independence Day, it's real national founding and myth, was freedom from Haiti, which occurred 22 years later in 1844. The Haitian unification of the island from 1822 to 1844 was possible for a variety of reasons, including that Haiti freed enslaved people in the region then known as Spanish Haiti. And thus, it won the widespread support of black Dominicans, even as the burden of France's demand for money reparations for its lost colonial investment in Haiti forced the young nation to impose onerous taxes on the Criollo landlords landowners. But high taxes was not as great a story as raped virgins, and so the founding national myth of the Dominican Republic was produced through a narrative of gender, in which the former Spanish colony took its leave of a cruel and inhumanly vicious Haitian occupation made possible by the disloyalty of black Dominicans, who were thus symbolically cast out of national identity. Lurcia Garcia Pena also tells us another story about gender, that the visual and written record of Papa Liborio's life and eventual murder at the hands of the US Marines underscores his strength and masculinity, threatening rebellion against this alliance of Hispanophile elites and the US occupying force. This profoundly subversive narrative of black rebellion is reenacted perpetually as the spirit of Papa Liborio continues to mount or possess his devotees in Afro-Dominican religious ceremonies. The occupation also brought us another ugly gendered legacy, rape and other kinds of sexual violence by US soldiers, also sex work, and as in Puerto Rico, the association of women who did sex work with venereal disease, understanding them as carriers and US soldiers as innocents victimized by them. Even as United States historians have made the occupation of the DR a footnote, these kinds of stories appear again and again in the work of Dominican novelists and Dominican, other Dominican writers. Lorcia Garcia Pena and the borders of Dominicanidad also insist that we understand the centrality of US political, economic, and military expansion in Hispaniola to the, predict to the production of Latino, Latina, Latinx and as a US racial category. As we all know, Latin America and the United States share a common new world history. 
a place where indigenous African and European peoples met each other, and that the legacy of those encounters, their violence, their sexual assault, their commercial and other relations of inequality, their love and mingling is represented in all of our bodies. That is, those we consider more or less white or native or black are spread across the Americas. So how exactly did we come to understand the mestizo as a racial type that we equate with Latinx in the United States? The answer, of course, runs through Mexico and the rest of Latin America, in part through the writing and national, nation formation work of criollos throughout the region. As Dora Summers taught us to think through the genre of the national romance, and Lurcia Garcia Pena rightly reminds us. But how was mestizaje instantiated in the United States as a racial formation accompanied by the force of anti-blackness? This, too, Borders of Dominicanidad tells us, must be understood in relationship to the Dominican Republic, the location of Afro-Dominicans, or better, Africanness, as outside the Dominican Republic, that the, locations of blackness, that the location of blackness is really Haiti, is really outside of Latinidad. Lurja points us, for example, to the 1937 mass murder, the slaughter of 20,000 ethnic Haitians, and members of the border population, the Reanos, under Trujillo with mach machetes and knives by his military, organized and professionalized by the U.S. Marines. Bordering Dominicanidad points to the frequency with which the U.S. historiography of this event characterizes it simply as an anti-Haitian campaign and one of the most important events in the history of Dominican-Haitian relations. But it was a slaughter of the Dominican Republic's own people, not Haitians. Or more recently, after the earthquake, the holding up of an image of Sonia Marmalejos, figured as a Dominican woman volunteering to nurse Haitian babies in the Dario Contreras Hospital in Santo Domingo, as a sentimental way of understanding the newly opened border between the two nations, the palpable easing of tensions and the easing of anti-Haitian sentiment, the material aid provided by the Dominican Republic. But in figuring her as a remarkable person doing an almost unthinkably generous thing, the national and international press managed to forget that Marmalejos was another Rayano, another member of a mixed, mobile, transnational border population engaged in a commonplace sharing of ca the caring labor of nursing each other's babies. Without taking anything away from Marmalejos' compassion and kindness, it's possible to notice that exceptionalizing this mundane act of mutual aid contributed to insisting on the absolute difference of Dominicans and Haitians. Through these and many other narratives, Lerge Garcia Pena shows us again and again, blackness is located outside of and away from Dominicanness, away from Latinidad. Critical ethnic studies has taken care to denaturalize de national borders rather than taking them for granted as nat natural features of land and politics. We know them to be the products of wars and other acts of violence that, for example, as Gloria Anzaldúa said, the United States drew a line through the middle of Latin America in 1848 following the Rio Grande Rio Grande, Rio Grande, to produce the land to the north of it as the United States and the river and other natural and unnatural features as its own southwestern border, drawing it through indigenous communities, through cities and towns. This border has been enforced with violence by Texas Rangers, as Monica Mar Munoz Martinez underscores, by La Migra and ICE, as Kelly Little Hernandez points out, with the racial and sexual violence of anti-indigenous sentiment, as Josie Saldana, Nicole Guidati Hernandez, and Evelyn Hudehart point out. As the Army Corps of Engineers begins to cut down the trees and rip up sanctuaries for migrating monarch butterflies in preparation for a border wall where there is not currently one, 
we are reminded again that bordering is always a verb, something done to lands and peoples and stories actively and persistently. This is also Lurcia Garcia Pena's reminder to us. The other thing this, this book does is to insist that not only are borders historical and political and literary, the borders the US produces are not just in the southwest of its own landmass. Even as there's a veritable explosion of exciting new work on US empire from Jody Kim and Lisa Lowe, from Manu Kar Karuka and Nick Estes, from Jay Kahulani Ka Ka Kawanu I and Dean Saranillo, Yaramar Bonilla and Marisol Lebron, to name just a few, the Dominican Republic still remains a footnote, only an occasional focus, in a way that Lorcia Garcia Pena insists is not sustainable. We need to see the work the DR and its bordering are doing, and they're doing it behind the scenes if we neglect to foreground them in producing anti-blackness and anti-immigrant politics. Above all, Lorcia Garcia Pena reminds us there is a border running through Latinidad that puts blackness outside it. This book has been tremendously helpful as I, to me as I was writing a book that I've been working on because I was trying to articulate the role of the US military, US military in political incursion in Central America, including the kidnapping of children on a much broader scale than anything happened that happened in the better known case of Argentina and what it had to do with the taking of children at the US border 40 years later. Not nothing, obviously, but what? Lorcia Garcia Pena helped me articulate the ways that US imperialism had produced Central American children as fundamentally alienable from their parents, that Central American indigenous people were produced as not eligible for refugee status even as they came in overland caravans of religious pilgrimage, most recently attacked by Mexican police in Chiapas as part of the Obama and now Trump administration's Plan Frontera Sur. Lorcia Garcia Pena helps free us from the expectation that things happening in surprising places and other places, whether it's the aftermath of the drug, Mexican drug wars or US American gun running by government and private individuals, or the work of NGOs and the World Bank in weakening the Guatemalan, Salvadoran, and Honduran states that are producing cartel violence and their control of policing and government cannot be understood except in relationship to US empire. She also liberated me from feeling like pro proximity and linear time had to be the measure of connection. Garcia Pena argues that things that happened 100 and 200 years ago can produce stories and violence in the present. This may not be a new thought, but it moves the conversation forward, at least for me. The racism and xenophobia of this moment, the glorification of sexual violence, the celebration of a truly ugly masculinity through police that shoot even black children, or presidents who don't just fire female ambassadors but allow them to be stalked and urge others to take them out is terrifying and revolting. And make no mistake, the decision to deny tenure to a gifted and brilliant scholar like Lorcia Garcia Pena is of a piece with this ugliness. But this conference signals our refusal of this violence, misogyny, racism, and xenophobia. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all so much. Um, we have um, ample time for questions, so please just raise your hand and I'll um, come by with the mic.
And you don't have to give a question uh, if you don't want. You can also provide commentary or reflection as well. So. Yeah, I think all hard questions should have been submitted in writing two weeks in advance. <laughs> That's right. I'm struck that so many of you talked or, or, or about um, gender and sexuality. And I'm wondering what kind of strategic or academic alliances you see um, between people who work in ethnic studies and people who work in gender and sexuality to, if not prevent, to at least try to dissuade these kind of situations in the future? All right. Um, I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, anything worth doing can be done badly. <laughs> and uh, it's very, we're not yet the people we need to be to build an emancipatory future. And that means that we uh, have been shaped to think in certain ways that we're only beginning to destabilize. It's the kind of ethnic studies we've been describing to you came about precisely because of a critique of both feminism and ethnic studies from women of color and queer scholars and activists. And it, it was not only a demand for uh, 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 anti-racism that was also feminist and a feminism that was also anti-racist, uh, a feminism that was not heteronormative. It was also calling into question the single axis approaches and essentialized understandings of identity. But that doesn't mean that under certain circumstances, single axis approaches and identities don't matter a lot because under particular conditions, they could be. Uh, driving while black affects black people. Domestic violence is a different kind of issue. Um, and so I think the, uh, uh, the, the attempts that we see in the scholars that we've mentioned, they're both the most fervent defenders and the most ardent critics of all of the identity studies, of uh, feminist studies, of ethnic studies. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it, it, you know, I've been in this long enough to, to appreciate the way in which we've been educated to think of gender and sexuality as structures of power uh, and not just Im incidental embodiments of, of individuals. And yet, uh, this is easier to proclaim than to practice. And I think that a relentless internal criticism is necessary to think about who's being left out of any particular um, mobilization. And I think this is the, the, the way I interpret this um, uh, when uh, somebody like Archbishop Oscar Romero talks about accompaniment, uh, he talks about what he calls the preferential option for the poor. And in Spanish, option is more like commitment than, than like a choice on a menu. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean under all circumstances uh, you put the poor first because the poor might also uh, be oppressive to non-normative people who are perceived to have non-normative sexualities. So I think the question then becomes how do you um, have a unity without uniformity? How do you have mobilization that doesn't require um, uh, living within existing categories, but still knowing that those categories um, uh, distribute rewards and punishments in ways that people can't avoid. So my own perception on this is that uh, I, I work with the African American Policy Forum. Uh, our project is to say that there should be no um, anti-racism that is not feminism, there should be no feminism that is anti-racist, but in practice, um, this is um, much more difficult to carry out. And so I think we need uh, capacities for self-criticism and for organizational learning uh, and seeing uh, what happens when we try to put these things into practice. Perhaps a good example of some of what you're talking about is the debate around Latinx and the resistance in our own community, some people in our own community to uh, 
um, mobilize around that kind of uh, challenge to what we already think is progressive and uh, cutting edge. But it's, all, um, it's been a great reminder of who's, who we're leaving out and who doesn't feel like their stories are being told. And that's the value of it is that it causes us, causes us to think and to challenge ourselves to look at uh, the projects that we engage in and the voices that are still um, it, uh, missing from that discussion. One of, the, one of the things I've been trying to think about since I heard that Lord Chagat denied tenure on Thanksgiving um, is what enabled that? What were, what, so it's not that she didn't do the work, it's not that she didn't do the work incredibly well. Um, it was, so what, right? And one of the reasons is precisely that Lurcia lives at that crossroads of critical ethnic studies and gender studies, or um, women, gender, and sexuality studies. And part of the reason that I decided to produce a reading of the book in this space is because it seems to me like the book couldn't get heard. And the conditions that produced the book not getting heard were precisely the incomprehensibility of this, of this crossroads, among other things. Anti-blackness, anti-immigrant anti xenophobia, and misogyny. Um, living together, occupying this space together, are what produced this silencing and this tenure denial. Although it's important to recognize that the book has been heard. It's been, yes. got, it got prizes from a number of uh, different organizations. It's who's not listening right. is the problem. Who Thank can't you. hear? Yes. Hello, um, I was uh, one of the participants in some of the conversations online uh, triggered by the, by the personnel decision that served as inspiration for this event. And I remember uh, reactions such as, well, uh, here's a, once more an ivy behaving like an ivy, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so that caused me, at first it, was, it seemed like funny and smart, but then I got to thinking, I actually don't understand that. You know, and, and so um, when I look at some of these ivies, including probably centrally uh, Harvard, you find uh, professors who are rather prestigious, <laughs> but when you look at their text, they're kind of 19th century, you know, uh, you know, in terms of their understanding of social relations. Uh, I mean, defenses, outright defenses of colonialism, you know? And, um, and that's somehow, uh, the fact that Harbor harbors a kind of a den of, uh, you know, backwards uh, scholarship, uh, does not tarnish the reputation of the institution. And, and so I said, I, I don't understand how that happens. Uh, when uh, at a college uh, in CUNY, somebody gets, uh, say, tenure, who has not published the uh, expected number of books, yeah? um, the, that, actually, that actually is, uh, can become an article in the New York Post uh, that then uh, serves as occasion for um, exposing the decline of, of, of university institution in, uh, university education in CUNY. Yeah? But, the same, but when the same occurs, but, but more uh, extravagantly, at a place like Harvard, when you see people you know, in, in books that sell well denying that there is such a thing as, uh, as uh, a special kind of police brutality against 
African American and brown bodies, yeah, that that that, 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 that is really not true, right? There is a, such a book published by a respected uh, scholar at Harvard, right, that claims that. And that somehow doesn't lead to the discredit of the individual, nor the discredit of Harvard. Can, and so, do you have any insights? <laughs> I think that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> Any of us. I think we should answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't speak for uh, the internal dynamics of, of Harvard. I'm in a far different kind of site in my, my academic life. I will say that for both well-intentioned and ill-intentioned intellectuals, separation from the lives of the people is a deadly disease. And the intellectuals who manage to do the good work Ida B. Wells, uh, Walter Rodney, are those that are also feel the pulse of the people and draw their research questions from humble, friendly, mm. and reciprocal dialogue with the eyewitnesses to um, the predations of power. I think what happens at Harvard, but happens everywhere, is that intellectuals get rewarded, including me, for producing more eloquent or more indignant descriptions of other people's suffering with no recommendation that we be involved in combating that suffering or really learning from it where those ideas need to be vetted. And that is on the pavement, our feet on the ground, with the people um, who experience this and need to analyze it in order to survive, not just to get a promotion or to get cited somewhere. And we all grapple, I think, with the horrible class, race, caste segregation of this society. Look, look at where our institutions are, look at who's allowed onto them, look at how condescending paternalistic our outreach um, efforts are, which are often a kind of poverty tourism and condescending middling in the lives of other people. But I do think that there are scholars who, for many of who are in this room, who are among some of the some at Harvard, you know, who who I respect more than any as much as anybody on earth, who have been able uh, to do this, but I think it also requires a culture among us to actually value that uh, and to consider it as worthy as the rewards, both psychic and material, that the system provides. Kalama Ya Salam, the Ninth Ward poet, filmmaker, teacher says that the love of the people is more valuable than any prize the oppressor can offer. Um, it's a nice statement. Living it in the contradictions of middle class life and administration and gatekeeping, which we, we all are in an institution like this, again, is, is, is more difficult. But I think it points the way toward a practice. Uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez's second book, City of Inmates, turns over the last 50 pages of the book to what she calls the Rebel Archive, mm. direct testimony by people uh, combating uh, police brutality, mass incarceration. She starts that book with an archival analysis of indigenous dispossession as the root of um, policing in LA. And so she creates a meeting in that book that doesn't meet anywhere in the society, but it's a wonderful you know, intervention. And I think that there are so many examples like that that we can point toward. But I think um, the nature of this job is we careen from lacerating self-doubt to overweening self-preoccupation bordering on clinical narcissism. <laughs> and as an individual, you can't solve that. But as a community, we might be able to create incentives for people uh, to live a different, and I would argue, a healthier life. I appreciate George's ever, always willingness to sort of question ourselves and put ourselves in the middle of 
sort of the crisis and the question of, um, of what are we doing here and how do we serve social justice? And it's not simple. But you know what? Not all of us decide to write that there's no police violence, no particular police violence against brown and black people. There, it, there's a particular badness that happens at Harvard and a few other places that's about, um, that's about proximity to power, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was a Warren Fellow, well, this was a super long time ago, it was during the Clinton administration, I suddenly realized that this was the Clinton administration <laughs> north. <laughs> and the, the BS that was coming down about um, welfare reform and just getting men to support their families, like that wasn't gonna, like people weren't already broke and that um, creating orders um, to support their children was just gonna put people in jail. Like, that was coming here, from here. Um, the, um, so, I, without in any way disrespecting my um, many colleagues who do outstanding work here, um, there are, there are a way, there's a way that private universities, big private universities, prestigious private universities, the ones that are gonna survive this um, economic shock that is shaking higher ed um, are not progressive liberating places, right? They are, um, they are places that absolutely produce the knowledge that serves power. Yeah. I'll just say uh, thank you for your question, Professor. And it's one that, as a graduate student, I think about like basically every day being mm -hmm. here, and I, I never can find an answer to. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think those logics about how that works that also works at the level of the graduate students, and even how departments are prioritized here. Um, so I'm in American Studies, which has a lot of internal problems, but also is probably doing some of the more innovative work here, right? But we're also the ones that are, we as a program are like, high, like systematic, systematically undervalued in comparison to quote unquote like traditional departments, right? So I, I think a lot of like, what I, what I see is like a lot of the work and labor amongst those of us who choose to come here and, and decide to stay here. So I guess that's sort of heartening, but it, it is, yeah, I. I, I don't really have, I wish I had answers, but I don't. I, I think I just am grateful for the people who come here who like, you know, don't, I, I, I guess are really critical. I mean, that's the reason I came here, right? It wasn't so much like, oh, like this place is amazing. Like I knew it was an amazing place, but I met people here who like in my cohort, like my, you know, people I, I saw who thought critically, like who didn't like take the, the, like, the bullshit of this place, right? And who were really like, yeah, like we're, we're aware of what this place is, and we're also going to try to do some work at the same time. And I think that promise, like, is still there. Like, you know, it, it ebbs and flows in terms of, like, you know, on the day to day. But I think those are like those small fleeting moments, right? Those ephemeral moments are the ones that I think can, you know, do that work. But I, I recognize that it is sort of fighting against a systemic structure in which, like, certain modes of knowledge and, and scholarship are, are prioritized. And it's, it's like really, fresh. I mean, just to be honest, it's like very frustrating and something that I'm still trying to work through. Mm -hmm. And while we're focusing on the Ivy Leagues, we don't, want to, we don't want to forget that it's a problem that is pervasive across all universities and that we see now even um, worse with um, the fact that our, the graduate students can't find jobs anymore. There are fewer and fewer faculty positions everywhere and the people who are um, lining the adjunct faculty um, core are primarily African Americans, Latinos, women. And so once again, it, it's not just an issue of the Ivy Leagues, but it's much wider than that. Um, I wanted to start with, um, I've had a lot of thoughts listening, and of course now they're fleeing my mind. Um, but I think talking about coalition building is really, really, really important. And I think part of that, I keep thinking of Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition. Mm -hmm. To me, that's something as imperfect as it may have been, could be a model to revive in this election. And I think in an institution, what's necessary, or because we're talking about institutions, 
and it goes back to the question of what about WGS and other departments coming together or faculty or students in those departments. I think there needs to be an understanding of the way fields develop so that things that look passe now have to be recognized as being radical at the time. And because there's a lot of criticism of movements 50 years ago or 60 years ago, that's valid, but it doesn't serve anybody to throw away your allies or to criticize them so much and look for perfection is the word I was looking for uh, in people's past ways of thinking. People develop over time, fields develop over time. So I would encourage that kind of thinking. And I think when we make these coalitions across departments, there are a lot of similar sufferings that have gone on, including this idea of fewer tenured faculty or tenure track faculty, and a lot of teaching done by people who, for various reasons, didn't make the right moment or cut or something. And the people who can speak up, I think, need to speak up. The people who are less precarious. Mm. So that, there you go. And the other funny thing that I now remember is that maybe Harvard was trying to keep up with Yale. <laughs> um, they worry about the endowment. That's the main comparison. So there you go. Yeah, if I could, um, that just reminds me of uh, the other night on PBS, you might have watched the, the, uh, the new documentary about the, uh, the first Rainbow Coalition in the 60s in Chicago, coming together of the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, the Appalachian Whites, and uh, what an uh, inspiring moment for uh, coalition building and to think about the possibilities of, co of working together even though we're segregated and marginalized. So it was inspiring to see the power of it and then to see also the repression because of how dangerous it is when people of color come together and marginalized groups come together. That's exactly when the, um, the forces of um, imperialism and um, the U.S. is going to come down because that's scary and that is powerful. And I think that the work that Loria produces really shows that. And, and perhaps that's why it's so dangerous. I have a question about structures. And I'll first ask my question and then state some context for it. My question, in your experiences, what sort of administrative structures best support inter and multi, multidisciplinary work, or at the most simplistic level, department versus committee? Mm -hmm. Your answer might be positive, what works well in your experience. Your answer might be negative, what doesn't work in your experience. <laughs> um, my perspective is as an administrator. Yeah, I've been sitting back there doing my neoliberal work preparing a overdue budget submission for American Studies uh, while you were giving your talks. So you might have already answered the question. I did hear Lourdes Torres speak about departments, programs, and committees within which ethnic studies scholars do their work. And I do understand that you do your work not just in departments and committees within specific colleges and universities, you do your work within the concept called the field and in professional associations and in journals. Here at Harvard, where Lorja was denied tenure, we have no ethnic studies degree, undergraduate or graduate. We have a coordinating curricular committee in ethnicity, migration, and rights, which hosts what we call a secondary field. Everybody else would call it a minor. <laughs> we have an ethnic studies subfield within the history and literature major, undergraduate only, a committee. We have an American studies degree, doctoral only. We have African and African American studies, which I think it was 10 or 15 years ago only, uh, went from undergrad to including a doctoral degree. We have been gender sexualities, sexuality, a committee only recently with their own lines. Against the wishes of senior administration and potentially working against our own individual professional futures, I and other administrators have been trying to imagine what sort of institutional structure might be provided at Harvard for critical ethnic studies, for transnational American studies, for ethnicity, race, and migration. Oops, down arrow, sorry. Um, 
I do feel that part of the problem that has brought us here today is an administrative problem. Maybe that's self-interested, I don't know. <laughs> Potentially the lack of a proper tenure home for Laura Jo. So I would be interested to know, here publicly or offline, what administrative structures best support inter- and multidisciplinary work? I, if I could start, I, I mean, I think it, it varies and each department is different. The politics are different in different places, so it's hard to give one general response. Um, but I, I'll talk about my own situation in, in, in Chicago. And um, I was part of a, a first a concentration, which then be, after 10 years became a program. And uh, 10 years ago, we became a department. And um, what it means when you become a department is tenure lines. So that is essential. And uh, budget. We got more money and we had tenure lines. So that is absolutely significant. And yes, when you can make those tenure decisions and the, the hiring decisions yourself, that's a game changer. So I watched the fight at Yale very closely, as I'm sure you all did, and their argument that in the absence of a department of, or a department-like structure for race, ethnicity, and migration, people like Albert Laguna were never going to have their work recognized. Um, I, myself, I've been all over the map on this question. Um, because I think that, um, you know, faculty that are unpro unprotected by a department that can carry their case. Okay, I've been a department chair. I know about budgets. I know your problem. Um, have nobody to stand up for them. And I think that's very real. And I think that departments also organize intellectual work in a certain way. Um, that said, departments also commit mm -hmm. tremendous violence against individuals. Mm -hmm. And ev for everybody who has been, had a tenure case turned back at the dean and other senior faculty level, um, somebody else has gotten screwed at their own department level. Mm -hmm. and to you know, that's quite devastating to a case and to an individual. So I don't think that there's a single clear answer to this question. I do think that the thing that departmentalization has meant for, um, for the places I've been part of, women, gender, sexuality studies departments, departments hold a space. They have a significance in a university. And they enable work to be, certain kinds of work to be carried forward. They are a far more substantial um, counterweight to silencing than, um, than a committee. Um, that said, they do their own work of silencing. Uh, I was wondering how us as undergraduates can put more um, pressure on, an on the administration to give us an ethnic studies department. You know, last semester, performing Latinidad, and correct me if I'm wrong, profe, um, we were given a room for less than 20 people, and we ended up enrolling over 70, 75 students. Um, and we've done protest after protest, after sit-in, after teach-in. Um, how do we continue to show this administration that they can't keep using our faces and numbers and admissions pamphlets without providing us students of color a department that both teaches our histories but also by professors, by professors that share our identities? I think you have to keep doing the work that you're doing and coming up with radical new ways to protest and to get in the face of the administration and that you'll come up with, with better uh, strategies than I think I can. <laughs> I think the administration is counting on the fact that you all are going to stop. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, you know, the semester ended, everybody went home, it's all good now. Um, and it seems to me that persistence in the, law, in the face of this kind of administrative violence is the thing that they can't imagine and can't countenance. And I think that the longer you keep the struggle alive, let me say this, you may not win a reversal of this tenured decision. But it very much matters for the future of ethnic studies. It matters for how we tell this story in the future, as a historian, I have to say. And it matters for the next tenure case. You have to make this cost. Yeah, I think um, that the university assumes that it's fine and you want to feel better within it. Um, the challenge is to argue that the university is seriously deficient, not providing the education that is crucial to your survival and to everyone's survival. You know, the, uh, Christine Sleeter and Nolan Cabrera have done arguments showing that uh, ethnic studies courses are good for everybody. And they're good intellectually, they're not just um, pleasant social experiences. Sometimes they're wretchingly not good social experiences, but we profit from our disagreements. Those are evidence of problems unsolved. I think that um, while we would very much want to win and to carve away space, the, the whole ethnic studies project exists because campus and community people sat in and disrupted things yeah. and mm -hmm. compelled certain types of changes. But that also, at the very moment, large foundations funded ethnic studies programs so they could produce a comprador elite that could manage those populations on, on behalf of power. Doesn't mean that it was wrong to have ethnic studies departments or we don't appreciate the enormous ground that's been gained because of them and the ideas that they've had. But that wasn't, maybe this relates to Arthur's question, that wasn't a product of the structure, that was the product of what people did within it trying to, to push it. Laura's point, as Laura's points always are, is, is really important. You don't win every struggle, but you want to leave a record of what you really wanted, rather than trying to win a concession that has a kind of interest convergence that doesn't really serve your needs. And again, um, sitting down and having a discussion, not about what the institution can give you, but what you and other students need and what the community needs is a valuable thing whether you win or not. And that energy can go to other places. In Stokely Carmichael's Ready for the Revolution, he talks about how they lost every battle in student government at Howard because they had a very conservative administration at Howard. But the things they learned in those battles turned out to be tremendously important in organizing in rural Mississippi, even though it, they, most of them were not Southerners, were not rural people, but they had learned something in the struggle for power that they could then take on, even if they didn't win the immediate kind of victory. Uh, I'd also encourage you to take a look. Uh, summer of 2011, Connecticut Law Review has a piece by Kimberly Crenshaw about the fight here at Harvard uh, over the departure of Derrick Bell, the attempt to get a civil rights course, the attempt to get black faculty hired. And they didn't really win, but each stage taught them something new about what it was that they needed, and then they took those things to other places. So you, you very much want to change the institution that you're in and create institutional opportunities for people in the future. And every one of us on the panel has profited tremendously from what people won uh, from those situations. But you also, these institutions, you, know, you can't look for love from an institution that never said it was going to love you, that is a managerial, class-based, racist institution set up to administer the society in the way that it is. But you can carve away spaces of uncertainty within that that allow for a lot of improvisation. Um, thank you so much. Um, so something that really stood out to me um, was that you said that we come to vicariously represent our communities in the academy. Um, and so I'm a first year student. I just took Profe's class, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I had no idea just the sheer luck and privilege that I had 
last semester. Um, but I wanted to ask how you all grapple with uh, doing that vicarious representation, how you manage to stay in contact with the communities that you're representing, um, especially as someone who's entering this world of academia. Um, yes, yeah, staying um, connected um, at the Paul through service learning courses and through making sure that we try to get back that um, that connection that ethnic studies used to have with communities. I think more and more we're um, um, going back to that model. At least, uh, th and that seems to me such a, an important and vital part of our intellectual development and the development of our students is to always make that connection between the intellectual work we do and the actual communities we're always talking about. I remember that Jacqueline Lazu and others had mm -hmm. a 50th anniversary of the Young the Lords, Young, right. which was both a campus and community mm -hmm. event, which I think is a model of this kind of work. Yeah, we keep trying to do more and more of that, of um, not only um, bringing community folks to our campus, but also going outside and interacting and creating spaces and, and recognizing the intellectual um, power that we are all getting from our communities. One of the things that the increase, increasing technologization of knowledge and of our jobs means is that we're putting more and more hours into um, whatever job it is, whether it's being a student or being a faculty member, um, many other kinds of jobs as well. And something very bad happens as a result of this incessant busyness, and that is that we lose the time to be people, to be citizens, um, to be people who are scrapping for something different in our community. And it seems to me that figuring out how to put, um, how to put limits on the amount of time we're gonna give to our jobs and, in, and doing activism in that space um, that is left over is the only way to um, to make our work continue to be useful, relevant. Um, whatever kind of activism is accessible to us, it seems to me, is crucial to stay involved with. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think it's something I personally struggle with. I struggled when I was in college, I struggled when I was here. But I, I think it's really through like my my work, right? Like I, I do work that is grounded in my identity as a, as Latinx, right? Like I couldn't imagine doing work otherwise. I think I find it really unfulfilling and and boring. And which, what's the point, right? Um, so I I think I, I really try to see myself as like a storyteller. I, I'm really invested in telling stories of even my work is historical and whatever. But it's like stories that I want to be able to tell people who are not in this place, right? Like I really, you know, I tell these stories to like my family, the places where I come from. So I, I really try my writing and the things I do not to get it to be so obtuse where I can't do that, right? Um, that I really try to think about histories that are grounded, oriented by the subjects I talk about and I'm not directed at them. Um, but it's not, and like still staying connected and, and different communities, not just like home community because home can mean different things for different people, right? Um, but I will, it is like a, a, a never ending, it's always a give and take, right? Like I'm always rethinking and checking in with myself about what I'm doing, because um, I think it is, especially when I first started, it was like so easy just to want to assimilate and just to fit in and, you know, but I think that was just too easy. I don't know, it, it's hard, it, it's harder work, but I think it's necessary work. Yeah. I also think there are forms of expertise that are developed at these institutions that are recognizable in society in ways that are valuable. When we have fair housing cases, it's very valuable to have an expert witness come in and say what a particular mm -hmm. policy does to children, what it does to people of color, what it does to people who are, are houseless. Uh, Rosalinda Fragoso is both a scholar at, um, at UC Santa Cruz, but she also testifies at human rights tribunals in Mexico about fem feminicide and uh, other uh, the acts of impunity and immunity that um, a whole variety of institutions are involved in. There are places where um, the most conservative parts of my life uh, are valuable, things that are 
not important in the university, but particular findings that I can deliver to a group mm -hmm. that have a strategic value in winning space for certain things to happen. It was tremendously important during um, legal campaigns relating to affirmative action to have psychologists and to have people with quantified skills talk about the ways in which certain techniques didn't announce racist intent but had racist effects. These are things that we have a privilege to learn and sometimes feel embarrassed by that privilege, have a romantic view of ourself as somebody who's not part of that institution, and yet in doing that, we deny skills to a community that can be very valuable. So we have time for one quick question, because we, we're going to be breaking in about four minutes. So I'm going to ask that the answer to the question be a little on the short end. Uh, we, we will answer this question in the form of a haiku. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I want to go back to the question that Dr. Torres Ayan made at the beginning, because it seems to be recurring in the conversation, and that is, how do we make these institutions pay so that the next tenure case doesn't go this way, so that the next graduate student is not ostracized, so that the next generation of undergraduate students has access to a kind of critical race and queer and sexuality studies, right? And that obviously this is more of something for us to continue thinking about, but how do we use process against the institution? Right? Is it a place, is Harvard or other institutions a place where with 500 signatures you can get anything in front of a faculty senate, as it is at Stanford, and which undergraduates used there successfully in the early 2000s? But also, is it how do we, how, and ask questions is how does anonymity and confidentiality of the tenure process perpetuate yes. these problems? Mm -hmm. What are the roles of unions, faculty unions, in addressing mm -hmm. these issues? And really thinking outside <laughs> the parameters that have been established for us. How might community partnerships facilitate making structural changes in the academy so that we juxtapose our fights at individual institutions to the academy at large, that we ally ourselves with community colleges, that we ally ourselves with local high schools and local communities and think about what will work because the university as an institution has gotten very good at waiting out strikes right, including hunger strikes, as happened at Stanford in the early, in the 90s, right, where they let students stay on a hunger strike and then made the directors of the ethnic centers pay for that, right, for almost a decade, right, by stripping El Centro Chicano at Stanford of funding at every moment that they could, right? So that how do we think beyond the universities boundaries so that we can stop this before it happens because you're, we all, so many of us here wrote uh, Albert's letter, right, just last year and we wrote a letter on behalf of Lorja and we've written letters on behalf of our colleagues at other institutions. Thank you. Uh, th this requires uh, me to leave the haiku <laughs> realm and, and start with an epic. Um, <laughs> But I, I think what you've given us is not something any of us can answer, but it's a, a credible agenda yeah. for the next step. And no one of us has the optic on power to know how to answer those questions, but everything you raise, punto, 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 is crucial to the fight we want to have. And people will learn through struggle which ones work, which one don't. One size doesn't fit all. But what you've laid out is an agenda that lays bare things that have been very mystified. Okay, well, please give our panel a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. I also wanted to say that, that our, our VIP is, in fact, in the space with us. So please give an enormous round of applause for Professor Garcia Pena.
And uh, real quick, please, um, we're, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, if you can please be back here by about 12.55, because it always takes a little bit of time for us to get settled. Uh, and you know, we'll have the whole rest of the day. So uh, please enjoy. Lunch is provided, right? Yes, lunch is, lunch is included. So have fun with the catering.
We're going to get started. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with uh, the second panel of the day, and I'll turn it over to Denise Kaur, who will open uh, Dominicanidad's Diasporic Reverber Rever Reverberations. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a quick announcement before we get started. Um, I'd like to invite you all to a teach-in that is happening uh, afterwards um, called Nothing Has Been Done. Um, it uh, will take place at six, from 6 to 7.30 at Tickner Lounge uh, later today. So uh, if you can, please um, come and join um, the teach-in. So it's my um, honor today to introduce um, our distinguished uh, speakers um, uh, for uh, the second panel, uh, uh, Dominicanidad's uh, Diasporic Reverberations. Our first uh, speaker is... Uh, Silvio Torres Sayant, who is Professor of English and Dean's Professor of the Humanities at Syracuse University, um, where he holds the post of William P. Tolley Distinguished Teaching Professor in the Humanities. Uh, he is Chair of the Humanities Council and Director of the Latino and Latin American Studies Program. He's also the founding member of CUNY Dominican Studies Institute um, and the author of many books, including uh, the ones in Future Muse, The Poetry and Poetics, Arena um, Espalat, and um, Caribbean Poetics Toward an Aesthetic of West Indian Literature, to name a few. Um, our second uh, uh, speaker is um, Ginetta uh, Candelario, who teaches at Smith College, where she is professor of sociology as well as faculty affiliate, affiliate of the Latin American and Latino Studies Program, the Study of Women and Gender uh, Studies Program, and the Community Engagement and Social Change Concentration. Uh, she's the current editor of Meridians. Um, her, um, she's published uh, Black Behind the Ears, Dominican Racial Identity from Museums to Beauty Shops. And she's currently working on a book um, titled Voices Echoing Beyond the Seas, Dominican Feminisms from Transatlantic to Transnational. She's also the founding vice president of the uh, Lat uh, Latino Studies Association. And finally, our Third speaker is Elizabeth Manley, who is Kellogg Endowed Associate Professor of History at Xavier University of Louisiana. Um, she's the author of The Paradox of Paternalism, Women and Authoritarian, Authoritarian Politics in the Dominican Republic, um, and uh, is also co-chair of the Haitian Dominican Republic section of the Latin American Studies Association. Please uh, welcome, um, join me in welcoming our speakers. Good afternoon. I was uh, in the middle of writing my paper when they told me it was my turn. <clears throat> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, that sort of thing happens if you stay in this business for long. Yeah? Um, so I will begin where one must begin, which is at the gratitude. I would like to uh, begin by expressing gratitude uh, to the conveners of this important occasion for gathering the impressive lineup of speakers who make up the program and for making me part of this meditation on the contributions of Professor Loja Garcia Pena to the advancement of knowledge in the various fields represented in her scholarly portfolio. I'm grateful to the Warren Center, direct, to Warren Center Director Walter Johnson, Administrator Arthur Patton Hawk, uh, in addition for a, the latest service he rendered uh, some 20 minutes ago. Um, 
Uh, to um, uh, Monique Mac McCall, um, the coordinator and assistant, uh, staff assistant, Sayad Saman, whom I haven't met yet. Um, very special thanks uh, to Professor, to uh, Warren Center Fellow, Nicole Guidote Hernandez, uh, who is um, a, an esteemed colleague from uh, Emory University, whom you are now lucky to have with you for, I think, one more year or semester. Um, um, I have, um, I come to the Harvard University campus with a feeling that differs appreciably from the other times where I've been here before. I've experienced this visit with a heightened awareness of myself as someone coming from a stark elsewhere, as someone hailing from a very distinct region of otherness. The mood accompanying my visit this time has hearkened back uh, the ghost of a compatriot from an early generation who spent academic year 1940, 1941 here, holding the prestigious Charles Eliot Norton visiting professorship. I'm referring to uh, Pedro Enriquez Ureña, a Dominican man of letters who at the time enjoyed great renown as a towering literary uh, figure, uh, as a scholar and cultural historian of letters and culture in general. In his work, he had effectively taken on the advocacy of the intellectual traditions that Christian Europe, especially Spain, had brought to the Americas and had proved influential to a generation of scholars throughout the chemisphere with particular impact in academic circles of Mexico, Cuba, and Argentina. A native of the city of Santo Domingo and offspring of a family that had achieved distinction in politics, literature, and learning in general, Pedro had come to the United States for the first, for the first time in 1901, uh, shortly after completing his secondary education at home. Here, he pursued his advanced studies, uh, so to a large extent, he was at the level of, of higher education, at least, a product of the US Academy, where he secured his university de degrees before um, moving on to various Latin American capitals uh, to uh, exert his lasting influence. In his normal lecture for that year when he was here, uh, which would appear in print uh, under, the uh, under the title Literary Currents of Hispanic America in 1945, um, under the imprint of Harvard University Press, Pedro Enrique Sureña spoke as an advocate of the great tradition, and as such, he, he was received with admiration. The inside flap of the book cover <coughs> describes the work of this visiting professor thus. These lectures by a South American scholar mark a real milestone. I have often mused about the significance of the oversight at Harvard University Press, whose copy editors let that representation of Enriquez Ureña stand as a South American instead of a Dominican. Perhaps just as we are reminded by Edouard Glissant that the West is not a place but a project, South America is an idea conceived by hegemonic power that locates itself in the North and calls South that which is on the other side. And since the border shifted, in 1948, yeah? Uh, so what is now the Southwest, what is now the Southwest of the United States would have been the South. <laughs> but now, <laughs> but so, so there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of moving, right? The, the mobility of, 
of borders uh, and, and that sort of thing that, uh, that we know much about uh, these days. Um, so, and of course, it is only the few who manage to remember. I, I often have to remind my students uh, that Mexico is geographically in North America, uh, though the prevailing U.S. imaginary uh, locates it uh, in South America. One wonders if the copy editors at the press would have mistaken Enrique Sureña's, Enrique Sureña's nationality had he named his subjectivity blatantly as a Dominican, or if his scholarship had addressed the large-scale dehumanization perpetrated against the African side of his ancestry by the great intellectual tradition that, that, you know, that came in uh, subsequent to the conquest to sustain the colonial transaction. His Dominicanness would most likely have become perhaps too memorable. But then what is the likelihood um, that a self-asserting Dominican of African ancestry would have received an appointment as Charles Eliot Norton visiting scholar. Suffice it to mention, just so, so that you know what appointment we're talking about, um, that he was the first person from the Hispanic world to receive the appointment since the professorship was started in, in, in 1926, and that prior to Enrique Sureña, the raster of appointees included the likes of T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, and the composer I Igor Stravinsky, who held the post immediately before uh, Pedro. This visit to Harvard, uh, for me, has conjured another ghost from a still earlier past, that of the social justice writer and activist Lydia Maria Child, um, a native, she lived uh, throughout the 19th century, died in, 19, in 1880, a native of nearby Medford, uh, whose brother uh, studied at Harvard College and Seminary. Um, her 1833 anti-racist text, an appeal in favor of that class of Americans called citizens, earned her the ostracism of the New England intellectual elites. The reason uh, is that she spoke to the, the audience she imagined for the book was not the stereotypical Southern racist. She addressed the, the, uh, the humane, enlightened, liberal North. And there she exposed the dehumanization to which the structure of society subjected free blacks uh, at the time. And she made an ardent appeal uh, for, for art, for people, for people of her class and background and race and education to actually stop doing it. <laughs> and of course, um, she suffered the consequences, uh, a literary uh, career that was, and the rise uh, seceded, you know, it stopped, and so, so basically uh, survival issues uh, became, uh, became a problem. Now, in that book, she writes a preface that suggests that she knew what she was up against and that she was willing uh, to take the risk and accept the consequences, yeah? She says, uh, she declares her position, uh, a position about knowledge in relation to truth and justice. She says, the subject I have chosen admits of no encomiums on my country, yeah? So she, I cannot be a patriot if I'm going to speak about things that are unjust, yeah? Um, 
But as, as I generally make it an object to supply what is most needed, this circumstance is unimportant. The market is so glutted with flattery and self-celebration that a little truth may be acceptable were it only for its rarity. And so she proceeds and she deals with the consequences. I like the Lydia Maria Child story, um, sort of a, in conjunction with the visit of Pedro, uh, of Pedro Enriquez Ureña to Harvard, because I believe that it helps us locate uh, the choices that, that Lorja Garcia Peña makes in her career, yeah? So, so she goes to, um, in her career meaning, the whole package, not just what she does on the scholarly page for the journal, but also what she does in the classroom and outside of the classroom for her students, yeah? Uh, not only, but, but also the way she chooses the subjects that she's going to explore uh, with an eye on the effect, perhaps salutary effect, they may have a potential for having in uh, outside, outside of the text. So um, things that come to mind um, are things like she gets her first full time, you know, the first uh, tenure track. I'm sorry, did I press something? <laughs> should, I, should I move away from here? Okay. <laughs> I don't want to mess up somebody's presentation. Somebody spent a half, half hour getting it right. Okay, can, you, can, we, can we close this uh, or, or, I, so I that I don't mess up? So, is, there, is it okay to close it? How about that? There, that's good. That okay. way you don't touch it. Just don't touch it? Yeah. Okay. Good? Okay. Okay. So you know, you know what it means. You know what it means to uh, to get a your first uh, tenure track job, right? Uh, once uh, after completion of uh, of your PhD, right? It's a thing to uh, it's a thing to treasure, a thing to protect. And she's at the University of Georgia, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. And then she finds out that there are all these students who are completely eligible intellectually to, to receive education, but cannot receive it because the university's uh, governor has uh, issued an edict. I prefer those medieval terms. <laughs> you know, so, so you know, sometimes we, take, we do things up, presumably under modernity that are actually harsher and more primitive than the ones that we, that we used to do in earlier uh, you know, centuries. So, and she finds that this, uh, the students cannot, cannot come. And they're there, and they're smart. And some of them are undercover in, in the classroom, but they, maybe they cannot register for next, for next year. And so she comes up with, uh, with the, she, she meets up with, this, uh, with a team of scholars uh, who are equally concerned, and they come up with this uh, alternative university, right? Freedom University. And then they take it on themselves to provide all the necessary mentoring and service to, to, uh, to, to sort of uh, make sure that they get the courses. Uh, they, they, they will not be officially in, uh, you know, in the state, right? uh, but they are, create a net network of, of institutions across the country, mine being one of them. When I had a, um, uh, at, a at the time, um, we had a, um, Nancy Cantor, who was a progressive, uh, a progressive chancellor, I hope that my current chancellor uh, for the for the camera, I hope that <laughs> I hope that my current chancellor, I I trust, 
I trust that my current chancellor, had he been in this situation, were he presented with the same situation today, that he would also offer the necessary support. Well, the idea was that these, um, that, that these um, universities uh, pledged to accept the credits that these students uh, completed in this alternative uh, campus setting, yeah? Even though they obtained it illegally, right? Uh, it was legally, intellectually, but not so juridically, <laughs> right? Because they have everything. And I happen to be able to, uh, to, um, to, to attest to the fact that these were like very smart students. Uh, since my university received several of those students, I happened to have two of them in one of my classes, and they were top students. Uh, I remember be being very concerned about, about them, and uh, at one point when one of them um, got it into her head that she was going to travel back home uh, to meet with her, uh, with, her, with, her, with her boyfriend because her boyfriend couldn't come to see her, and I realized, wait a minute, you can't do that, because I had discovered that uh, Syracuse, Syracuse, the city of Syracuse, uh, uh, defines itself as a border city, yeah? uh, as a result of its proximity to, uh, to Canada. Yeah? And quite often, border patrol would be at the Greyhound station and at the Amtrak station. Yeah? And I said, oh, I said, oh no, you can't do that. Tell him to drop whatever he's, he, uh, try, you know, let him drop whatever he's doing and come to see you, or just skip loving each other for, for, for this period. But you cannot end up in jail. You cannot end up, you know, being taken and sent, because at the time I also had done some activism. And I knew what, what it was for, for people in detention. I was part of the, something called the Detention Task Force. And it meant that um, the uh, Border Patrol came, and they grabbed you, yeah? And they were not answerable to anybody as to what happened to you. Uh, typically, you'll be deported. Uh, you'll be deported to Mexico. But that's, uh, you know, Mexico is very large. There was, never, uh, there was never any concern as to what is the city that they originated from, yeah? Um, also, if you died in the process, there was no way, there was no accountability at all, right? So I said, no, stop that. Stop the love thing, yeah, okay? We can keep loving him, you can keep loving him later, yeah? So, so, so basically, the, the, this, is, this is the thing. And this is the work of, this is the, the, the way a, a young scholar, who's supposed to be uh, religiously protective of, of that first tenure track position, in defiance of, of university, yeah, does that, yeah? Um, and so to me, that says a lot, and, and it resonates with me, uh, because when I was at the City University of New York, I was also an assistant professor with no tenure, yeah? And when colleagues like Ramon Hernandez, uh, or, you know, came up with the idea uh, of creating a Dominican Studies unit that would produce data uh, about the Dominican experience, uh, because uh, Dominicans were the largest growing, uh, it was already, hugely large, yeah? And it kept being the largest, the fastest growing, uh, you know, a foreign-born immigrant population in the city. And yet there was no, no resources uh, for, for people, for teachers in the, in the public schools or even the university uh, uh, in CUNY to actually, um, you know, help these students uh, create courses that would teach them about uh, where they came from and that sort of thing, yeah? I have, Oh, I, I, I still have 20 minutes. You show me 20 minutes. Oh. So, so I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Was that only 20 minutes? Do, do, I, enjoy the, do I enjoy the stage that much? <laughs> No, so I, I want to share this because um, so the decisions are the, the decisions are not based the decisions that people like Loja and Lydia Maria Child make 
are not based on uh, with a with the career in mind. Yeah, they are made with what is needed. They are made on the basis of humane concerns. Yeah, and it is precisely and George. I think uh, you are uh, sort of insisting on that, that, that it is precisely the units that are committed to humane concerns that are the most un, uh, you know, uh, at the verge of disappearing uh, and are constantly threatened with disappearance, yeah? which, uh, which sort, of, uh, sort of makes us doubt about the claims to humanity that the university fraudulently makes. Yeah? And I'm talking about the university in capital U, for the, the university industry, yeah? Uh, so, um, so these are, these are uh, decisions that are made on the basis of what is good for my fellow human beings, as opposed to what is good for my, for my, the, my prosperity as I uh, climb up, uh, you know, in, in pursuit of the, the American dream. Um, I, I find it easy to, uh, to overlook uh, the corporate imaginary, the imagination of the corporations wish to instill in us, yeah? Because I remember when my mother, when my mother uh, told me things, or things that I should be and do, principles that I, ought, that I ought to abide by, all I remember her saying was that she, she wanted me to be a good man. Yeah? She never said I wanted to be Powerful. I want you to have, you know, an airplane. <laughs> no, it was a good man. So, I, frankly, I still want to be that. <laughs> you know? And uh, you know, and I make many of my choices on the basis of that. Am I being a good man today? And that's another thing. It, 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 is, not, it is not a commitment to a particular ideology. It's not a commitment to I am progressive, therefore I do right things, yeah? I've seen progressives do very horrible things, yeah? Uh, whether it's in the, at, a, at a search committee, whether it's in the, anywhere else, yeah? Because they think that since they are already made of the stuff of goodness, then the thing doesn't have to be practiced in actions, yeah? And so what I do is, uh, I'll find out at the end of the day, every day, if I was a decent human being or not. Yeah? And so, with that, I just want to close with one thing. I promise you I'll do no more enjoyment of stage thing. Yeah? <laughs> I want to tell you this. Um, so, in the, uh, when, when I served uh, as, as, the, uh, as the original coordinator of the uh, Dominican Studies Institute, uh, I found that we had to do, everything, everything we had to do was stuff that was needed. We didn't have the luxury of, of doing, you know, uh, the metaphors of the left hand in the poetry, uh, you know, in, in the poetry of uh, Manuel del Cabral, you know. We had to do stuff, you know, information, data. We had to, we had to do things like, no, it is not true that all Dominicans are negrophobic, yeah? Uh, no, it is not true that all women, that Dominican women learned uh, feminism from their co contact of, uh, with the United States upon arrival, in the, uh, uh, upon, uh, upon contact with, uh, with uh, you know, American feminism, work that uh, uh, Professor Hernandez took on uh, quite early, right? We had to do stuff, stuff like that. We had to do stuff like... Yes, it is possible for, for a country with a majority of, of, of people of African descent to have negrophobia. Yes. And every other country uh, with, uh, which has been uh, the result of, that has been influenced or, or has been targeted by colonialism, yeah, by the colonial transaction, will have, will have negrophobia, yeah? You have negrophobia in Haiti, something that Professor uh, Henry Louis Gates uh, did not wish to tackle when, uh, when we worked with him, um, uh, when I worked with him when that program, uh, Black in, um, Black in uh, Latin America, and I suggested, and I suggested that perhaps, uh, that perhaps, 
we want to look at uh, something like Haiti, because he drives the very sharp, right, dichotomy. Dominicans, they look to Spain. Haitians, they look to, uh, they look to Africa, yeah? And then I read from Brenda, from Brenda Plummer about all the Europeans who came to Haiti with nothing in their pockets. As my mother would say, una mano adelante y otra atrás. <laughs> what? The two hands just to cover their nakedness. Right? <laughs> and they will become somebody instantly by making themselves um, uh, available uh, as husbands uh, to uh, women, to, to Haitian women of the upper classes. Yeah? Um, not only would they become empowered, they would also become citizens uh, and uh, they would have portions of the wealth of the family, and they would also become mediators between Haiti and their, their country of origin, and they would uh, instigate commerce deals that would benefit their countries of origin, you know, which was another way of plundering Haiti. Uh, one way of plundering Haiti uh, was also had to do with the zipper, yeah? Uh, that, that has not been studied because it's too obscene, the topic. Uh, but what I wanted to close with is the fact that we wanted, uh, one of the things that we wanted was for Dominicans to recognize, uh, for, for other minorities to recognize Dominicans as, as a U.S. As a, also as a U.S. ethnicity, even if we've had a continuous migratory flow, yeah? But there are Dominicans who have been forever. And so we have enough Dominicans, we had enough Dominicans in, in the United States uh, for, for us to be counted as one of the, uh, of, of the ethnicities. And, um, and so um, I remember the time when, uh, in 1995, uh, we learned that um, African-American educator, Dr. Alan Lee uh, Sessoms, uh, was appointed to uh, Queens College. And, you know, since we at the time we were looking for allies everywhere, oh, oh, my, oh my God, a brother. Um, so we immediately, we immediately took steps uh, to, to reach out to him with an eye on securing his support. Um, we sent him a, a letter of introduction, a thick package of information of events and research projects, yeah? Uh, and an invitation to have Queens College partner with, the Dominic, with Dominican Institute projects. We did not hear from Dr. Sessoms for about two months. Then sometime later, I met him in person when we were introduced at a reception hosted by the labor union of the City University of New York faculty and staff. After the conventional cordialities, I used the opportunity to tell him about a Dominican Institute, asking if he had received the materials I had sent him. To my delight, he remembered the correspondence, and his eyes sparked, uh, sparked up when he said, yes, I did, and I acted on it. Uh, you know, since I, I'd only received silence, I wonder what that could possibly have meant. But my delight changed to dismay when he explained what he had done. Basically, he had affixed a note of endorsement to our materials and shipped them to Washington, D.C., in care of the Honorable Bernardo Vega, the ambassador of the Dominican Republic in the, to the United States, um, wh whom, he, whom he had met, uh, he had an acquaintance with prior to coming to CUNY. Then I suddenly realized how, how bad the shape we were in was. Uh, because this was, this was a brother, and he could not get past the things that we, Dominicans, in spite of all the things that we had done to show, to show longevity in the United States, yeah, that we still belonged in the realm of foreign relations. Yeah? And, um, and so, uh, I have more things to say, but I don't have minutes in which to say them. So thank you very much, and... Uh, <laughs>
Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to um, work against my strengths here and try to multitask technologically. <laughs> so if you give me a minute. Um, I want to open my PowerPoint, which I have. Let's see. This way, right? <clears throat> so, um, I'll just briefly say thank you. I'm Janetta Candelario, in case you've forgotten who I am. Uh, and I want to say thank you, of course, to Nicole Guidote Hernandez for taking the lead in organizing this event and for inviting all of us, um, but especially for inviting me. I'm really grateful. Um, and to all the folks who do the work both in front and behind the scenes to make a complicated event like this happen. Um, I won't echo the thanks for the land that we are on or for the many laboring bodies that do all the cleanup and set up, because I think we all know, right, that that work is important. And it is so often done by women and people of color and the most vulnerable among us, um, who many of us here are still related to, right? Um, and of course, I want to thank Gloria for um, the fact that she continues to have hope and model hope for us. Um, so when I was thinking about what I could contribute to this conversation, um, and in some ways, like Silvio, I, I was telling Beth that I lost the notes that I wrote, and then I rewrote them, and then I sat here and rewrote them again, because I was trying to figure out what I could say that would be useful and um, would amplify the voices here. And it occurred to me that um, I wanted to make really clear what I hope Loria knows, but what many of you here might not know which is that she is part of a legacy, right? When Beth and April Mays and I were doing the Presentación del Libro, the book launch for um, a publication that we collaborated on for five years, itself the product of decades between us of archival work collecting the evidence of feminisms, with an S, in the Dominican Republic, and on the island at large, um, a book called Cien Años de Feminismos Dominicanos. Um, Magali Pineda, may she rest in peace, when we were presenting in 2011 at a conference that April Mays organized at the Academia de Historia Dominicana, the Dominican History Academy, put to us on the last day of our gathering, which was of both Dominican heritage and Dominican diasporic and non-Dominican heritage folks like Beth, who are committed to telling uh, a critical history of the Dominican Republic. Magali stood up on the last day at the Instituto Bono and said to us, I, I won't say it in Spanish, I'll paraphrase, it's amazing and wonderful that you have been doing this work. Now, for those of you who don't know, Magali Pineda is the founder of CIPAF, which is the Centro de Investigación para Acción Femenina, the first um, research, feminist research center and think tank established in Santo Domingo, um, and one of the key backers of the very first gender studies center, by the way, established in the Caribbean, which was at INTEC, the Centro de Estudio de Género. She said, it's wonderful that you're doing this work. It's wonderful that you've come to share it with us. But it's really distressing that the archives that you are drawing from, our archives, don't live here with us that there are places like Harvard, like the Schlesinger Library, which is a fantastic repository. You know, I'm very grateful to it myself. I drew a lot of my materials from there. But the fact that they had one of the only existing copies of Evangelina Rodriguez Peroso's medical school dissertation and the Archivo General de la Nación Dominicana did not, right, was incredibly distressing. And the fact that archives at Stanford have our materials and Haitian feminist materials, or that the archives in New Jersey or the archives in Washington, D.C. have our materials, right? our legacies, and we don't, is incredibly distressing. Why is it distressing? Because it's a Dominican feminist movement that knows it has a long history 
and continues to be acted and relies on intellectual production and knowledge production. Okay? So she put upon us the obligation that we would share what we had accumulated, those private files that we are taught in the US Academy to hoard and guard closely right, as a political and ethical obligation. Now, as it happens, those of us who were there already came to the work with that orientation of understanding that um, although we were operating in US monolingual, historically white serving contexts that had authorized us to say pretty much whatever we wanted to about Dominicans, because who would question us since there were so few of us around, right? All of us had come to the work with an ethical obligation and commitment to actually citing and talking to and engaging with knowledge producers in the Dominican Republic. Both those who were formally authorized by institutions like higher education, but also those who are often not, right? The culture workers, the political activists, the artists, and people like Josefina Baez, for example, okay? Because we knew as feminists, Dominican heritage and not, that knowledge production takes many forms and it is often the most radical, transgressive, and transformative knowledge production that goes unrecognized, disavowed, and pushed away. So when I was thinking about what I could say, I remembered something I said at that book launch when I had my five minutes, which I took 10, excuse me. <laughs> and I was very um, moved by looking at that room filled with the largest audience, by the way, that the Archivo General de la Nación had ever had for any book launch. Ours being one of the few ever dedicated by that institution and its publishing unit to women's history. Okay? Our 1,500 page, two volume collection, which is a tiny fraction of the archive that we actually have. And as I looked out on the audience and I saw my mom, what came to me was this. Soy un legado, somos legado. We are the legacy, right? We are the dream that our tataras abuelas, our great grandmothers dreamed of. So I wanted to start, Lorja, by reminding you and affirming for you in this space, que eres legado y las tataras abuelas están contigo, whatever may happen. So who are those tataras? I wanted to tell you quickly about Socorro de Rosario Sanchez, an educator. Many of our feminists, by the way, were school teachers and educators um, in one form or another, but Socorro de Rosario Sanchez was formerly an educator who established one of the first secular, that is to say non-religious schooling projects in Santiago, the community from which the Candelarios, my family, are from, uh, in the Dominican Republic when she established a girl's school. She went on to establish professional training schools where women got degrees in, for example, pharmacy, apothecary sciences, which was unheard of at the time, as well as at the same time as the more famous Dominican school teacher Salome, who I respect and admire, but is not in my pantheon of tatarabuelas, precisely because she is so often extolled and I wanted to talk about the ones who are not, okay? So Cojro, at the same time that Salome, and without much of the backing, financial and political and social that Salome had because of her tie to a wealthy and powerful Dominican family, and also because Socorro was explicitly a black identified woman, established secular education programs for girls, beginning with middle school girls and all the way up to professional trainings. Socorro is proud of you. Sarah Miranda Lugan Frazier is the daughter of a runaway slave, Jeremiah Lugan, who established a depot on the Underground Railroad in Syracuse, New York, not far actually from, from where Professor Teresa Young's house is. Yeah. Her father, Jeremiah, was good friends with Frederick Douglass. And he vowed that his daughters would attain the formal education that was closed off to so many women in general, but particularly women of color and black women specifically. She went on to become one of the first four women, four black women in the US to attain a medical degree. 
but more importantly for our story. She was the first woman licensed to practice medicine in the Dominican Republic. When she migrated there at the end of the 19th century to join her husband, Charles Frazier, who was good friends with Frederick Douglass, because Douglass's son was a consul in Puerto Plata. She was in the Puerto Plata that saw the activism of the Enrique Sureña family. Salome went there when she was dying of tuberculosis with her children, including Pedro, who became good friends with Mercedes Mota, the daughter of an unnamed Chinese immigrant and a humble Dominican woman who had two children under dubious circumstances, which means out of wedlock, <laughs> in San Francisco de Macorís, a rural community, and brought them to the city, Puerto Plata, where Mercedes and her sister Antera were spotted by Demeteria Betances, the sister of Ramón Emeterio Betances, who had been invited to Puerto Plata by Gregorio Luperón, one of our first freedom fighters resisted to the U.S. intended annexation of 1871, who made one of his primary projects women's education and invited Eugenio Maria de Hostos, Ramón Emeterio Betances, Demetria Betances, and others. Mercedes was identified by Demetria, taken under her wing, alfabetizada, taught how to read, and trained to become a teacher, which she did as part of the larger community established by Salomé and Socorro. She accompanied Pedro in 1901 on that trip to Buffalo that Professor Salian mentions, which was his first trip. She traveled back and forth to Europe and the United States. She called herself a feminist. The reason she was in Buffalo was because she was the only woman from Latin America of Latin American descent who was invited by the International Council of Women to speak at their meeting in Buffalo. Her speech was published in the press and circulated internationally. She stayed in the Dominican Republic working as a feminist school teacher until her sister died in 1919 during the US occupation. And she came to the Bronx where she lived for several more decades until she finished raising her nieces and nephews and finally retired to Cedarville, New Jersey in 1948 where she lived until she passed away in 1964. She's a sister Jersey girl. <laughs> Evangelina Rodriguez Peroso, the first Dominican woman licensed to practice medicine in the Dominican Republic. A vowed feminist and anti-Trujillista activist whose commitment to public health and social justice, to uplifting the rights of the poor, the sick, the disabled, the leprous, the tuberculosis, the sex workers, cost her her life, but it was a life fully lived. In a time where it was nearly impossible to speak against the regime, she did so publicly. She did things like set up tables in the plaza in San Pedro de Macorís in front of the cathedral where she handed out condoms. She established free homes for tuberculosis patients. She established milk dispensaries for poor mothers. She helped literacy projects for the sugarcane plantation workers, owned largely by US capital and worked primarily by Haitian migrant workers. She's proud of you, Lorena. Petronila Angelica Gomez, establisher of the first feminist magazine in the Dominican Republic, Femina established in 1922, specifically in response to US occupation. Femina called itself a feminist magazine. Under heavy censorship and scrutiny by the US occupiers, she published articles avowing the rights of all citizens, and she used that language, male and female alike, of a feminist project of liberation that took citizenship and democracy in its fullest iteration as being central to the well-being of all in the society. Ran literacy programs in the Bates of San Pedro and beyond, and moved to the capital, 
moved to the capital late in her life to continue to organize as a feminist even as the regime was being established and taking off. Petronila is with you. Pedro's sister, the often under-recognized and unacknowledged Camila Enriquez Ureña, who taught at Vassar for over a decade, who before that lived in Cuba, where she had been taken as a small child in the aftermath of her mother's passing, and where she was absolutely a core part of the Cuban feminist movement, specifically the Cuban intellectual literary feminist movement, working in the context of repressive regimes, both inside and outside the home, navigating a landscape that diminished the power of women's voices and intellectualism and refused to allow women the kind of erotic autonomy that she lived out despite them, underneath the radar. After over a decade of teaching in Vassar, Camila returned to Cuba to continue her work as an educator after the revolution, finally finding the space for her full voice to be heard, where she inspired Cuban feminists for the decade that remained of her life. Camila Enrique Ureña is proud of you. Carmen Natalia, who refused to be quieted by the regime, even as it systematically tortured her family, refused to allow them their livelihoods, who wrote public letters of protest, who insisted with her pen and her voice that if they could not live a full citizenship life under the regime, that they'd be allowed to leave until they did. And from exile, who protested and protested and protested until ultimately, after the Justiciamiento, she took over the ICW that had been weirdly chaired by Minerva Benaldino. And I think in a wonderful or ironic turn of history, continued Dominican transnational feminism in its best form. Mama Tingo, Florinda Soriano, whose work and whose life you have so ably shared with so many. Mama Tingo is proud of you. The women of Casa Identidad Mujer Negra, Sergio Galvan, Ochi Curiel, Xiomara Fortuna, among others, they're proud of you. The queer women of Dominican feminist transnational activism, Yudelke Espinosa, Jacqueline Jimenez Polanco, and others, who have defied the phallocentric misogyny, the homophobic, insistence coming from both inside feminisms and outside feminisms to insist that queerness is part and parcel of our story. They thank you too. And of course, it's no secret to anyone here that Josefina Baez loves you. Okay. As we do. So I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I did want to make sure that I say a few words about your actual work, Lorgia, because I think I really appreciated, um, excuse me one second, I really appreciated the comments from this morning in their um, narrating a bit and sharing with the audience a bit about why your work matters so much but I thought I'd join them in that, so if you'll permit me. In the 10 years since she earned her PhD, Dr. Garcia Peña's impact upon the US Academy is truly astounding. She is an inordinately prolific and highly regarded scholar, encompassing interdisciplines she works within 
evidently not just meeting, but surpassing norms established by her cohort and senior colleagues alike. From her central role in founding Freedom University, FU, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help it, appropriately named, while a junior faculty member at the University of Georgia, and her indefatigable commitment to advocating for our most vulnerable student and human populations, to her journalistic publications and op-eds on immigrant and human rights here and abroad, Dr. Garcia Peña has established herself as a truly public intellectual. She is routinely invited to participate in plenary panels organized by major learned societies. I know because I've done that several times in my capacity as vice president of the Latino Studies Association and of the New England Consortium for Latino Studies and of MALCS. To universities and advocacy organizations alike because her eloquence, scholarly rigor, and ethical commitments are universally known. As importantly, she regularly extends her invitation onto those plenaries and exalted spaces to include those she advocates for and writes about, DACA students, Dominicans of Haitian descent, Haitian immigrants and migrants, Dominican performing artists such as Baez and Indiana, and black and Italian activists and filmmakers so that they can speak for themselves. For example, when she was to speak on a closing plenary of the inaugural Latino Studies Association meeting held in 2016 about bridging research and praxis, she asked the organizers that Gustavo Madrigal, her former Freedom University student, also be invited so that he could represent his experiences as an undocumented student himself, rather than being simply spoken about by the scholar expert. Because of practices like this, Dr. Garcia Peña has established herself as a knowledgeable and beloved interlocutor for activists, culture workers, and performance artists, thereby ably translating the significance of her work for those who are not in the know and those who are. In other words, she models feminist, anti-racist praxis at its finest. As 19 book reviews from peers in Africana, Black, Caribbean, Dominican, ethnic and racial, international relations, Latin American, Latino, and performance studies attest to her first book, Borders of Dominicanidad, is a game changer. That the book also won the National Women's Studies Association coveted Gloria Anzaldúa Book Prize in 2017, the Latino Studies section of the LASA Book Prize, the ECs Duarte Book Prize in 2016. The breadth and depth of the book and its highly regarded interdisciplinarity reflects its exemplary and seamless weaving together of archival methods, literary criticism, critical theory, and historiography. She deftly sustains an intersectional and transnational analytical frame, attending to race and ethnicity, sexuality, queerness, geopolitics, class, and other systems of inequality with tremendously graceful exposition. Her skillful deployment of multiple methods, extended interviews, archival research, visual and discourse analysis, literary criticism, not only yield rich data, but also offer an exemplary strategy for other researchers working on intersectional realms. As the editor of Meridians, I find this especially noteworthy, as intersectional analysis is often deployed in an unfortunately formulaic way by less sophisticated scholars. Dr. Garcia Peña's careful and rigorous debunking of a cherished anti-Haitianist myth of the Galindo Virgin's rape, central to Dominican nationalist ideology and politics alone, would make Borders of Dominicanidad groundbreaking in both the US and the Dominican Republic. Additionally, the archives you uncovered are truly a treasure.
Having been a student of Dominican History Society and Culture for nearly three decades now, I can attest that accessing materials in the Archivo General de la Nación requires tremendous tenacity, <laughs> creativity, patience, discernment, diligence, and the occasional gift. <laughs> Far beyond that required for working in US archives. But you go far beyond that, beyond mapping the effects of the Galindo rape myth wake upon not only Dominican and Haitian, but US nation building and interventionism from the early 20th century to the present moment. Your book has made a substantial impact among scholars and public intellectuals, not only in the United States and Europe, but in the Dominican Republic as well. It is hard to overstate how much of a sacred cow the myth of the Galindo Virgin's rape is in the Dominican Republic, particularly among the ultra-nationalist intelligentsia and political re um, leadership. That, together with the fact that critical engagement with nationalism and anti-Haitianism opens one, particularly women, to vicious attacks and especially so when the authors are Dominican diasporic scholars, as is the case with you, Lorgia, makes this very important text and you a very brave scholar. Your book has truly had national, transnational, and international impact. I learned a great deal from you. And for that, I and the Tatarabuelas are thankful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's such a true honor to be here with you and to have the opportunity to contribute to this amazing conversation. I'm, I'm really just very touched and I'm so grateful to the organizers, um, to Marisa Lebron and to Kish Kim for the idea, um, to Nicole Giorari Hernandez. Uh, for doing the organizational work and the staff at the Warren Center. And I'm echoing everything everyone said, but I think that this gratitude uh, is really important and it's part of kind of the work that we're doing here. I also know that a lot has already been said and that some of the things I have to say here are going to repeat, echo, support, back up um, some brilliant scholars, and I'm grateful to, to them for having started the conversation. Um, I want to offer my thoughts here about the present and future of Dominican studies and the impact of doc Dr. Garcia Pena's work in that quote unquote small corner of the academic world. But I also want to put in a few words about why it is intellectually and pedagogically crucial that we stop allowing Hispaniola to be allocated such a marginalized place in academia and how we can use Dr. Garcia Pena's work on the page and embodied to think about a more holistic understanding of its scholarly impact. Finally, I want to use this opportunity to again remind us here and those listening beyond these walls that one disavowal of a person's work, even if a big one, does not define how we as a collective see that person and the work that they have done. I think this is the most important part about what we do here. We don't have power to make decisions that were made here, but what we can do is say why this work matters and how we will support it and express solidarity about it. Certainly, I will add also that the fact, the fact that I've known Lorja since very early in both our embarkations in this career colors what I have to say here, but I think it should. I know that this is a, in many ways an institutional structural problem, but what we put on the page as scholars is only a portion of what we do. 
The rest is very much in the flesh, how we engage with our students, our colleagues, how we interact within the academic community, how we link our ideas to praxis. This all matters so very much, and it often becomes obfuscated um, in the moments in academia in which we attempt to place individuals and rubrics. Rubrics are great for grading. They're not so great for evaluating work. Right, And I think we have been caught in a moment where we have to weigh in on that, but we also need to remember that they have a place and, and it's maybe not this one, right? Um, I believe that it is crucial that we emphasize here that all the work that Dr. Garcia Pena has done and continues to do matters to the future of Dominican studies. And the irony here is that the historian is going to attempt to talk about the future. Um, <laughs> while the non hist I mean, well, the sociologist, uh, <laughs> uh, both Dr. Candelario and Dr. Uh, Torres Ayant talked about the history uh, and provided some important lessons. I'm gonna try to take that and, and talk about how we look to the future. Um, but first, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how I met uh, Lorja Garcia Peña, which was in the Archivo General de la Nación, which uh, Jeanette just talked about. Uh, it was during my year conducting field research for my dissertation about 15 years ago. For anyone who conducts archival research, particularly in smaller, less frequented, sometimes unair conditioned places like the AGN, you know it is both challenging and very, very lonely work. So I was beyond ecstatic. To, when I saw someone in those halls who appeared to be on a similar journey as I was. But I was even more thrilled when I discovered it was the incredible, vibrant, vibrant, engaged woman I have come to know over the past decade and a half, and who has both challenged and supported me and my work at every turn. Since that time, my work and Dr. Garcia Peña's have had as part of their concern the place of Dominican studies in the academy. For the past four years, I have been the co-chair of the Haiti DR section of the Latin American Studies Association, a very small corner of that world. Uh, and that has allowed me an incredible vantage point to assess the place, a place that is often scrabbled for, uh, of the island of Hispaniola in the larger disciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to the region. And it is from here that I wanna offer my perspective on how we can value and validate Lorja Garcia Pena's work in the face of this seemingly inscrutable disavowal. In the uh, introduction to the borders of Dominicanidad, Dr. Garcia Pena argues, as I think we in Dominican and Caribbean studies often find ourselves required to do, that the work brings Dominicanidad from the footnote to the center of the page. For many of us, this work of centering a footnote is a primary and a necessary concern. We are often asked to demonstrate why the Dominican Republic matters and how it relates to the Americas more broadly. I don't necessarily dispute this as an editorial practice as it helps to expand our work to more encompassing audiences, but I often resist its in inference writ large and want to ask why US or European historians do not have to defend their geographic choices. Isn't our work as scholars supposed to point up and even upend existing hierarchies of knowledge? Shouldn't we have long ago discarded such arcane and reductive ideas of importance, particularly relative to size? <laughs> Those questions remain for me, but what I do know is that Dr. Garcia Pena's work most definitively has centered Hispaniola regarding issues of blackness, gender, and Dominican national identity for a wide variety of scholarly circles. It has highlighted the broader centrality of the island nation and its diasporic community, shining a spotlight on the place where the identities of the Americas post-encounter post were first forged through forced labor, colonial imprints of hierarchy, and Christianizing missions, and later through imperialism, a lead in authoritarian control and migration, demonstrates how this very place is critical, crucial to an entire hemispheric understanding of these very same ideas, regardless of its small size, or perhaps paradoxically precisely because of it. 
For many of us in my scholarly generation and before, choosing to build a career around the Dominican Republic or even Dominican studies was not a decision wildly applauded by our early mentors or advisors. They might have told us to focus on a country that was more significant, like Mexico or Brazil, or perhaps, in my case, that no one cared about the island or its stories, or worse still, as Dr. Garcia Pena notes, that the DR was a country of, quote, rum and cheap whores. For some of us, this quote-unquote advice came with significant scholarly bullying and forced us to fiercely defend this place and our place within it that we found, often through intense passion and love, to be at the center of, the, of a nexus of race, identity, belonging, and yes, contradictions. 10 or 15 years ago, these at scholars offering advice might not have been totally to blame in pushing us away from a place so much of the scholarly community had denied and obfuscated, if merely for practical reasons. But what Dr. Garcia Pena, Pena's work does so masterfully is to prove that the very opposite, and ultimately what we believed, is true. That is, that the Dominican Republic is, in fact, the very center of the universe. Or, <laughs> or at least the center of a universe of ideas that ground the scholarly work we hope to accomplish, that scholarly work of centering footnotes. It seems, despite progress, it still is so very necessary to push back on the conception that these, quote, small places somehow, quote, don't matter. I was recently conducting research in a small Jamaican-based periodical from the mid-20th century called the West Indian Review. Commenting on an early number, John Huggins, then the governor of Jamaica, called the magazine with its, quote, genuine intellectual, intellectual attempt at a West Indian viewpoint, and quote, offered a, quote, welcome relief from the insular and even parochial attitude so often taken with regard to the affairs of small and semi-isolated places. That was 1944. Sadly, I believe that even 75 years later, we must continue the work of actively celebrating and defending scholarship that moves beyond the, quote, insular and even parochial, when discussing the, quote, small and semi-isolated places like the islands of the Caribbean and their diasporas. I don't think we do it on purpose, but we have been painted into a corner in some ways, and we are trying to push our way into the middle of the room. To extend the metaphor, perhaps, to its breaking point, I think we need a new design scheme. Because it matters in so many ways, to our students, to each other as scholars, to the ways we describe and explain structures of knowledge and power. And most importantly for me, because history itself is produced by and continues to produce these hierarchies of, of power that allow for the dismissal of certain stories, certain narratives, and certain peoples as somehow less significant. I want to be able to assure my students and my students at an HBCU, as well as myself, that we are no longer clinging to a vision of the past or the present that continues to that continues a tired hierarchy that prioritizes certain stories over others. For me, Dr. Garcia Pena's work as a scholar, as a teacher, and mentor, as an activist, does not just move beyond the insular or parochial, because it never even assumes it as a reality. I don't need to talk about the ways her work has been wildly applauded in multiple sectors. Other people will have done that, her awards, her honors. But I would like to discuss how her work centers Dominican studies today and points to the future. Relative to the island of Hispaniola, her work brings the place and its people into long-running conversations, dialogues, and in her words, dictions about borders and bordering, about Latinidad and diaspora, and about blackness. But it doesn't just say, hey, this belongs here in the academy. Like the old saying, you can't just, quote, add women and stir to make up for the, <laughs> the total silencing of women in the historical narrative, Dr. Garcia Pena's work aims at something much more valuable. I want to talk about three interventions that I believe her work, and not just on the written page but in general, uh, both accomplishes and provides important models for the future. Um, first, it takes a long view. 
right? Second, it demands we rethink the boundaries of Latinidad to fully incorporate Dominicanidad uh, and other kinds of boundaries. Finally, it completely reimagines borders and bordering. And I, I'm, again, here I'm echoing a lot of the things that we've heard uh, earlier today. But I believe these three things in many ways point to the future of Dominican studies, a future of creating a global Dominicanidades, and of integrating these ideas far past the island, right? So in thinking about the scope of Dr. Garcia Pena's work, one of the things that is most important to me is that it takes a long view of the narratives and stories that she tells. She is uh, content to neither delve solely into an incident in the past or focus on a more contemporary issue, but rather links her concerns to a broad, intensely archivally based and stretched narrative. It reappropriates the Annals School idea of long durée and engages it to conduct her episodic and intertwined literary and historical analysis. The goal is to show how her tri geographical triangulations, for example, US, Dominican Republic, Haiti, or Italy, Dominican Republic, US, are both inextricably inextricable to explaining the histories of all three, and not just the giants imposing on the smaller sites. Um, but it's also key to understanding what many have, uh, have called Dominicans, quote unquote, complicated relationship with race. Um, and here I want to pause and say, whose relationship to race isn't complicated? <laughs> um, but also, uh, complicated to compare to what? To the US? Oh, yeah, that's simple. Um, a little bit of a digression, but. Um, but it's true that the question of race takes up a whole lot of discursive and physical space in Dominican studies, and there is no doubt that it is an important question, particularly to the present, as Dr. Garcia Pena shows us. However, it is often treated through either an isolated historical lens or an unrooted contemporary problem. Dr. Garcia Pena's work demonstrates so clearly why neither of the, those models work. Moreover, she shows us clearly what it is not. Some peculiar to the Dominican Republic case, again, what structures of race, identity, and belonging are not peculiar to its place, but I digress again. Um, it is also not some sort of sideshow act, nor is it the same circusing that so often occurs when people pin the 1937 massacre solely on that lunatic Trujillo. Yes, he was something of a lunatic, I will admit. I studied him for a long time. Um, but casting the entire country as an ana anomaly and its US trained dictator as a crazed madman is completely counterproductive, unjust, and mostly not useful. What Dr. Garcia Pena's work offers for us through its long view on the past and present is a better model, one that roots itself into the past without losing sight of the present and, in, and is rooted in the central question at hand. This approach is a challenging way to work, to say the least. It demands mastery of the complications of archival research, close literary and cultural analysis, and the intellectual acumen to tie those together. And ultimately, to tie them to the present, something that I can't claim to do very well as a historian. Um, the case that Dr. Garcia Pena uses in her very first chapter that Janetta brought up of the Galindez murders um, is an important one that I will bring up again um, because it has been so rooted in a fiction in the Dominican narrative that the truth of the case has been and was until this point erased. Yet, what I love about this story is it did not stop Dr. Garcia Pena from seeking it out. And having worked in the Dominican archives, I know a thing or two about being told that a group of sources either doesn't exist or is not worth looking at, right? And therefore, feet dragging will ensue until you keep insisting months upon months upon months that it is valuable but to you. Right? Uh, persistence is key, and Dr. Garcia Pena has that in spades. She spent months searching for, need demanding, the actual trial transcripts, not to mention tracking down the evolution of the lie. What results is a forensic deconstruction of a national myth that is foundational to, um, as she shows us by citing its continued use in textbooks to the present, uh, of a certain set of ideas about Dominican race and nation. So, to sum up, we've gone from 1822, the Galindo case, to the present, and yet we feel no whiplash. The long view makes this narrative both rooted and relevant. 
The second point I want to raise relative to Dr. Garcia Pena's contribution to Dominican studies present and future is how her work also demands that we rethink boundaries of Latinidad to fully incorporate Dominicanidad. In the same way she is not content to have her work live either in the past or the present, she will not offer her readers a conception of the Dominican Republic without its diaspora. She demands through this act that we think with her beyond accepted definitions, but also that we look at how mapping of alterity onto Hispaniola's bodies and those bodies in the diaspora and in El Nie informs us about the processes for other groups. No doubt the Dominican Republic and Haiti have had a particular kind of relationship with the United States that created the specific migratory flows resulting in diasporic communities within the continental boundaries of the US. However, the connection between the three nations was and is not a unidirectional field of power. It created deep and lasting impacts upon the ways you, the US body politic constructed others and itself, despite its own roots in a multi-sourced citizenship. This is not unique. Mexico, other Caribbean nations, Central America, all have had fraught connections, including occupations, filibusters, possible annexations, with their northern neighbor that impacted the way the US constructed its own migration and racial politics and policies. Dr. Garcia Pena does the same kind of geopolitical triangulation in the ways she is now looking at Dominicans in Italy and Europe. We must consider all these histories together and in conversation with each other to fully understand both the individual and collective experiences for those that end up triply marked by the experience of their birth or heritage nation, those of their new homeland and the realities of those interactions. Finally, I believe the way Dr. Garcia Pena's work reimagines borders and the acts of bordering by building on previous scholarship, uh, scholarly conceptualizations is innovative, thoughtful, and grounded, but also crucial to the future of the field. It is here that her concept of contradiction becomes most powerful, as George Lipsitz reminds us. Um, we talk about how borders are, of course, the lines that separate imaginary communities and race and nationality as social constructs, but the ways Dr. Dr. Garcia Pena frames her work allows us to think about how people who contend with these lines daily can be architects of reimagining and talking back to those artifices. This is in part constructing an in-between, el nie, but also finding ways to challenge the very realities of those boundaries through art and activism and active contestations of the words used to, racial, uh, to racially and nationally inscribed bodies, right? This uh, carries to the way that we operate as scholars and academics. Dr. Garcia Pena's scholarship has had an incredible impact on the numerous fields on which the work traverses. We wrote, um, and, and one of the, I'm gonna stop for a second, and one of the uh, things I did not express gratitude for um, was the group of people that really um, were instrumental in bringing um, Lorge's case to light the graduate students at Harvard who did an incredible, incredible job. I think. I mean, thousands of signatures. And um, also, I wanted to shout out to uh, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel and Rosemary Feel um, and Sharina Mayo Pozo, uh, who did the work of uh, constructing a second letter to Raj Chetty um, and Alex Hill and um, Katarina uh, Gonzalez Seligman, who did Ethnic Studies Rise, right? And the demonstration of that kind of solidarity, I think, is important to recognize. Um, we wrote in one of the letters in defense of her, in Lorja Garcia Pena's scholarship that it is, quote, nearly impossible to find new work that doesn't cite her. I started doing the computational work through citation tools to demonstrate how much of this new work, once it re reaches the public stage, builds off Dr. Garcia Pena's insights. To be honest, I grew a bit bored. 
I don't do numbers. I know, that kind of, I know that kind of thing is important, but for me, it has been a much more tangible reality when I hear this reverence from the mouths of young scholars at conferences. And in trying to support our upcoming students at conferences, I hear it almost constantly. The kind of innovative thinking inherent in Dr. Garcia Pena's work um, represented in the three categories I've talked about, but obviously well beyond that given everyone here, is very attractive to a new generation of scholars. They believe in the promises of interdisciplinary work, and they believe that the Dominican Republic and other Caribbean nations could and should have a place both in the academy and our culture because they have a place in our society. But I think these students also know something that must be pointed out here. They know it either through experience or intuition that Dr. Garcia Pena cares deeply about training a new generation of writers and thinkers in and beyond the academy. She is constantly working to make her classes more inclusive, more interactive, more engaging. She works to find spaces for students that don't always feel that their university or their society has done so for them, and they come out in droves for her. I don't believe this is a sidelight, it is central. Because if we truly care about making the world in which we work look more like the world in which we live, we must be concerned about changing the demographics of who we are training and how we are training them, right? While I cannot personally mirror for my students themselves in academia, I can show them what solidarity in the academy looks like, right? And I want that to be part of our work. Lorza Garcia Pena's students can see themselves in her work and we need to value that. In looking at the stuff that was appearing online, it struck me how many students had incredible things to say about her. Um, that one talked about uh, that she taught her what it means to be an academic and a woman warrior and who introduced me to the gorgeous, startling and brave world of Chicana literature. Another, now in an MFA program, wrote publicly that, quote, her classroom is where I first fell in love with academia and felt it had a place for me. These comments are not incidental to Dr. Garcia Pena's scholarship. Again, they are central if we hope to continue to push our fields to be innovative and represent and represent the world we live in. I believe this is truly because Dr. Garcia Pena's work has hope, something I think we are often sorely lacking these days. This is perhaps, perhaps Dr. Garcia Pena's most crucial intervention and one that extends beyond her scholarly work or even her classrooms and into her very essence as a human on this planet. Her work reminds us that we can be activists, that as scholars, we can say and do things that make a real difference, whether that is physically occupying space on Harvard Yard, as she did with her students, or creating theoretical spaces for inclusion and belonging. As she writes of a performance, she analyzes the work, quote, dares us to dream about the possibility of hope through solidarity and interdependency of people working together. Her intellectual work does this too and is grounded in her vision of a better and more inclusive and fair future. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we can take about 10 minutes uh, for questions, for comments. Hello, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. My name is Isabel Espinal. I'm a librarian at UMass. Um, I finished a PhD at age, how old was I, 54. Um, and I've, education was a traumatic experience for me. I'm Dominican. When I went to Princeton, I was really excited to be taking a Caribbean studies uh, literature, a Caribbean literature class. And it was all Puerto Rico and Cuba. And this was a Puerto Rican professor teaching the class. So what you're talking about with uh, the erasure and having to defend, um, it has really affected a lot of us, our lives. It really has. Why was I age 54 when I finally did that? You know, why? I think the answer lies in these violences that keep happening. Having to defend 
is a violence. Mm. Um, and so I was in that wonderful workshop that you gave, um, the two of you put together, Dom Dominicanida Rades uh, workshop, and they're trying to help us, those of us who are, trying, are still in this game to you know, get through to the next step or whatever. So all levels of scholarship. It was great what you did here in this space. What you did, Lorja, thank you for using those resources. And one of the things that stuck with me that I, a comment that I got that I'm still struggling with was somebody actually in that workshop said, you know, so what? You have to answer the so what question. And I actually think that sometimes that itself can be a violent question because why sh that having to defend, I think, is still sort of ingrained. Um, so that's just a comment. I, I appreciate that you're bringing that out. Um, and just to resonate that, yeah, it, it's a helpful point to make. It really affects us. Thank you. If there aren't any questions, I, there's something else I wanted to say. Oh, there's right? a question right there. There is a question, okay. <laughs> Ramon Hernandez and I, uh, uh, Professor Torres, as you were uh, remembering Pedro Enrique Sureña and the uh, other colleague who uh, passed by Harvard, I just wanted to know what you think or El Dominicano, Taveras, who was also here. I think um, during the time, perhaps a little bit, two or three years later, uh, Dan Pedro, medical school, the, actually the uh, radiology school uh, here at Harvard, it's named after him. Which, who is he? Taveras, I believe his last name is Taveras. I'm sorry that I thought you knew, since you know no, no. a lot. I, no, 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 I, no, no, no. The, uh, the, 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 the I'm reason, so sorry. The I'm reason, the reason so why sorry. people think I know a lot is because, uh, is because when people say something that I don't know, I say, can you please tell me about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I learned. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, and, and I, you know, I... I reflected upon uh, about him, but I, I couldn't include it in my comments, but be uh, supported by uh, Trujillo, and of course he did not look like our dear friend at all. So it's just another, I, sorry, I did not know, honestly. That no, he, no, but that's perfectly fine. I am not embarrassed by not knowing. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I tell my students, uh, don't say that somebody, oh, he's just being ignorant. Don't use that as a put down. That is not a put down. If you say that some, that somebody is ignorant, you're only saying they haven't studied that. <laughs> you know. But I'm ignorant about every, everything I haven't studied. Uh, I think you know Pedro, uh, Pedro Enrique Sureña is likely to, uh, to to surface for me more easily than somebody who is in, in, who is a physician. Yeah, because we're talking about somebody who came to deliver the Elliot, uh, the Charles Elliot Norton lectures, and, and of course, uh, as you know. When I, uh, when, when I, um, one of the per first things that I did uh, in, uh, when, this, uh, when I became aff affiliated with the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage uh, Project was to try to uh, dig up the literary history of Dominicans uh, before the large exodus of the, of the 1960s, yeah? And so I would find those names, but I have not done the same for the medical professions. I have not done the same and you know, so you know, I thank you for that. On the country, I'm very grateful for for hearing that detail. I, I'm going to look him up. It's, it's also the uh, the fact that his Dominicanness had never been part of his uh, identity, of who, right? Of yeah. who he was. Yeah. Uh, just that we know almost everything at the Dominican Studies Institute. So that, that, I guess that's the reason why I know. But yeah. there was no connection between who he was and his Dominicanness. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to jump in while people are gathering their thoughts, because one of the things I had wanted to say but um, forgot 
in, in my stage anxiety, um, is that 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I got an email from, from a young man, Francisco Perez, who was a senior here at Harvard and wanted to do his senior thesis on Dominican women's movements. And there was absolutely no one here who could help him with that. So he talked people here at Harvard into paying me to offer him a private tutorial on that history because I think through the Instituto, he found out that I had been working on this project because I've been at it for a while. <laughs> um, and convinced them to do that. So then he reached out to me and said, I got the funding. Would you be willing to talk to me? And I said, but you're at Harvard. How is it possible that you're at Harvard and there's no one there who can help you with this? And he said, there's not. They don't know. They don't, they don't know this stuff. So I will take a bus every two weeks and come all the way to Northampton and sit with you with two hours if you'll, if you'll give me that time. And then I'll take the bus back. And this young man did that for four months, beginning in January, uh, and wrote a fabulous thesis, and I'm still in touch with him and so forth. So I tell that story because I think it's emblematic, right, of, of this problem that we're having, that on the one hand, <laughs> you know, he managed to convince the institution into funding it, and he reached out, and yes, I was duly compensated. You know, I would have probably done it for free. In fact, I would have, right? although there's a part of me that thought, no, Harvard should pay. Right? <laughs> Harvard has the money and they should pay. Um, but, you know, you're, you're arriving here, and I remember, Lorde, also, you know, when we had the conversation when you were at University of Georgia and you called me because you had the offer and you said, what, I'm not sure what to do. I don't want to leave my kids here, my, my Freedom University students. I'm so committed to them. Is this right? Is this wrong? And I remember saying to you, no, Loria, you have to come because of Francisco Perez, right? That young man, these young people should not have to take a bus from Harvard to Smith to, to get what they need, right? That should be here, first of all. Second of all, the other thing I did want to say, because I am a sociologist, even though I'm a closet historian. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> is that I wanted to, to say in my comments and didn't um, that what happened here with your case and what happened with Alberto Laguna and what happened with Lucia Suarez and what happened with un sinnúmero de otros y otras, right, um, is a reflection of the transformation in um, the academy that parallels precisely the establishment and rise of ethnic and race studies, women's studies, community engaged, politicized intellectual work, and the entry of people of color and women into the academy. And that if you look at it on a graph, precisely as our numbers have increased as undergraduates, graduates, and faculty, the move to undermine tenure and academic freedom and make a vulnerable, contingent labor pool that is primarily female and of color and first generation and immigrant has also increased. So your particular case is part of a larger pattern of knocking out the legs from under the academic freedom tenure model precisely as the rise of critical studies and critically engaged efforts to pry open the gates and open the windows and open the doors, right, to, to let more of us in, all right? So in the same way that, that you are the legacy of this long history, by the way, and I don't know if I said this either, and I wanted to make sure I said it, I named all those women because you come from a long line of women, right? I come from a long line of bendidas. You come from a long line of feminists who contested at every level violence and state power, whether it was the Dominican state or the US hegemon or Spain, et cetera, right? And insisted on a vision of freedom, right? And worked towards that nationally and transnationally. So, Anyway, I, I wanted to make sure I said that, that, that this is an example of a larger problem that we have to address. 
Great, thank you. Uh, certainly a conversation to be continued. Um, I think we'll take a short break. I oh, invite, I think we had um, two, can we have the two students' questions? Or young, I'm assuming you're students, I'm sorry. Oh, sure, uh, okay, but, yeah. okay. Okay, we just take down it, like tag team it. I never can say that. I yeah. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, and uh, Gineta, your presentation really touched me in a lot of ways. Um, I I see Profe in that same light. Um, and um, as uh, as a student who is here right now and who. Um, works. Um, it's really interested in, in studying uh, the colony and looking at the at the uh, Santo Domingo colony um, and and thinking about all the intersections of race and and how coloniality functions and time and all these different things. I I found uh, an intellectual respite next, like working next to Profe and having not having to constantly defend where I am thinking from as though where I'm thinking from is something that has been made up. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is historically accurate. It's not something that, um, as, um, as was said before, is perhaps the center of the universe. Um, and I do firmly believe so, um, especially when we look at the histories of coloniality and, and, and just the development of the world as we know it right now. Um, there is something, now, now talking about the development of the world as we know it right now and addressing something that you mentioned about how as uh, the spaces of university are being opened up for uh, more people like us to be here, uh, for bodies like us to take space, the sh there's a shift in the ways in which we are able to perform our work within those spaces. And a thing that I've been like grappling with lately and which I've had told several people in this space uh, as the hours have gone by of the symposium is that um, my fear and and I hold this fear as much as I hold hope for a different future is that as we try to work and we try to defend something we try to to work towards a different uh, a different uh, way of relating and teaching and, and learning and all these different things we are also working within a system that just cannot hold it because it was never imagined to exist within it so the idea here is that sometimes my worry is that we're trying to defend something that's so worthwhile within a system that's completely indefensible um, so as I grow as a scholar, and as I grow as a thinker, and as I grow as a student, um, I just want, like, I bring with me all these questions of how can we exist in an ethical way, how we can produce in an ethical way within systems that have just been set up in such a way that no ethical action is possible within them, because the very, like, the very system itself is violent. Um, and another thing that, um, Another thing that I've been thinking about is precisely that, um, the question of what, what does the future look like if there's a possibility for, like where does the possibility for radical change and how, what is the space of the work that we do centering it La Española, thinking about both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, like thinking about the examples and, and I hold Haiti as, as, a, as a great example of how like, to destroy a system and to try to reimagine a new way of being and living and existing. Um, that, like at certain outside, even though in a lot of ways it's also an inside, um, but just like holding those contradictions, it's something that I greatly appreciate from the work, the work of all of you and the work that Profe does, and I think it's, it's a possibility for a future within Dominican studies. Um, so yeah, I like that is like kind of like my whole thought process and the question of like, how can we defend something within an indefensible system? Um, thank you all for your presentations. Um, I just wanted to say th uh, thanks to Beth for mentioning specifically the um, effect that Loria's work has had on the grad students and um, the way that it influenced the grad students here at Harvard to start the, the document that was sent around that brought attention to it. Um, and also to bring attention to just like solidarity amongst the grad students here at Harvard and beyond just those of us who something broke in us when we found out because what Loria or Profe represents to us is 
more than her book, is more than the awards, it's more than, um, m more than the academia. Like for us, I think that um, we see you, the woman that carves the path for us, and so for this denial is, it goes beyond just a tenure and beyond academia for us. Um, and in that I wanna say that somebody mentioned earlier, what can the grad students here at Harvard do to fight the administration? Um, and I think it goes beyond Harvard, you know, I think that there needs to be, and there has been, we should continue the solidarity between grad students here at Harvard and at other institutions, at public institutions, at community colleges, um, and students that are non-traditional students as well. Um, and so more of that. And also, uh, when, when I first met Lorja, I was at a conference and she signed my book and I was totally like fangirling because it was that first like, you know, when you read someone's book and then they're there and you, you know, that first experience. <laughs> uh, so she calls me the president of her fan club, but. <laughs> um, but in the book, in the dedication that she wrote to me when she signed it um, was Por el futuro que tu representas. And I just, I know that you know this, but I want to remind you that this isn't a funeral. You didn't die, you're still here. <laughs> and um, we need you, we still need you. So take your time, brush it off, and come back strong because we still need you and we're here. Thank you. that, thanking this panel. Uh, we will reconvene a little bit later since we went over. We'll reconvene at 310. Thank you.
right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're gonna get started with the uh, final session uh, for today of this incredible, um, amazing event for an incredible, amazing uh, scholar that we are so uh, lucky to be able to share uh, intellectual space with. So I'm Marisol Lebron, I'm a, a Warren Center Fellow for this year. I'm Assistant Professor of Mexican American and Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm excited to be here. So I'm gonna very briefly just um, t uh, give a, a, a kind of who's on the panel, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, first we have uh, Ramona Hernandez, who is the director of the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute and professor of sociology at City College of New York. Um, following Ramona, we have Robin Kelly, who is a distinguished uh, professor of history, and Gary B. Nash, endowed chair in US history at UCLA. Uh, after Robin, we have uh, Keish Kim, who is a fourth year PhD student here in American Studies at Harvard. <laughs> and uh, following, uh, yes, I'm like this, we're here, we're here for the grad students for sure. So <laughs> always, always the sharpest analysis. So we're, uh, uh, to close this out, we're gonna have Cornell West, uh, who is a presently professor of practice of public philosophy here at Harvard's Divinity School with a joint appointment in the Department of African and African American Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And here he comes. I was gonna say he'll be joining us in a moment. <laughs> So uh, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started uh -huh. with Ramona Hernandez. Thank you. I, the uh, technical person, I think we, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna use like three slides in here. And, Okay, I guess I, no, I, I will let you know when I, okay. I just want to make sure that you were there, so to feel. <laughs> Should I begin? Okay. It is quite a pleasure to join my colleagues today. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to partake in this important converse, conversation. Professor uh, Guidotti Hernandez, I am grateful for your, for your leadership. I have been asked to offer some comments on the following concerns. What are Dominicans and other ethnic minoritized peoples fighting for? What do we want? Why don't we just stop and let it be? And also, what does the uh, Dr. Garcia Peña's work tell uh, the world and the Dominican people. The fight is about the right to be and the, refusal, and the refusal to disappear, to disappear in the belly of the beast. The fight is to have our set in who we are and what we want to be as a people. And we also fight so that we end the exploitation of minoritized scholars by a system that enriches a few and impoverishes the majority, and in doing so, maintains the beliefs that perpetuate that system in place without end. We fight because today Dominican students who succeed in graduating from high school do so without learning about their rich past. In school, these students learn a partial and biased history of themselves, a history that prefers to look at their immediate past particularly the past that now raised their parents' migration and their need to leave the ancestral land for the United States. A history, a historical narrative is then constructed that emphasizes a heritage as one of deficit, as one, as poor one. This narrative portrays the U.S. society as one of progress, where the Dominican people came to realize their dreams. The tale teaches Dominican children to develop devotion and admiration exclusively for the new land where they were born. But it does this in the, in the context of devaluing the, the vast historical legacy of the Dominican people, 
a devaluation that is put into motion surreptitiously and achieved through the silency, silencing of the details that reveal that migration, the migration of their parents, for instance, is linked to depraved, corrupt people, both in the Dominican Republic as well as in the US. The undermining of the legacy of the Dominican people is also achieved when Dominican children do not learn that it is precisely in the land of the, their ancestor where the current history of the Americas began. And I want to redeem myself because uh, I made a boo-boo with Professor Torres asking him something that he did not know. But this is based, what I'm gonna say, the, last, the, the next few sentences is based upon something that he said uh, some time ago about the Dominican Republic being the cradle uh, of blackness. Uh, so that land, that is the land of the Dominican people uh, that marked the very beginning of the most profound social transformation that the world has witnessed up until this moment. A transformation that includes, yes, the unfolding of modernity with great economic growth, the enlightenment, and the industrial revolution, but also includes the extermination and enslavement of millions of innocent people, the destruction of entire societies, their ways of life, their wisdom, their legacy, and also the imposition of a social economic system whose basic and centric tenets uh, of profit at any cost put in place 500 years ago, is still remain alive today. We refuse to stay put because when young Dominicans enter college, they do not possess the knowledge to see the relationship between the US and the Dominican Republic from a critical point of view, a stand that would allow them to see the US as a selfish, overeater, narcissist nation that became a successful economic enterprise not because the pilgrims worked really, really hard <laughs> and were creative, but rather because the English conquistadores had a bad habit of stealing from their neighboring countries and by, in, and by imposing their way to life a la buena or a la mala. By the time Dominican students are ready to enter college, they have already learned to see the society where they were born through the eyes of the master and whose belly they were born, grew up, and were socialized by every single institution, from education and politics to medicine and religion. We fight because we need to create spaces where the master's narrative is undone, spaces where our young people learn the whole history and see themselves as warriors, not just as victims. Spaces that equip them to correct the biased narratives and make the world into a better place for everyone. Once in college, Dominican students face a perception about them that permeates US mainstream society. The view articulated in 2006 by Senator Jeff Sessions as he testified on immigration before the US Senate described Dominicans as deviant people. Violator, violators of laws, people who are accustomed to deceive others without impunity. In the end, Dominican have nothing to offer. This is to say that there is nothing to learn from the Dominican experience. And as a result, and this is a key implication here, the heritage is not worth studying, neither by them nor by others. Let me share, and this is, I think, where I need you, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Session. I think this is the one, right? Uh, I don't think so. No. They move it. Because we have to go here and then go to the... Uh, Sorry about that. We put it here this morning and now we need to find it. I think we gotta close it here. Yeah, the, um, can't see the cursor though. Okay, let me see if I can do it. But you stay with me? Yeah. <laughs> this is not a touch it's screen? Not. Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. No, it's not. 
Well, the previous uh, speaker, uh, I, bueno. I, I honestly was expecting a touch screen computer. That's the only one that I will uh, know at this age. Oh, it's, not in it's, it's in here. It's in, it's, but he, he I, actually put it in the hard drive. It's, it's on the desktop, but yeah, I can't there. see the cursor to, to close the window. Oh, yes, yeah. Could that be? No, it's a video. Let's, let's try this. That's her. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe. Do um, don't save. So don't yeah. save. Don't save. Okay, here and it is. And here it is. Okay. Set that this one. Yeah. Thank you. Look okay, at my water. It's coming? No, it's not coming. Hopefully now. In the Dominican Republic, the American consulate official who meets with those people in the Dominican Republic that would like to come to the United States. He seemed like a very nice guy. And uh, he, he made some mention about uh, sham marriages. And so we talked about that. I, as a United States attorney, prosecuted a case where people uh, uh, create a sham marriage for immigration purposes. He said, nobody, they won't even talk about prosecuting him. No case in the Dominican Republic, and he's seen lots and lots of sham marriage cases are ever prosecuted. Why do they have a sham marriage? Because if you're married to somebody who's in the United States, they can take their wife and they take their children, and that's the way to get people here. So they create a sham marriage. Uh, but he told me that 95% 95% of the people in the Dominican Republic that they approved to come to the United States were approved under the chain migration or family connection provisions in our code. So fundamentally, almost no one coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States is coming here because they have a... Uh, provable skill that would benefit us and that would indicate their likely success in our in our society. They're coming because some other family member of a qualifying relation uh, is here uh, as a citizen or even a green card holder and that's how they get to come. And then they're creating uh, uh, false documents to show they're these relatives or their spouses, they've married, when it's not so. Bueno, this biased, false, and devalued representation of Dominicans has the power to go on and penetrate the minds of everyone and further emphasize what our young already know. And of course, the tale will continue unless we take action and stop it. And what better place to do this than college academia, where academics still has some room for maneuvering? Uh, Senator uh, Sessions was appointed to the highest and largest legal post in the United States in 2017. Uh, that was then. Uh, and now, this is now. I need the other one. Thank you. As we look for this, I need to shout out Patricia Cougar. She's right here. She just got tenure at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And it's important. Yeah. It's important because Patricia was our first postdoctoral fellow in the Dominican Studies Institute, and she got her tenure. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, vamos a ver. I'm going to pass this. Trying to get rid of this one. Okay, and then go to this one now. And this is now. Denying a professor tenure 
Harvard Sparks a Debate Over Ethnic Studies is an article that was uh, recently published by the New York Times. The article generated 955 comments from readers. The New York Times organizes selected comments on the three categories. All comments, New York Times picks, and reader picks. I review all comments, all of them, uh, and decided to select a few from each column which, I, uh, which are representative of the overall sentiment expressed among uh, these readers and that speak directly to Dr. Garcia Peña's uh, substance. I eliminated the identification for obvious reasons. Uh, and here we have one. Um, I think uh, it will be very hard for outsiders to accurately judge how Garcia Peña's qualifications might satisfy Harvard's very uh, high tenure standards. Harvard has the ability to attract some of the top scholars in the world, and they are well known for not tenuring some highly qualified union faculty members. One should not jump to conclusions about what happened here. In particular, one should not assume that Harvard's decision reflects the university's overall views of ethnic studies. And then there's another one. Uh, in the course of my recent academic studies, I have reviewed all of Dr. Peña's work. <laughs> Refreshing that even Harvard maintains its standard against lightweight scholarship. And then, uh, let me see, do I have, that one goes in here. Yep, and this is, sorry, but ethnic studies sounds like a gigant waste of time. And only people, and this is, you gotta pay attention to this one. And only people who want to write on the ethnicity are uh, and interested in this subject. It is not the kind of research that brings humanity further. The woman wrote a book. Uh, about including, and this is how it was written, the constructions of Dominican, uh, the constructions of Dominican racial and national identity? Who is interested in that? Apart from the 1% Dominican intelligentsia, a negligible, well, you got it, number, since the country is so small, I find it ridiculous that Harvard offers such puff courses. Um, and the other one, I don't want to read it because it's uh, long and I, you know, have the issue of the uh, computer. But in the end, I think we need to emphasize the, 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 uh, the last sentence of that comment, which I think addresses some of the things that I had been saying. Uh, and this is, uh, I think it happened to Professor Mangley. Um, the uh, person here is saying that what the professor, what Dr. Peña does is uh, the sort of stuff that my graduate advisors would cross out and say, what the heck are you talking about, right? In the first two comments, the readers want us to know that it's not Harvard that has failed us here. It is the victim that has. And of course, the last two comments made it clear that only Dominicans will be interested in what Dr. Garcia Peña has to say about the Dominican people, because the rest of the world does not even know what the heck Dr. Garcia Peña is talking about. Then and now, the pejorative view of the, about the Dominican people remains the same. This negative view relegates Dominican immigrants and their US-born children to charity citizens. The perception, of course, helps maintain the status quo intact. Dominican students who come to college often face two realities. The first is to join the master narrative and speak about Dominicans in the third person. Dominicans become they, not we. And we cannot blame them for adopting this dominant narrative, this detachment. Who in their right mind, mind would be associated with crooks? The second reality is to remain seeing themselves as Dominicans, but not to disturb the status quo, to sit in the back of the classroom quietly, afraid to speak and to ask questions. These students will walk in the hallways believing that they do not belong and that they should be grateful. And if they speak in public spaces about their ancestry, it will be to show that Dominicans are moving up the ladder in the country, making an aid for themselves to show in general how Dominicans individuals are benefiting from the generous opportunities that are accessible to all those who work really, really hard. 
hard. Both of these realities may return a Dominican Harvard graduate or a college, gra a college graduate, for that matter, to the Dominican people, no doubt. Yet, none will give us one Dominican college graduate equipped with the tools, the ideas, and the courage to rewrite and bring to the forefront the history and the legacy of a people who have, in this continent, the longest history, the longest legacy of struggle against colonization, oppression, inequality, and against a system that legitimizes this and many other social injustice. The work of Dr. Garcia Peña at Harvard creates the kind of leaders and citizens Dominicans and other minoritized groups need. Students who rest of the last weeks I show that Dr. Garcia Peña combines academic scholarship with praxis. As professors in US university settings, we are equipped to write and publish uh, ideas. And ideas, of course, are words. And as has been said before, it is action of people that will get the job done, that will change the world. Dr. Garcia Peña turned her ideas into action in her classrooms and her systematic mentoring, nurturing, and teaching of those who came in contact with her. This was not a one-day thing. This was systematic. Her mentoring, her advice in students became part of her duty at Harvard. Her classroom or her office became spaces where silent students spoke, where they asked questions. But perhaps more importantly, where these students learned that their history had another history, or has, in fact. In the end, we fight today because in Dr. Garcia Peña's classroom, the college graduate that the Dominican people need is shaped. We also fight to end exploitation of people of color, women, and other excluded groups at the work in academia. The exploitation generates wealth and enriches the coffers of the institutions where they work, while many of them are reduced to the level of depreciated goods. The ill views about the Dominican people and the silencing of their historical legacy is not accidental. These ideas are not produced and reproduced in a vacuum. They are rooted in, in a capitalist system of production that feeds on devaluing people, a devaluation that turns into wealth following a very simple formula. The higher the number of people they value, the higher the profit, and then the larger the accumulation of wealth. For six straight years, Dr. Garcia Peña went beyond the call of duty to help Harvard keep it, it, uh, its current standing. She taught her classes as stipulated in her employment contract. She did her scholarly work and became a leader in a field in her own right, as, as, as not fighting, as it has been described all day today. But Dr. Garcia Peña did much more. She put her energy and her sweat in the creation of several academic resources at Harvard, including co-organizing the first ethnic studies seminar, defining a Latin uh, ex, uh, studies secondary field, and creating a concentration in Latin ex studies through the Department of Roman Languages and Literatures. These, are academic out these academic outputs represent a tremendous step forward. They have encouraged students to pursue groundbreaking interdisciplinary thinking. They also place Harvard on the vanguard of, of, of fields or studies that whether the power structure analogies or not are here to stay and will remain as long as there is one revolutionary scholar from our ranks standing in academia. But she did more. Dr. Garcia Peña participated in numerous dissertation committees and advised undergraduate students regularly. And of course, all this uh, while she was an untenured faculty. How in the world can this happen? How can an untenured junior faculty spend so much time performing work that does not add value to her tenure dossier, as some people have argued. She should have not done so much for Harvard, they claim, except that the service she did does have value. 
Her extra work requires energy, sweat, and creativity. And when these three elements are concretized in tangible products, the extra work acquires monetary value. I am talking about the money Dr. Garcia Peña saved Harvard when Harvard did not have the need to hire additional student advisors. When Harvard did not have to reduce even further the teaching load of senior professors so they could see an additional In addition to dissertation committees or spend time creating those academic programs Dr. Garcia Peña helped to create. The money saved came from the exploitation to which Dr. Garcia Peña was subjected to as an untenured professor. She was not compensated for the extra energy, the extra sweat, the extra creativity when she was performing all these services. And of course, the gains resulting from her unpaid labor was quietly packaged by the institution that exploited her. The problem here is that this transferring of resources from untenured minority professors to the wealthy institutions is invisible. I want to conclude uh, by adding that Dr. Garcia Peña's case reminds us what is at stake in our collective struggle to institutionalize and develop academic programs and hire professors that respond to the needs of our communities. Her case uh, reminds us that the gains we have made thus far can be lost. This daunting prospect is more than a possibility, but an active item on the agenda of those who insist on speaking on our behalf and using us to move their agenda forward. It is precisely because there are those who plot our own doing that we need to alter our tactics and the struggle. We need to teach new methods. We need to innovate our plan of action. And as minoritized academics, we need to make sure that those of us who are already in use whatever space and resources we have to open the doors to other fighters who will continue the fight when we are no longer able to do it. This talk is not about which strategies we ought to adopt, but rather to instigate. We have work ahead. And this work needs to be done collectively, but also individually. And the work needs to go beyond our cry. That being said, let us see Harvard's denial, Dr. Garcia Peña uh, tenure, as a temporary setback. Yet, whether we win or lose this battle, we will remain open arms against an old system that continues to place an expiration date on my history and the history of so many others. Gracias. Let's see here. Oh, good afternoon. Okay, before I say anything, I just have to apologize ahead of time because I am so tired. Um, and it's affecting my eyesight and my hearing for some reason. I, I, you know, in the old days, I could just jump on a red eye, which I did, go, and I have a flight right after this, like, so I'm not going to stay for the reception. Um, but I realize it's catching up to me. I can't do it anymore. I'm old. And <laughs> speaking of which, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be here and to be on a panel with my friend Cornell, who this is the 30th year since we first met, 30 years. Uh, when I was young and I could do that kind of stuff. Cornell could do it, still. <laughs> Why? But the great thing is that this is the first time in, my, in our life that we've ever been on a panel together. I mean, I'm usually in the audience watching and, and wishing I could do that. Um, so I'm trying to put this up here without a fall. Can I just move this out the way? Okay, I can just move this out the way, right? Is there a way you can take that off the screen? Oh, okay. There, well. <clears throat> so my time hasn't started yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just I just gonna put this here. Great, thanks. So um, I want to thank everyone. I think you know Nicole, Walter, Arthur, Monica, 
thanks his amazing, uh, all the amazing panelists. This has been an amazing event. I learned so much. In fact, uh, much of what I've written, I was writing in the corner there. So um, this is going to be all new. I kind of threw away the stuff that I wrote on the plane because it made no sense. Um, and also, I want to thank the graduate students who led the way, who waged this struggle. Uh, and I want to especially thank uh, Lorja for your comradeship and scholarship and courage for being willing to fight back in this form of collective struggle. I mean, we, I don't want to underestimate the impact that this kind of exposure actually has um, because, you know, you, you made a sacrifice uh, to, for us to come together, a sacrifice not on behalf of yourself, but on behalf of the students, on behalf of future scholars, on behalf of the community, on behalf of, of Dominicans and Haitians and black, brown, and everyone around the world, um, all of us. And too many of us ask students, you know, many of us in positions where, you know, deny tenure, we ask students and colleagues to be quiet. You know, so, oh, no, don't wait, no make waves. Let's just see if I could do, maybe I might sue, you know. I, and it's easier to be quiet and to go on the job market and land at a very fine institution, but that's not how you roll, and I know that, and that's why we're all here. Um, so much, much of what I wanted to say about Lorge's scholarship has already been said, so I cut out much of that. Um, her work as a whole makes uh, transformative interventions in black studies, in diaspora studies, and studies of borderlands, and especially in theorizing race, uh, both in um, borders of D Dominicanade, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so tired, I can't even speak. Uh, both in the book, The Borders of Dominican Dominicanade, uh, and also forthcoming translating blackness. Um, her work is uh, a contradiction against much of the inherited knowledge about Haiti and the Dominican Republic by refuting easy arguments about Dominican and Haitians as common enemies rooted in the former's anti-black racism and in a, in a kind of, of self-hatred. And her interpretations are not just original and path-breaking, they are truly radical. Um, she demonstrates that anti Haitianism isn't a provincial or regional issue or simply one manifestation of anti-blackness, but rather it's foundational to modern global white supremacy, to the racial regime formed in the age of bourgeois democratic revolutions, and it remains central. In the hands of Dominican elites, anti-Haitianism uh, became a weapon to try and snuff out Dominican blackness. Uh, African cultural practices, and those marked racially as Haitians. Uh, these acts of violence and the narratives that frame them establish a Dominican national identity consistent with ruling class and U.S. imperial aims. But black Dominicans, Rianos, diasporic Dominicans, race, or which, what she calls race exiles, contradicted this national identity and its attendant racial ideologies. She shows how they not only disrupted the prevailing narratives that erased their very presence and reproduce and naturalize anti-Haitianism, but she recovers a suppressed history of resistance and solidarity uh, across, um, uh, solidarity is kind of across the board, across uh, race, across color difference, and shaping history and, and also recovers those acts. Uh, they don't exist solely as victims of self-hating dark-skinned people, but like Michelle Waltrio would put it, we learn why uh, black Dominicans are inconceivable as rebels, agents, and forces of change. Her postscript is a masterpiece that lays out clearly the stakes of her project. Uh, what's at stake are the lives of migrants under national and global racial regimes that criminalize blackness and undocumented status and have the power to render entire populations stateless. The 2013 ruling of the Dominican Republic's Constitutional Tribunal stripping Haitians, Haitian migrants of citizenship is being played out today in other parts of the world. We could talk about India, we could talk about Burma, we could talk about China, and certainly talk about Palestine, and certainly talk about here in the United States. Um, she points out that none of this is actually new. It doesn't begin with the recent resurgence of authoritarian regimes, and I think this is a very important point of the book. Um, 
it is an example of magnificent historical method. Um, and I'm a historian, you know, and I know that you're in, you're in, a, in a, a department of Romance Languages, but to me, you're like one of the best historians I've ever encountered. Um, she be so she begins with the construction of the official archive um, in the Dominican Republic and the U.S., not as a physical space, but a set of curated myths and memorializations that marginalize black, diasporic, and migrant subjects through acts of, quote, exclusion, violence, and silencing. And yet, and this is important, she refuses the now common assertion that the archive is only nothing more than a, an expression of violence, rather than a terrain that's always contested. What she identifies as contradiction constitute the counter alternative archive. She reads official documents from the state, mili military, mainstream newspapers, court transcripts, alongside or against literary production in films, music, performance. She reads contrapuntally, finding contradiction across as well as within these documents. So what Lorisha does with the archive reminds me a lot of, of my mentor, Cedric Robinson, where in black Marxism, the materials that Robinson draws on to discover resistance, refusal, renewal, and regeneration are almost entirely secondary sources. But those texts rely on the same materials used by historians who saw only deracinated and accommodating slaves. Even if every scrap of evidence in an archive derives from ruling class sources, it should be apparent to anyone that the machinery of repression, subjugation, surveillance, and torture is sufficient evidence that the oppressed not only refuse their oppression, but make their own history. So this is passing line in chapter six in Black Marxism, where uh, Cedric writes, the notorial archive of the Mexican city of Puebla de Los Angeles, for example, is filled with the official reaction to mid 16th century runaways. Now this point could be replicated anywhere for the owners of enslaved people, the government, et cetera, had no reason to hide the fact of resistance. Uh, their point was to end it and regulate movement. So evidence of their inability to do so come through uh, in the archive. Uh, there, are, there are alternative archives, and there's always been alternative archives in the records and traces left by oppositional movements and subjugated communities. Often these kinds of archives rival the official archives in, in scope, and they're oft, often preserved by those official archives. And this is precisely why, as Lorisha makes crystal clear, the repetition of violence and the production of narratives that continually reframe that violence are necessary for the maintenance of state power in the racial regime. So if Cedric Robinson was right that black studies is a critique of Western civilization and its racial regimes, conceits, and fabrications, and if its, own, if its object of study and project of liberation is the entire world, then Lorja Garcia Pena is not only exemplary, but advances the field of black studies. Her work deprovincializes black studies that centers North America and relies on a middle passage epistemology that renders Africa past. She not only insists on a transnational framework to understand race and Afro-Latinidad uh, from the Caribbean to Europe in, in terms of her new book that has a wonderful chapter on Italy, uh, but she introduces an epistemology that both critiques Western civilization and moves beyond the anti-racist framework of Western liberalism, which black studies still has some of that, a lot of that, actually. Um, if black studies is indeed a critique of Western civilization, um, oh, I read that part already. Um, anyway, one other thing I wanted to say was that the project of black studies you know, has to be a response to our times, a product of our times, and has to anticipate our times. Um, and this is what uh, her scholarship uh, is all about and activism is all about. So this is the kind of thing we, we should expect, nothing less, from one of the founders of Freedom University. Now, I want to say something about that. Freedom University is a powerful expression of the Ethnic Studies Project. And just to follow up on uh, Lourdes Torres' uh, really brilliant remarks this morning, when the movement for ethnic studies at the university began a half century ago, it occurred 
during an era of social upheaval, urban rebellions, anti-war and anti-feminist, anti-war and feminist movements, third world nationalism and militant opposition to state-sanctioned racist violence. The demand for ethnic studies came largely from students who cut their teeth in movements to democratize, revolutionize, and decolonize the United States and the third world. And like Freedom University, it was conceived not just outside of the university itself as ethnic studies, but in opposition to a Eurocentric university culture with ties to corporate, police, and military power dedicated to Eurocentric epistemologies um, and that produce socially isolated individuals whose academic skepticism and claims of objectivity do nothing to transform the institution or the world. So hence, F you. Um, <laughs> in fact, the insurgencies that created ethnic studies envisioned institutional models independent or semi-independent of the academy. So Lorisha not only co-founded Freedom University, but as you've heard, um, she was the only untenured faculty member, part of it, and the only woman of color. She risked everything to create alternative educational spaces for young intellectuals persecuted and criminalized for their undocumented status. She disobeyed the law that stripped these kids of the right to an education. She stood up to the extra-legal extra threats of violence from vigilantes in the Klan. Uh, she survived, transformed the lives of countless students, and then she moved up south to Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> she published a book that contradicts prevailing wisdom on race, the source of Dominican uh, anti-Haitianism, and, and by extension, anti-blackness, and even what constitutes borders. So in some ways, at least on first glance, the tenure decision is not entirely surprising. And let's be honest about this. Sure, Harvard is famous for denying significant number of scholars, and we heard this, uh, this denying them tenure coming through the ranks. This is a, kind of a running joke. And, um, and though, though it's not true, actually, we look at the numbers, the percentages are not it's not really true, this is one of these big myths, but still, they're famous for that. And for very, uh, and there are a few very successful scholars, I could name them all, white men, who were denied tenure at Harvard, and following that had a distinguished career, and they used a denial as a kind of a badge of honor. Um, and they landed on their feet. But Lorsch's case doesn't even stand scrutiny based on Harvard's own criteria. Because here, the upper administration not only denied Lorja, but uh, disavowed the judgment of entire fields. Her department voted unanimously to grant her tenure and promotion. The profession bestowed major prizes on her book. Hun um, hundreds of scholars across disciplines, probably thousands, challenged the decision. And they did not challenge the decision because she was a black woman or Afro-Latina. That's not why they challenged it they challenged the decision because of her work, contrary to the claims of that idiot ideologue, Heather McDonald, right? They judged her by the value and originality of her scholarship, and that's why people signed those letters, which we all know is the accepted criteria for tenure. So this was an outright rejection of interdisciplinary scholarship in ethnic studies, and it's a little ironic given Dean Claudine Gay's announcement that they plan to build in ethnic studies. So what we have here isn't a decision based on a careful evaluation of the work or even a failure to recognize a paradigm shift. What happened here is a crime, a violation of the university's own standards and gross distrust of its own faculty. You know? Now, who made that decision? You, you all know the answer to that. I don't know. The tenure process is a mystery, right? <laughs> um, so what do we do? And this is my last, the last little points I want to make, just very briefly. I don't have prescriptions, but we have to fight. And we have to fight because what's at stake and what we've heard all day today, what's at stake is much bigger than a job or a position. And, and I believe, I may be wrong, but, but Lois is not here to try to get her job back. That's not the point. It's much, much bigger than that. That's why she's here. That's why she's sacrificing. Um, it is an attack on the people uh, she writes about, the people we write about. And George Lipson said this this morning. It is another uh, act of repetition, another act of violence, of burying the truth she exposes about colonial violence. 
And, and George was right this morning when he said, you know, we need to turn diction into contradiction. But as he knows and as all of us know, that doesn't mean that Harvard simply rescinds this decision and we go on with business as usual. Because we have to remember, it was precisely the disruption of business as usual that brought us ethnic studies in the first place, right? So we don't really have a choice. You know, if we're gonna move forward, because there's no possible way, because think about it. It's easy for the administration to say, you know what? We got some money, we'll hire some ethnic studies scholars on, on the terms laid out, and they're gonna be incorporated into a system that just reproduces the same old thing. And this is an opportunity to not let that happen, to basically stop the machine for once and create a space. And also, finally, to remember Lourdes' roots, roots in New Jersey, but also roots in Freedom University, that if you're really serious, that we have to be able to support with our pocketbooks, with our feet, with our hands, with our blood and sweat, those alternative institutions that really are at the cutting edge of the kind of work that we really want to see. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think it's just a, it's been a weirdly <laughs> overwhelming day. Um, just, um, um, I'm just, I'm just going to read what I prepared. Because, okay. I want to first thank all the organizers and staff that made this event possible. I want to thank all the people who labor behind, between, and after hours of the building. I also want to thank all the students and comrades who have been strategizing and organizing around ethnic studies and beyond, and to practice the practice to practice the power of iterations. Here I am speaking to the coalitions that are being built across struggles here on campus and coalitions across the country, from Syracuse, not again SU, and New York um, and New York City, free uh, free CUNY, to students at Dartmouth. U Chicago, Stanford, and Tufts, and hopefully more and beyond. I know that we will not stop, but only continue to expand our coalitions and intersectional vision here at Harvard in particular. Professor Garcia Peña is a brilliant scholar and even more inspirational teacher. She's a writer, she's a theorist, she's a sister, a daughter, a mother, she's a friend, an immigrant, and a badass feminist warrior. <laughs> In preparation for this event, I wondered about the power behind feminist theorist and poet Audre Lorde's notable introduction, black, feminist, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. And working alongside the students and comrades and scholars across the country has helped me realize that these identifiers are not pieces of a simple performance. Listening to them is not an act of highlighting intersectionality as an embodied experience to an audience who has practiced single issue freedom struggles. Instead, it is a direct renouncement, a recognition of how institutions that Audre Lord navigated, the institutions that Professor Garcia Peña is navigating, the institutions that we as students are learning to navigate do not recognize our whole beings as working, moving, caring people. Academia as an institution does not and is not structured to practice recognition and compassion. Perhaps these are the same mechanisms that Nelson Maldonado Torres has called the liberal order of knowledge and what Dylan Rodriguez has called colonial plantation chattel enterprise, which both of whom which cited Sylvia Winter's formative works when they spoke about the importance of ethnic studies in a recent ethnic studies, round, ethnic studies rise roundtable. And perhaps it is in our struggle to transform such structures that fail to recognize black feminist thinkers as whole beings that we gather here today. 
As a scholar, Lorja Garcia Pena theorizes how border policies get mapped onto the body of the racialized subject and becomes what she articulates in the borders of Dominicanidad as, quote, a screen onto which colonial desires and fears can be projected, end quote. This means that the racialized subject carries the burden of coloniality. And in our fight for ethnic studies at Harvard and the stakes of our tenure denial in particular, I am reflecting on how vivid that colonial desire and fear is being projected onto people we love and respect. Professor Garcia Pena's scholarship critically mobilizes the ways in which scholars have approached the archives by looking at Dominican Republic at the center to understand US imperialism, she offers scholars new tools and orientation to approach colonial and imperial history and its archives. And as a PhD candidate writing a dissertation on how national borders and citizenship making practices disable racialized migrant subjects. And in particular, in my questions of how I consider consider queer undocumented artists and activists are contending with the contradictions of seeking citizenship and recognition within the ableist, racist, settler colonial nation. In my work and in my life, Professor Garcia Pena's scholarship encourages, encourages critical approaches to the histories of migration. Even more so, her scholarship pushes scholars like me to collaboratively create different kinds of archives Archives that start from the people. Archives that help us understand the silences and omissions in the colonial and imperial archives by critically approaching photographs and songs and works of fiction to address the gaps. She invites us to expand what has traditionally been considered evidence in the telling of history. And she exemplifies her methods and theories in her continuous working relationship with, as we have seen with Dominican artist um, Josefina Baez and her collaborative work with filmmaker Medin Palos. And she relays such tools to her students. Um, as the final assignment for performing Latinidad last semester, uh, she asked her students to fill the gaps in the syllabus of the course. As a scholar, she opens up opportunities to expand my inquiries to consider alternative ways of understanding how nations construct migration by paying attention to the intimate, often dismissed, quotidian histories of, peop how, uh, histories of how people live and make their lives. But what I admire most about Professor Garcia Pena's scholarship and what is most crucial to recognize in the schema of history and power is Garcia Pena's dedication to anti-colonial, anti-racist, transnational feminist praxis. Mm -hmm. Professor Garcia Pena's theories do not stay in the pages of her book, as we have all seen throughout the day. For her, it's not just about producing journal articles or the award-winning book projects. It's not just about the archives. And as her theorization of the archives and the institutions which oppose such archives have shown, the colonial structures of the archives are insufficient in holding the histories of resistance anyways. The most critical component of her scholarship is her praxis, and actually, it is such transformative and liberatory practice of transnational feminist theory that brought us together. Professor Garcia Pena and I met in a small classroom with no air conditioning in the hot, summer Georgia, hot Georgia summer of 2011. I was an organizer with the Georgia Undocumented Youth Alliance, which was the first undocumented youth-led organization in Georgia. And Professor Garcia Pena, as many have untenured, professor at University of Georgia at the time. The state of Georgia had passed House Bill 87, which was the copycat state legislation of the infamous anti-immigrant Arizona Senate Bill 1070. In addition, the Georgia Board of Regents, Policy 416, which banned undocumented students from the top five public universities, and Policy 434, that banned undocumented students from in-state tuition rates, were in full effect. Nationally and locally, undocumented young people have started organizing civil disobedience actions and education and not deportation campaigns, taking up undesirable, legally unfavorable cases of deportations. For us, everyone deserves to stay in a place they call home. 
not just the young valedictorians or enthusiastic military recruits. For us, we were tired of being silenced through fear. We decided to publicly act against the structures of violence. And for Professor Garcia Peña, who knew so well that the university does not exist without its students, wanted to know what she could do. Through the collective efforts of professors, graduate students, and undocumented youth organizers, without a lot of money, but with, with a lot of what Lorja at the time iterated as Ghana's, we created a very special place, Freedom University. The first course was actually titled American Civilization I, <laughs> named in contradiction with one of the oldest American studies program in the country, right? And this is from our website. Founded as History of American Civilization in 1937, they slash we, since I'm here, have since changed the name from History of American Civilization to American Studies. Life works in funny ways sometimes. And I remember, I remember so vividly reading Professor Lipset's American Studies quarterly article, The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, alongside the work of May Nye's Impossible Subjects, and making all the connection between our lived experiences, navigating the law, racism, and state violence to the theories on the page. I remember the energy of the room, room full of undocumented folks going through the syllabus crafted through a critical ethnic studies method, and it was electrifying. I still carry with me the possibilities of the first Freedom University classroom that opened up for me, and I still carry that to me to this day. To understand why we must continue to continue fighting for scholarship like Garcia Peña is to recognize and, and accounted is to be account, recognized and accounted for the academy in the academy is precisely the key site of political and ideological conflict. Transnational feminist scholars Chandra Tapaldi Mohanty and M. Jackie Alexander asked us to consider the uneven geographies of place and space, intention of power and gender, race, <laughs> intention of power, gender, race, and space by asking, quote, who resides where and what kind of knowledges do these residencies generate, end quote. And they suggest that we must, quote, break the epistemological contract, term coming from Sylvia Winter again, that co-signs the hierarchy of space and positions only those at the top as capable of producing and disseminating knowledge. And as we sit in this room, this building, we're all sitting in its contradictions. Perhaps we're sitting here today uncomfortably within the elite academic walls and the enforcement of its borders, being asked to see the colonial projection of its desires and fears. It is in, it is in such contradiction that I sat conflicted over what I was to share with you all today. Professor Garcia Peña's profound scholarship has iterated and reverberated throughout the day by prominent scholars who have been in this game for so much longer than I have is, insepar in, is inseparable from her pedagogical practice and teaching. I mold over and over the narrative, the voice, the diction <laughs> I wanted to utilize. The process led me to question why I was still here in academia, why I'm in this fight, then I start to doubt my own capacity and sense of belonging. And after unexpectedly crying while preparing for this talk, I realized that the act of refusal by the university to recognize the scholarship, the service, the teaching, the labor and love Garcia Peña practices, the act of refusal to recognize was splitting, splitting me psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually into pieces. And I remember the statistics shared in the most recent institutional letter sent to President Bacow and Provost Gar Garber, according, which states that according to the National Center for Education Statistics, Latinas represent 6% of tenure track professors nationwide. At full professors rank, Latina professors are only 3%. Tenure-track white men, on the other hand, consists of 34% nationwide, and that number increases to 54% at full professor level. So what is at stake? 
If we take Professor Garcia Pena's work or the work of Marisa Fuentes' work seriously, people's lives are at stake. Specifically, lives of women of color are at stake. What's also at stake is the future of ethnic studies and interdisciplinary scholarship like feminist studies, queer studies, and critical disability studies, and the students in those classes. Most importantly, the students in our classes. This is what we're fighting for. And how do we continue? For one, we still haven't received any sufficient response from President Bacow, <laughs> Provost Garber, or Dean Gay. But two, I'm reminded again and again and again the power of collective power. And the power in recognizing, listening, and caring for one another, of rising together. Waking up to a call at 2 a.m. to post bail for a friend and waiting and hoping to make sure immigrant custom enforcement will not show up to pick up your friend for a minor traffic infraction is operating through the commitment and practice of liberatory knowledge. It is also a reactionary practice. What I'm still learning from Lorja and, and Chandra and Minnie Bruce Pratt and late Leslie Feinberg is not only do we mobilize to the reactionary in defense to protect, but we must also, rem but we must also remind ourselves and each other to practice care as part of our liberatory struggles. And it's not our deficiency or lack of commitment, but the exploitative, racist, ableist, capitalist system that makes scarcity a dividing factor. Scarcity of food, of money, of time, of labor, of care, of joy. But we are going to need each other to be healthy and whole and happy, to have energy to keep going. So what are we fighting for? I'm fighting for us. And I thank Professor Garcia Peña for continuously reminding me and grounding me to that. And while we all know the implications of your scholarship and impact have had in the struggle for ethnic studies here at Harvard and beyond, it is becoming clearer and clearer to me throughout today that while we want ethnic studies at Harvard, we're gonna need you. Your knowledge, your approach, your methods, your classrooms, your energy, your whole you here. Yeah. And I'm just going to sort of end, and I hope that the students and organizers respond with me. What diversity? Let us be very clear, let us not be deceived. That my dear sister, our dear sister, Professor Garcia Pena, you are a brilliant scholar. You are a superb thinker with a very subtle mind critical intelligence on the page. When I got a chance to read her text, I said, oh, I understand why she got the kind of response she did from the establishment, both here at Harvard, but also connected somewhere in those letters for those who are envious and whose anxiety is reinforced is precisely because you love Veritas too much. That's what it is. And the condition, condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. It's because you love black people too much. <laughs> Haitians, Dominicans, Africans. You love women too much. You love poor people too much. You love oppressed people too much. And so you got to always keep that in mind so that Harvard and all of its myopia does not become the point of reference to in any way shape how you conceive of what your calling is all about. 
the magnificent work that you've done here. 24 graduate students. The average professor got about three. You know what I mean? You're loving the students too much. No ruling class site in any empire that's concerned with the acculturation and socialization of elites who are well adjusted to injustice can put up with that kind of voice and witness. <laughs> you can't take it. And it's true. It's very true indeed. The dialogue we had in Afro-American Studies, one of the raised questions I raised, I said, fellow colleagues, do you think the boys could get tenure at Harvard now? <laughs> and of course he couldn't, because it's not a question of the quality of his work. It's the question of the priorities that he had. He loved oppressed people too much. It's like living in a white supremacist civilization. Black love is a crime. Black freedom is always viewed as a pipe dream. Black history is a curse. Black hope is supposed to be a joke. You're supposed to defer to that lie. So it is when you critique the U.S. empire. That's always more serious. I know when I got the call from the New York Times and they said, well, we, are you gonna, we got a certain counter voice. Uh, what did you think about it? I said, well, Harvard was wrong. I said, but I know you're not going to put the reasons why I said it's wrong because she's an exemplar of intellectual excellence. Her high quality pedagogical commitment to students is such that it serves as the basis for any criteria of, of tenure is wrong. Oh, it must be racist and sexist. It's deeper than that. How could it be deeper than white supremacy and male supremacy? Because you got a whole lot of black and brown folk who are well adjusted to empire. The neoliberal version of diversity and inclusion. Just let me in so I can be well adapted to this indifference that Brother George was talking about. Just let me in so that my truth telling can be sterilized and sanitized and deodorized enough so that people can walk around and see my color and forget about the other folk in the hood and the burials and in the reservations who are suffering so they can live vicariously through me, so it is in this neoliberal university, not just Harvard, all of the major ones are about that. That's what they're about. And what your work does, my dear sister, early on as a young, brilliant, courageous freedom fighter in the life of the mind and on the ground bringing music, vision, popular culture, Josephina, here comes the brother who's partly Jesus, who people still View his possibility for him to possess them on and on and on. Those are our people. And we're critical of them, but we love them. And, you, and you've never, ever given up on that. That's the lesson to the graduate students. Don't get preoccupied with the myopia of neoliberal Harvard University. You've been studying the context. Harvard's part of the subject matter. Part of your education is in her example as to her ability to do the truth telling, the justice seeking, and still have that beautiful smile that you got on her face right now. It exemplifies the dignity of her mama, her daddy, her grandparents, all the way back to Dominican Republic. That's what we're talking about. This is just one context of struggle. One context of struggle. And there's a long history of that. In the 1940s, there was a greatest economist named Paul Sweezy, studied with Joseph Schumpeter. All of the economists said he was the most brilliant economist of his generation. Denied tenure, he took it to the Supreme Court. Thank God F.O. Matheson, one of the founders of American civilization, Christian socialist, head of master, master of Elliott House, whose father had just died, gave Paul Sweezy and Leo Huberman, $15,000 for three years to found monthly review. That first issue of May 1949 with Otto Nathan making the connection to Albert Einstein writing White Socialism. Sweezy said, bump the academy. So much for their commitment to Veritas. I now, I now have something to fall back on. All of the magnificent academic work that he did was now filtered on the larger public. And in that sense, it actually became an enabling moment 
But then there's Ray Ginger. We forget about Brother Ray. Communist. Denied ten tenure, pushed out of Harvard and given two days to leave for his whole family out of the state because of his connection to Hueck in Massachusetts. He died out of acute alcoholism. We got a whole wave of truth loving, freedom loving folk who cut against the grain. Our dear sister Talia Omer, Israeli sister, Jewish sister, up for tenure at Harvard. Unanimous faculty support, too critical of a vicious Israeli occupation in the name of her own Jewish values. Still now at Notre Dame. Bonnie Harnick, we can go on and on and on. You join that particular wave, but you are distinctive. You are distinctive because your work is even more pioneering in the sense that it comes on the wave of this magnificent, sophisticated indictment of a U.S. empire that is in such decline and decay. So the historical timing of your text is such that your first book is going to last, is going to endure because of his, the truth telling and the historical timing of it. We were talking, I was talking with Brother Walter, I just read his magisterial text on St. Louis dealing with racial capitalism and American Empire, unbelievable. And I think that's Sister Greenwich, is that right? Yeah, oh, well, that text on Black Radical William Monroe Trotter. Ooh, concophony of voices. <laughs> but what is distinctive about it? It is Du Boisian after 1935. It's Ella Bacon after 18 years old, as she was. She's already radical by then. It brings together the critique of empire, predatory capitalism, vicious form of patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia. It's in the name of solidarity with a sensitive sensitivity to the specificity of each group that is coming together. And at the very moment in which the empire is now going neo-fascist. Ugly forms of neo-fascism here in Brazil and Hungary, we can go on and on and on. Here comes this brilliant Dominican sister who gains access to Harvard for these years, touches the hearts, minds, and souls of these young people in such a way that you can see the beautiful tears and tears of nothing but the holy water of broken hearts that are trying to get renewed in such a way that they are so fortified. They are ready to fight even more intensely. And that's what we wanna leave here today with. When we look at our dear sister in the eyes and we see her intellectual fortification because she's a fighter, she's a love warrior, she's a freedom warrior and no neoliberal policy of a ruling class institution can bring her down, can bring us down, can bring the people who you love down. That's why we're here today and I'm blessed to be here. Thank you so much for, I, I'm like, whew. All right, so <laughs> like, we got time for some um, Q&A uh, comments, discussion, more heaping praise on this amazing scholar that we are so lucky to share space with and build community with. So who wants to follow? <laughs> <laughs> who, who dares? So I'll start off with a question. All right. 
Sure. I can, I can start off roll, rolling with a question. I, I actually was thinking about this, um, Robin, in, in terms of your comments that you were making. I think, you know, also with uh, uh, Silvio uh, Torresayan's comments this morning, right, is this notion that this is an acceptable and expected outcome, right? And I think this question that many of us are searching for of what next or what are the outcomes of this um, egregious decision that, that has happened. And, I, you know, I think about the Yale case, right, uh, and, and Albert Laguna's case. And the outcome was more material resources for ethnic studies at Yale, right? But the question of redress to the individual is unanswered, right? And it feels like that's very much the track that Harvard is on right now, right? So the search continues. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a commitment from, from the administration towards the Ethnic Studies Project. And so I think, you know, the question is how do we reconcile? You know, I think all of us agreeing that this is a collective process that's bigger than this one case that is about building a framework and, 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 a, and, a, and a paradigm shift here and generally, right? Um, but how do we deal with the question of address for this particular travesty, right? And, and how do we reconcile those things, right? Wanting to build the project here and make those demands with the, the redress that needs to occur. Um, others can answer the question, but to me, they're inseparable. So redress, is this on? Yeah. Okay. So, so redress should be part of it. Um, more resources should be part, but then the third element would be um, what kind of ethnic studies are you going to have? If it's more resources for a structure that just mirrors the academy, then that sort of defeats the purpose. I think redress is very important, and that's something we don't always talk about. The pro this is a problem. You know, we have these private conversations. Uh, we've had a conversation on the phone about this, and what do you do? Do you sue? And what is the litigation, what is the, what's the cost of the litigation in terms of just the, the psychic and emotional and financial uh, pay? Now, if, if, if there is going to be redress, it's going to require mass movement. In other words, it's not, it shouldn't just be about trying to find a lawyer. It really should be mass movement. And so part of the demand that should be made should be about redress, you know, whatever, that, whatever form it takes, I think. I just want to say what's probably in everybody's heart here, which is thank you, especially to, to Keish Kim, um, not just because you're the youngest person on the panel, but because you opened a window into some of your own history and gave us a, an origin story of sorts, right, for Freedom University. And you're organizing. You're organizing in that context and what comes of that. So I just really wanted to to say thank you for that, for your, your inspirational courage and bravery. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a passing observation about uh, Cornell's uh, presentation. And I think I can call you Cornell because uh, even though you may not remember, we did some hanging out over 20 years ago. <laughs> when, uh, when, uh, when you came to, us, uh, to Syracuse uh, for the opening class, you know, the first year forum, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, have, I, have, I have many pictures uh, with, with you. With, before, be, 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 before, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I have many pictures before these electronic gadgets made those pictures easy to take. Okay, 
and, uh, and I have them, I've never used them, <laughs> out, out, out of respect for some possible copyright uh, infringements that, that I, you know, so I haven't had a chance to. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, yeah. but anyway um, it, it struck me, I mean, when, when you hear uh, Cornell speak, right, uh, it's almost like the, the, the heart has a text that has been rehearsed many times. Uh, you know, it's almost as if there's not one tone that is missing in the composition of your words. And it made me think that I have, I study much uh, the logic of racist thought. And one recurring theme in, um, in racist thought the defects that are imputed to non-European descended Caucasian groups uh, is their uh, difficulty with language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, then here, and then here we have you. Is it possible to match Cornel, Cornel West? You know, uh, whatever, you know, can a person from whatever extraction, uh, you know, match uh, Cornel West's command of the tongue, yeah. So I, I just want to uh, to, to, to appreciate uh, appreciate that and your and, and, and how inspiring it, it is because you know you there, there is a kind of an African tradition that um, that depends a great deal on on sound, not just uh, the uh, not just the the the. Uh, etymology of words, the dictionary meaning of words, but also the sounding of words, yeah? Um, what, what, what's wonderful about it, the chapter that our dear sister has on uh, Josephina by as in it, the way in which sonic confidence and sonic self-respect is often the starting point for people who have been, uh, whose voice has been wiped out and reduced into just echoes of some narrow white supremacist silo. Mm -hmm. hmm. So that the very way in which you try to get out of your pain and transfigure your moan and groan and cry generates a sonic self-respect. It could be through a saxophone, it could be through a voice or what have you, and the analysis that's there with, with, with is it Josephine or was that that sister who's saying, who, you see, because you see this in all oppressed peoples, you know, Rebetico with the Greeks, the Flamingo with the, it, 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 the wrestling with that pain, getting some distance, but not too far, that you get cold and cruel. Hmm. Just far enough that you're still sensitive and you can serve as a point of empowerment in that way. Because I mean, when, when Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said in 1965, the biggest ecumenical movement in the world is nihilism. And by nihilism, he meant fascism. He didn't mean, you know, talking about meaninglessness and sipping tea at some cafe. He was talking about ways in which gangsterization of the world is proceeding. And what you get in, in, in my dear sister's work is that these are not just crimes against humanity. These are levels of barbarity and monstrosity that if disclosed and really force people to wrestle with, hmm. it, it, it has to either change their world or they just side with the gangsters. Mm. And that's where we're headed. Mm, 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 mm. So fun, the fundamental question in a way is, to what degree will dominant varieties of neoliberalism capitulate to neo-fascism? Mm. To what degree will a neoliberal university in the name of deodorized notions of veritas capitulate to the new ways of neo-fascism? Now, it, it, is that a fair characterization system? Because <laughs> you 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 right on it, you, you, you right on it in that regard. So it's not just the, the sound, but it's it's forms of, of resistance, resilience, still alive, energy, going down fighting. Don't mean a thing if they ain't got that swing. Thank you. I just want to echo um, what has been said already and also um, thank you all so much for, for offering up your work. Um, I'm a student representing the Freedom School. Uh, it's a co 
colloquium, actually, um, here at Harvard that has centered exact some of what is being mentioned in terms of how do we create horizontal knowledge exchange within an elite system like Harvard? How do we create our curriculums? And so for you, Kish, 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 Kesh, am I saying that right? Kesh, for you mentioning your history in terms of where you're coming from in relation to Professor Pena with the Freedom University, um, that um, is, I can speak for a lot of the students, inspiration um, and also Professor Robin D.G. Kelly, your work on Black Radical Ma Imagination and Freedom Dreams. Um, we're having a colloquium this April that Professor West will be at and I want to invite you all to, to also join us to be a part of honoring um, an ode to the marvelous and the miraculous, which is what you call and ask us for in the black radical imagination. So I just wanted to, I know spaces like these can often feel um, so inspiring and encouraging and then we leave and we're like, what's next? And that's the question that a lot of us are asking is, what happens if redress, you know, when redress happens, what, where do we go from here? And so one of the ways that, um, that I'm constantly being reminded is action, action-oriented work, and so I just want to lift that up, and um, I promise folks that I would speak on behalf of the Freedom School who can't be here because they're in class, so um, yes, my hope is that you all would also join us. Do you have, do you have like a, a, any website or any information so people can know more about it and give you support? Yes, I can give you all my email. We don't have a website yet, but it will be coming. So I'm happy to mention that. Um, I'm Asmira. You can just come see me after. I'll hang around. I'll just add a footnote, which is I'm just so blessed to teach my introductory class where my brother's work is at the center of it. It's all about freedom dreams. We read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. And that chapter on 12 million black voices with the surrealism, that's at, that's at the center of the class. You just need to know that, brother. But it's part of the same cacophony of voices that I was talking about, because all of our voices are distinctive. No one of us have access to the full, full truth. But we have access to our full swing <laughs> in the fight. Everybody got a distinctive swing. One of the things that strikes me about today um, is about bringing these issues to the light and not allowing Harvard or any of the other institutions that deny tenure to people of color to enjoy silence, to enjoy um, this process. Because at the end of the day, I recall a colleague of mine talking about reviews and saying they're really a way for the institution to talk to itself, right? And what the institution is saying and trying to remind us is that our work in and of itself is revolting, right? And here I'm thinking about Imogen T Taylor's work, right? The, and that our work is constitutive of us and that we are revolting subjects to the academy. And one of the ways that they try to succeed in that is by silencing us and shaming us into silence. And that one of the things that a denial of tenure does, right, is attempt to shame the individual, to shame the field, right, and to shame us into silence, right? And that part is, that is part of what this forum resists, right? To saying that not only will we not stand for it, but we will take our status as revolting subjects and we will challenge you and we will revolt against you and we will make you think twice about denying the next person. Mm -hmm. MIT knows all about that, right? Because they had someone go on a, a faculty, black male faculty member go on a hunger strike. It was, you know, what does it take, right, for someone to feel that that's the only way they were going to be heard? right, by standing on Main Street in front of MIT and having the New York Times and the Boston Globe. I bet MIT thought twice, right? Maybe not for the next one after that, though, right? And so I really want to, you know, in that regard, thank the organizers and thank Lorgia for allowing us to be here, right? And for saying that, you know, because there are many more cases of denial of tenure than we talk about. Right, And in fact, there are many cases of denial of tenure where folks went on to get tenure, either at that institution or elsewhere, that are whispered, 
about, That's right? Good. The the legal cases that have been successful and not for those who have been able to afford to get a lawyer, right? And what it means to go up against an institution in that way and the way they have the resources to make your life a living hell, right? And so that by talking about it out loud, by sharing it, is to also obliterate shame. Absolutely. We should just mention our dear brother Derek Bell did go on that strike right in front of Harvard Law. Day after day after day after day, he almost died wrestling with access, fair access to tenure here at Harvard way back in the 80s. So to all the organizers, I want to thank the organizers of this and of the online um, eth ethnic studies rise that um, I was seeing that through social media. So um, I appreciate it. And I think I heard today a lot of individuals talking about how it impacted you. It impacted me. You know, I heard, Case, you, it's very personal. So I feel like the redress is to the community and it's to each one of us that it impacted. So I, appreciate, I think the redress is for Lorgia because she deserves that tenure. Here's an example, because I, I have been doing Dominican studies since I was many, many years ago in undergrad, trying to do it. And I remember I came across Doris Summers' work back then. And there's really good work there. <laughs> Probably better work than I can do in many aspects. But there are things that I've seen her write over the years that I thought was really problematic. Like that book that says, uh, have caution when confronting minority literature. Something, that was the title, right? And I, I felt that was very problematic. Proceed. Proceed with caution when encounter minority. And I felt like that's erasing, also erasing us, right? Because it's like talking, it's, it's someone talking who's not us, who could not be Lorja, who could not be me. And this is a woman, I feel, maybe she, you're in the room, but to me, you might be in the room, but to me, like, I just have to say that that was problematic. And, and how does that, how is that acceptable versus Lorja not being acceptable is, is something that I'm really struggling with. I'm just putting it out there, you know. Um, thank you all for, for this amazing panel and for this day. Um, I guess on that note, I'm a, I'm a first year graduate student here. Um, and I just, I, I'm, you know, we do have representation from Harvard faculty here on this panel and certainly in this room too, but how do we, like this, if this is, if redress is, does demand a sort of mass response, right? Because it's very much about Dr. Garcia Peña and very much also about the stakes that her case represent. How do we, get Harvard faculty, senior faculty who do have, you know, a degree of power, right? Either in their public platforms or their um, tenure status here to, to join that fight in, in like really meaningful and material ways so that Harvard administration um, can't enjoy their peace, basically, in, in making this decision. Thank you. I think we could safely say that courage is not hegemonic among the Harvard <laughs> senior faculty. So we've got some, some brilliant folk in all colors and so forth, but this is true for the cult of professionalism in general. It's conformity, complacency, and then cowardliness when catastrophe hits until it comes to your house. Now, when it comes to your house, then you got Malcolm X's spirit just kicks in real quick. <laughs> I'm a freedom fighter now. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. What, 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 what's going on? Where's the universality? Where's the sensitivity of other folk when they're going to hell? But the, the whole structure of the hierarchy is precisely to bring you in and become part of the in crowd. And you feel very good about yourself. You work so hard. You investigate. You invested all those hours. And it's true. This is true for any, in any structure in this regard. We just have to be honest about it and say that... Uh, 
we both inside and out. You know, we're in the world, not of it. I'm, you know, I'm a revolutionary Christian, so I'm, I'm used to doing that in any context. Any kind. I do that in the church. I get run out in the name of Jesus. But <laughs> so, so, that, so when it comes to Harvard, that's definitely going to be the case, you see. But that doesn't mean that you don't also try to let them know that when it does come to their house, you're going to be morally consistent. You're going to be in solidarity with them. You see, now it's at our sister's house. Could be at your house. Could be somebody else's. No matter what color. If it's, if it's wrong, if it's unfair, you got to be there based on integrity and solidarity, right? And so we could try to solicit more. And if she's going to court and some of us willing to be witnesses, I'll be a witness. I'll say exactly in the court what I said today. Maybe a little bit slower. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate your question. No, I mean, it's a question to you. Um, oh. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to plug another event for everyone in this room who's appropriately suspicious of this institution um, and is thinking of ways to really bring your full selves here, bring your full communities here, but also bring, uh, break, bust down the walls of this institution and think about what we need to do um, to, to free ourselves and our loved ones. And so at the law school, we're planning a, a critical race theory conference. It's our second, second annual conference um, called Freedom Dreaming for, Towards a Radical Reconstruction. Um, and so what the, the conference aims to do, it's April 17th to the 18th, uh, is to not only provide space and tools for community members, first, first and foremost, forget lawyers, um, community members, and all of us in this, in this space um, to, to learn what it means to critique the institutions, the interlocking institutions that are oppressing us, um, but also what it takes to build up what we want to see, what we want to run towards, um, and, and build up the institutions that will liberate us and our loved ones. And so the conference will be April 17th to 19th, or April 17th to 18th at the law school. Um, and I actually have a website I can share with everyone. Um, it is orgs.law.harvard.edu slash CRT. Um, and in addition to that effort, we will be putting together an anthology to give folks really space to gain increasing familiarity with um, freedom dreaming, with CRT, with abolition democracy. Um, and we invite you, know, you all to come and we invite interested parties to really reach out to us um, about submitting to our anthology. All right, thank you all. Beautiful. Beautiful. Could we go back to Maya's, Maya's question? I actually wanted... I mean, I, I want this to be an opportunity for, mm -hmm. there's a lot of activists and students mm -hmm. still in this fight. So I would also like to hear y'all's um, thoughts on Maya's question. How do we get some of the more senior, mm -hmm. recognized, public, powerful scholars who haven't said much within Harvard to mobilize? Well, um, yeah, I was trying not to talk too much. Um, this, is, this is a question, and, and, and Cornell basically said it, this is a question that was answered, that was asked in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s, and, but, but in the 80s with Yale, in 90s, it's just always an issue. I remember when Yale graduate students were, were struggling with, in support of clerical workers in the 1990s, just always mm -hmm. doing that. You remember that? Oh, yeah. And yeah. A bunch of us came up from NYU. Walter remembers those days. We came up from NYU. There might have been three faculty at Yale who supported this. I mean, it was David Montgomery, and it was Hazel Carby, and, um, and, and Michael Denning. That was it, of, of Yale. So in other words, I, wouldn't ex I think Cornell's absolutely right. You can't expect much. Um, if we think of the university as the place that can be transformed, like George said today, uh, into a space that is that will love us, that's never going to happen. The only way I think you, can, you could possibly get more faculty in support of these struggles is through force. You know, not physical force, well, some, I don't know. But do some forms, you know, forms of compulsion. Or in terms of trying to hire more people, which of course is, is a kind of a catch-22. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect too much. I think, and also historically, to be honest, um, all the major changes in universities never came from faculty, ever. Never, it came from students. 
And so the power, the power is in your hands. And you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying like blackmail people, collect information on them. You know, all these. I'm not saying do that. I, I'm not suggesting that. But I'm saying don't. I wouldn't rely on them. I wouldn't rely on them. I wouldn't rely on them. I would, I would basically put them on notice. Eventually, the faculty at Yale came around to supporting the, the union because they, they were shamed into it. You know, they were shamed. And that's, that's the thing that made a difference. And one last thing, too. I didn't want to, um, because this is also tied to the question of redress. And I, there was one thing I should have said, and I really think it's important to say. Redress is very tricky, because redress, like reparations, can also have a, another impact. And that is, it could lead to silencing. In other words, I believe redress is important, but the redress has to be one in which um, the university can't say, you know what, we paid it off. And so, we, you know, you don't have anything to say, sign a non-disclosure, we're gonna settle out of court. You know, that, that kind of redress is not acceptable. But a redress that really is transformative, um, that not only forces university uh, and upper administration to admit that they were wrong, but then create from that a set of criteria to tenure and hire based on different readings, different evaluations. They need to rethink, like, what is tenurable? What is a text? Things like that, to really rethink the whole process and rethink tenure so that we don't fall back into the other trap, which is to, um, to basically, you know, we're going to get rid of tenure, we're just going to have precarious, low-wage labor. You know, and so I think there's a, there's a way that, that redress should be something that's transformative and collective rather than just a, a means to silence uh, critique. I think I have heard the question many times uh, during the uh, gathering today. And it, it, it's a difficult question for me. Um, I think the only manual that I remember uh, for uh, taking action is the uh, Communist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. It's the only one that I remember. And the, the only advice that I can give, and, and I'm gonna be very careful because I come from, from CUNY and I have not finished uh, the, the, the work that, I, uh, that I'm doing, and that is the, the business of the Dominican Studies Institute. So I do uh, protect uh, my position there, simply because I have not finished my work. And in CUNY, uh, it's, uh, it's very clear uh, the relationship between faculty and students. And giving students uh, uh, advices on how to fight a fight uh, could get you into real trouble. And the trouble means losing your job. It's very clear, how clearly stipulated. So um, I, I can tell you what I have done all my life. And that is that I have been active, you know? And, and there's something else that I, I, I think I should share with you. I have been very critical, and I hope you don't hate me for this. But I, uh, in this society, somehow, there is that question that, you know, of teaching people how to do everything, including how to breastfeed your child. You know, there's a manual to do that. And, Caramba, um, yeah, <laughs> right. There are manuals for everything, and if you go to the internet, you will find that there is a how-to para todo, para todo. And that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, for me, uh, and I never speak for me, but it, it, um, it sort of, uh, I don't know whether it takes away the creativity, uh, um, from the individual, but in any event, what I have done uh, as a student and as a uh, faculty, uh, including you know, uh, full uh, uh, professor and all that, I have remained active. So it's, it's fighting the fight, clearly and openly. And in some, in, in many cases, I would say that I, uh, my colleagues, when they see me, they know already what I'm, what I'm all about. There's no secrets, there's no 
uh, now that they, they know that in every place that I am, I will be speaking about the Dominican people, even if they are speaking about something else. Bueno. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be over and over and over for everything all the time. I never stop and I don't sleep much. So, and I always say that to people, their problem is that they are gonna get tired, yeah, I'm not gonna get tired. So that, never, never. And that's what I had given to my son, exactly that. So I can offer you uh, and uh, all of the people that are, all of the students that are open arm, uh, is that advice. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing uh, and don't stop, don't quit. Uh, you, traditional Marxists believe that one, you know, once you finish your schooling, you turn into something else and everything has, you know, you forget everything in the process um, of turning into a professional. So don't let that happen and continue doing what you do when you get uh, the degree and that is fighting the fight until we get it done. Simple as that. Okay, uh, uh, I will try to be as brief as possible. I, I was just um, like pondering on Maya's question too and, and listening to what you all were saying and thinking about like my position as a graduate student here and thinking about um, just how uh, the university becomes this, this machine that it's constantly fed uh, bodies like ours and, and how we are being, we're constantly being educated to overwork. When we don't receive the resources that we need, we are constantly being educated and prepared to be exploited by, this very institu by these various institutions. So the example that we saw with our mentor, with Professor Garcia Peña, is the same thing that's gonna happen to all of us. And this is something that we understand. That's why when Cage said that lives are in danger, it's true, our lives are in danger. We are living in a very precarious state. So I say this uh, because there are a lot of professors here I say this because I know you love us. I know you're here because you love us. And I know that you're here because you trust our work and you trust our value. A lot of you have created spaces for us to feel at home here. And I say this because I want to stress that yes, when like, we are here because in a lot of ways, ethnic studies has saved our life. Like our lives have been saved by the very thing which we study, which we pursue, because we understand this is something that needs, we, like this, this system that is constantly exploiting us and, and deciding that we are revolting subjects, as uh, somebody said before, is the system that is manipulating absolutely everything and has decided from the get-go that we are not valuable. And I say this too because what is really difficult, and I was reminded earlier today, with getting faculty on our side, is that it is very difficult to understand that simultaneously you could be, you could profit off a system that is highly unjust and unethical. And you have to understand that even though you've profited from it, it is not perfect and it is set up on certain privileges and inequalities that not only because you are standing in a certain level of safety is keeping people away because you don't know when the system is gonna turn on you as well because it's constantly shifting and deciding and rewriting so that all lives are in danger when the system is based on uh, difference and categorizing and all these different uh, modes of, of dehumanizing and, and just it's, it's, it all comes down to death, and, and I just wanted to say that. I don't really have a question. I'm very frustrated right now. Um, as much as I have been deeply moved by a lot that has been said, yeah. um, and I, I appreciated a lot what you said, Cage, like I, you, just, you just gave a lot of language to a lot of the silences inside me. Um, and, and I just wanted to share this. Um, and, and I will say this here, and I've said it before, and I will continue repeating it. What has happened is just highly unethical, and I don't trust absolutely anything around me right now. 
And I know this is not a feeling that only I have. I know this is a feeling that's shared by my colleagues, by my friends who are here, by my peers, and I know by a lot of faculty members that are here too who feel highly unsafe. So that's it. So please join me in thanking the panelists. Um, So we're going to take like a little five minute break to get set up for the closing remarks. Thank you everyone and thank you Manisol.
Okay, perfect. I just didn't know like if there was gonna be chanting or what no, and no. I just I just wanted to make sure that everyone was in unison. So we're going to go ahead and get started, if everyone could take their seats, please. Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, the speakers for the closing remarks. Um, we're going to be joined by Genevieve Kultadio, who is a cultural historian who specializes in interdisciplinary transnational feminist approaches to gender, race, and colonialism in relation to Filipino diasporic histories. And she's working on her first book, Beauty Regimes, Modern Imperialism, the Philippines, and Gender Labor of Appearance. And she will be joined by... Um, Ju Yun Kim, who's a professor of English here at Harvard. Her research and teaching interests are in Asian American literature and performance, and she is the author of The Racial Mundane, Asian American Performance, and The Embodied Every Day. So please join me in welcoming the two of them. So I'm going to start with just a bit of formality that's actually uh, incredibly important. I just want to reiterate my thanks to everybody who came together uh, to make this event happen. Anyone who's worked here for even a little bit knows how impossible it is to plan an event six months in advance, uh, much less one month. But I think it's a testament uh, to um, our, our love of, of Lorja, our admiration uh, for her work that we managed to get together in, in a month. But a special thanks to Warren Center, Walter, uh, Arthur, Monique Said, uh, to um, Nicole, who, who really helped bring all the panelists together, um, Jessica and uh, Lauren in history and literature for all their administrative work, uh, to Kea, one of our fellows, went and got extra sponsorships from BU. Uh, it really was a collective effort and I think really beautifully showed uh, the impact that Lorja has had on all of us. Um, so I just want to start, uh, we're going to kind of go back and forth um, a little bit, but I just want to start by saying um, about eight years ago or so when I first landed at Harvard, um, hardened and cynical after the job market, I asked someone, where are the other Asian Americanists? And uh, they said, well, you're it. Uh, there are also multiple conversations about ethnic studies that really echoed much of what many of our speakers said. Is it navel gazing? Is it identity politics? Uh, what is it? And I thought, there's no way I'm going to survive here. Um, and then flash forward, uh, who enters the scene but Lorja Garcia Pena. And um, wow, the impact that she had was, was immediate. I'm standing next to our dear friend, Genevieve Clutario. Woo! You were on our search committee. <laughs> You're on the search committee for another dear friend, Durba Mitra. I mean, Keish, Chris, you are so, your, your statements here were so compelling and intelligent and wise. And, and you are here and you stayed here um, because of Lorja. I mean, look at, look at this. Um, I'm Filipino, I'm short. <laughs> um, so the, and we wanted to, so Triana and I always t 
tag team and speak together. So it's kind of nice being together again, because um, I'm no longer here. Um, but I, I just want to echo what Gianna said and also lead us into the story about the Warren Center and the faculty fellows and ethnic studies. Lorsha's impact on us it was immediate. When I saw Lorja during my campus visit, first of all, I was like, what is, what is happening right now? <laughs> and, then, and then I saw Lorja and everything just sort of fell away. And that's kind of how we operated with just so few of us doing ethnic studies. There had already been a lot of momentum um, before us, but when we got here, we really stuck together and we, we sort of followed Lorsch's leadership in making space, really making space. We also were in every single committee together, every single committee together, like all 27. <laughs> and we were always together. We were also on rotation for diversity, um, like diversity photos. And so <laughs> we, we would laugh and be like, whose turn is it? Who's next? Um, and so this is the kind of camaraderie we had, but it was also about the intellectual space when we were together that we could just breathe, we could talk to each other, we knew we respected each other. Um, our work really, my work really grew because of this community and because of Lorja, uh, because of Juyan, and we knew we had each other. So it was a really exciting time, those few, the five years that I was here, it was so exciting. We were doing things with pennies, like no funding. And we were doing things like workshops. Lorja created a Latinx field with an RLL. Yeah, it was amazing. There's the Latinx working group under EMR. You know, we really sort of just um, rushed in and EMR and sort of demanded things. Um, you know, we did an Asian American Studies working group. We did things just with nothing. And it was just really that spirit that was so amazing and with the students and we just tried to keep it going. Um, and so when the opportunity came about, when Walter was saying that there might, there's an opportunity with the Warren Center to do a faculty fellows um, seminar, a year-long seminar in the Warren Center for American History. And so I jumped on it. I was like, yes, we'll do ethnic studies. We'll do it. I don't care how many committees we're on. We'll do it. Uh, we'll write the proposal. But we want to do it on our own terms. We wanted it to be really ethnic studies. We wanted it to be interdisciplinary. We wanted it to reflect our work. And we also wanted to showcase the contours of ethnic study, ethnic studies to talk about our rich, long histories. It's going to mark the 50 years of ethnic studies at SF State and at Berkeley. This is the time. We wanted to showcase that this is a field. We we are experts, we are surrounded by experts, and that we have a past, we have a present, and we're gonna be the future. We're building it, we're gonna show it to you. So we were excited to show that at Harvard. And so this is why um, we have these, um, everybody's talking about the Warren Center, so we wanted to build and bring in a community because we were so hungry to bring that community we were a part of outside of the university and have it here and take up space and make space, show it to our students and be like, hey, these are the folks that we are working with. Um, and so, you know, so that's sort of the story behind and also an example of just kind of the force that Lorja is. I'm going to start crying. So. Oh, okay. So this will be really fast in closing because I wanted to turn it over to the most important person in the room. Uh, Lorja, when you were, and I'm going to directly speak to you because it is a little weird, uh, everyone talking about you. Um, can you hear me now? No? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to speak directly to you because we've all been speaking. Okay. <laughs> That's why I stopped. <laughs> uh, so Lorja... When you were going through the tenure process, I think I said to you a couple of times, Harvard needs you much more than you need it. And I feel that so heavily now. So, so I want to say thank you. I think for many of the people in this room, thank you for allowing us to imagine a different Harvard. One where we're not just our degrees from 
maybe other Ivy Leagues, uh, when we're not our, the statements that got us in, when we're not a demographic. Um, thank you for helping us imagine a Harvard that is this room where we can be our parents who don't speak English, our grandparents who are occupied, um, be our friends who couldn't leave the neighborhoods that we left. Um, that it's your legacy, and I hope, I hope we'll continue to live it. So please come up and say a few words. Motherfucker, I'm wearing mascara. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I of course want to thank um, the Warren Center for giving me a home, an intellectual home at Harvard, and my colleagues who made me cry, um, but most of all my students who are here with me, and it's so fitting that you're right here with me. I was very ambivalent about today. And in fact, Rianne, when you asked me to say a few words, I think I kind of froze, and I don't think I ever answered. Um, and part of the reason is, of course, the circumstances that lead to this symposium and which have had such an impact in my life, both professionally and personally. But part of it is simply feeling completely overwhelmed and humbled by the incredible support of so many scholars, some of you here, colleagues and my students, who I admire and love, people who have been, whether directly through mentorship or indirectly through their research and their praxis, my support system, my guidance, my acompañantes in this journey through scholarship and teaching in contradiction to the hegemony of the academy. I have learned so much from each of the scholars here. I have learned so much from the students and from their unquestionable commitment to demanding what they deserve. I feel incredibly fortunate to be in this room with you today. Gracias. A few years ago, when I was beginning my tenure track at Harvard, I had a conversation with Silvio torres Sayant. I don't know if you remember, Profe. It was in the context of my ambivalent and uncomfortable relationship with academia, a discomfort I have now come to understand as incredibly healthy. <laughs> For it has kept me grounded and true to myself, and to borrow a phrase from George Lipsitz, who's back there, to the work I want my work to do. In any case, I call Silvio, as I often do, in moments of despair, and I'm making a mental note that I'm gonna call you on your birthday and other moments. <laughs> um, and, um, and in that conversation, which was around one of the first really violent moments I experienced at Harvard, in which a senior colleague had dismissed my work and called it identity politics, not research, and invited me to go look for another job as I was not a quote unquote Harvard material, which on hindsight was really good advice. Um, in any case, in that moment of despair, I was asking Sylvia what to do, how to respond to that particular violent moment and I remember I was saying something along the lines so of everyone tells me I need to network at Harvard and I don't know what the hell that means. What exactly is networking? Sounds like not working. I don't have time. <laughs> and Silvio with the calmness, the patience, the coolness, which with he has always comforted me. Es increíble paciencia, profe, de donde la saca. Said something I, that has carried me, or rather, that I have carried, or rather, that has carried me since. The work will speak for itself. Keep doing what you're doing. I found these words incredibly comforting, though I it was not really until this moment, this last few weeks, that I truly understood their greatness. The work will speak for itself. 
in the wake of Harvard's decision to fire me to spare you the euphemisms. The conversations, the engagement, the support, the protective energy of so many people engaging with my work on Twitter, I don't know if Katerina is back there with um, the Ethnic Studies Rise, in the classrooms, and now in this room, has been the most rewarding, exceptional, wonderful experience of my academic career. To know that people are reading my work, to see these words I wrote take on a different life, a different form, is a true honor and my great responsibility. It is the biggest, loudest, and most incredible contradiction to Harvard's disavowal of my work, my ethics, and my praxis. I did not imagine I would become a scholar. I did not know what graduate school was until I was a senior in college. When I finally made it to grad school, I always found it to be an uncomfortable place, one that did not quite fit. And along the way, I met people. I encountered words that resonated, books that gave me life, and I found mentors and friends who nurtured me, who encouraged me to become the scholar I am now. Along the way, I also found myself as a teacher. I was able to figure out a way to center social justice, to center what mattered most to me, to do anti-colonial work in the classroom, in my writing, and in the everyday life interactions in the institutions, in the institutions in which I work. That sometimes meant creating discomfort for those who are not used to living in El Nier, in the barbed wire, like some of us. And that also meant to choosing always to stand with my students in their fights for ethnic studies, in their demands for inclusion, and in their efforts to call out the hypocrisies that exist in our institutions, particularly around the language of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. That is the kind of scholar and, teaching and teacher I choose to be. That is the kind of teacher my students deserve. And if it costs me tenure, well then it's fucking worth it. You're worth it. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for engaging with my work. Thank you to my students for their courage for always giving me a home. Keep up the work, because as a dear profe of mine told me once, the work will speak for itself.
like to get involved in action, <laughs> action. Um, we are having a teach-in about the, I don't know, sorry, I'm a little overwhelmed, um, about the next step in our movement um, tonight, and we do think that faculty should take a more active um, position in actually fighting for not only Profes, but ethnic studies and the ethnic studies that she has built, because it deserves the fight, um, and not just from us. And so if you would like to get involved, um, please come to our kitchen or email, I don't know, Paige and, or me, like someone. Um, yes, yes. We can, uh, PMs, Tickner Lounge. Yeah, we're, we're serving dinner. <laughs> but we are planning an escalation of our movement because we think that this is a fight that deserves it. Um, and we have had trouble getting faculty support. And so now that everyone is here in this room, um, it only makes sense to put on the pressure. Um, thank you. Woo.